uh, gastrointestinal uh, embryology, normal gastrointestinal embryology. Uh, there's foregut, midgut, uh, hindgut, and that's it. No more guts. <laughs> so foregut is from esophagus to duodenum. Okay. So it goes in there, and then like right behind here is the duodenum, and then so esophagus to duodenum. Let me just draw it along with this. So, so esophagus. Uh, at the level of pancreas um, at at the level of pancreatic duct and bile co uh, common bile duct insertion okay. Okay. Uh, so that's where the bile duct is coming from actually let's look at that The anatomy is pretty important with this one. Okay, so esophagus to duodenum, right? So it's coming from there to there, right there. Uh, at the level of pancreatic. Uh, duct and common bile duct insertion ampulla of water okay so that's where ampulla of water is okay, that's where the foregut is up to okay. so that's the ampulla of water uh, sphincter of odius right there uh, this is the gallbladder this is the pancreas this is the duodenum okay and common bile duct cystic duct is over there uh, common hepatic duct, uh, left hepatic duct, right hepatic duct, and liver. So it's important to know that foregut ends over here. At the level of uh, common bile duct insertion and ampulla of water. Cool. Uh, midgut, it's from lower duodenum. Okay, so from over here. there to lower duodenum to proximal uh, two-third of the transverse colon so that would be this yellow part okay so this thing goes all the way down anyways I'm not going to bother drawing this <laughs> straight here so it goes uh, from uh, transverse, uh, sorry, uh, this intestine to duodenum to uh, transverse colon and up till here. Okay, uh, that's your mid gut. Important to remember that too. Then you have hind gut. That's the distal one third, the leftover part of the transverse colon, to uh, anal canal and above pectinate line. Okay, so that would be down here. The pectinate line, right? So this is one third of the transverse colon to anal canal over the pectinate line. It's easier to remember this if you just draw it out once, and then you won't forget it. Uh, midgut, sixth week of development, uh, physiologic herniation of midgut through the umbilical ring. So at sixth week, this is what happens. Uh, it goes outside of the umbilical 
uh, ring, right? So physiologic herniation of the mid cut through umbilical ring. Then uh, at 10 week of development, it returns back into the abdominal cavity and then it rotates around the superior mesenteric artery. Okay, that's the superior mesenteric artery right there. So comes back in and then goes around it. Okay, uh, total 270 uh, degree counterclockwise. Okay. So there's the pharyngeal origin, foregut, midgut, and hindgut. And that's an X. Okay. So foregut includes everything up till the ampulla water and column bowel duct insertion. Uh, so it involves all of these structures and the midgut is uh, up to this two-third of uh, transverse colon and then the hindgut is up to the uh, inner canal above the pectin line cool. uh, so when this thing doesn't come back or after it come back there's a failure of fusion or you know uh, we get uh, ventral wall defects. So developmental defects due to failure of rostral fold closure. For example, sternal defect. This is called ectopic cordis or lateral uh, fold uh, closure. For example, omphalocele or gastroschistes or caudal fold closure. For example, bladder extropy. Okay, we have gastroschistes and omphalocele. So what is gastroschistes? Uh, Presentation, extrusion of abdominal content through abdominal wall defect. Okay, so all the abdominal stuff is coming out of the defect. Uh, coverage, so this is uh, important to remember. This is the lateral fold closure defect. Okay, uh, so it's not covered by peritoneum or amnion. So it's right out uh, by itself. So the guts come out of gap in the uh, letter G. Okay, so that's what that is. Just think of it like a letter G and then that's what it looks like. So if it looks like that without a covering, it's gonna be this. It's associations. Not associated with chromosomal abnormalities. It does have a good prognosis. Uh, and then you also have omphalocele. Right? Uh, this is herniation of abdominal con contents through the umbilicus. Uh, covered by peritoneum and amnion, light gray shiny sack. Abdominal contents are sealed in the letter O. Okay. It's sealed, it's covered up, it's sealed, it's so fellow sealed. Uh, associated with the uh, congenital anomalies, for example, trisomy 13 and 18, that's Edward and Fadal's. Uh, then you have Beckwith Winham syndrome. Uh, that's the one with the uh, big tongue, I think. Syndrome is part of large associated with overgrowth syndrome. Okay, so large size and that large tongue. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, what do we look like? Uh, and other structural abnormalities, for example, cardiac GU, uh, genetic urinary and UST abnormalities. So yeah, uh, they'll give you, uh, in the question stem, they'll just say there is some stuff, uh, some kind of uh, abdominal content coming out. It is covered. Uh, what can it be associated with? Or uh, what is this due to? So it, if it's uh, if it's what if it's due to, it's because of, uh, it's due to the failure of lateral fold closure. Okay. Uh, what is it called? It's called amphalocele. 
they usually don't ask that, but they might ask you what's happening. So it's herniation of abdominal content to the umbilicus. Uh, you really need to know the difference between the two because uh, they'll give you this in the option too, depending on what it is. Extrusion of abdominal content through the abdominal wall defect. This is the wall defect one. It causes the G. This is through the umbilicus. It's covered. Okay. Uh, prognosis is good with this one. Uh, this one it's associated with different anomalies. That's what it looks like. And uh, sure. uh, congenital umbilical hernia, failure of umbilical ring to close after physiologic herniation of midbed. So this thing right here. Uh, after it returns, uh, it doesn't close, so then it pops back out. So failure of umbilical ring to close after physiologic herniation of midgut, uh, covered by skin, uh, protrudes and increase in intra-abdominal pressure, so like when crying, may be associated with congenital disorders, for example, Down syndrome, congenital hypothyroidism, small defects usually close spontaneously. Cool. If it's small, it will just fix itself. Uh, yeah, so basically, it uh, if you push it in, it will go in, but then it will come back out. And if they're crying, it will seem like it's pulsating. Okay. Uh, tracheoesophageal anomalies. Uh, this is important. They ask you about this. Um, okay, so esophageal atresia with distal tracheoesophageal fistula. Okay. Uh, it is the most common and often presents as polyhydraminos in utero due to inability of fetus to swallow amniotic fluids. Neonates drool, choke, and vomit with first feeding. Okay. Uh, okay, let's take care of this much. So esophageal atresia. Atresia, you already know what that is. You don't look into that. That is uh, the absence or abnormal narrowing of an opening or passage in the body, right? Uh, and with distal tracheoesophageal fistula, it's the most common. Uh, this one, TEF. That's these ones. We'll talk about that. Uh, and often presents as polyhydraminos in utero. Uh, why? Because uh, the baby can't, or the fetus, not baby, but the fetus can't uh, swallow the amniotic fluid. So what happens to the amniotic fluid? It stays in the amnion, and that's why you get polyhydraminos, amniotic fluid, in utero. Due to inability of the fetus to swallow amniotic fluid. Right? So it stays outside, so there it keeps accumulating outside of the neonate. Uh, neonates drool, choke, and vomit with the first feeding. So after they're born, when you try to feed them, um, they won't be able to because there's no passage available for that to go down into the stomach, right? Uh, so it's having a hard, it's gonna have a hard time. Uh, TES allow air to enter stomach. Okay, so with these, uh, you will get a gas bubble. Okay, because the air is going there instead of. Well, it is going into, with this one, it is going into the trachea, but not the, it's also leaking into the esophagus. Okay, it's visible on chest x-ray. Uh, cyanosis is secondary to laryngospasm to avoid reflux-related aspiration. Clinical test, failure to pass nasogastric tube into the stomach. When you try to do it, it goes into the lungs instead. Okay. Or uh, it just might not go. It, it, it might end up in the lungs if it's this one. Right? Um, but if it's this one or this one, it's going to get stuck over here. Over here, it's going to get stuck over there. Right? Normally, it should just be able to go straight down. So, yeah. Uh, failure to pass the nasal gastric tube into the stomach. They might give you this in an X-ray too. Someone asked that one on the group. Uh, 
Um, they put a picture of the x-ray and the nasogastric tube ended up uh, in the lung cavity. And it wasn't this one, but it was because of a defect in the diaphragm. Okay. Uh, in H type, the fistula resembles uh, the letter H. Okay, that's the H type. Uh, in pure EA or esophageal atresia, chest x-ray shows gasless abdomen because nothing's going through it, right? So there's no gas, no fluid, nothing going through that. So it's just going to get accumulated here. Okay. Uh, So here we have trachea, esophagus. Uh, there's a normal anatomy. You know, you'll have a little bit of gas bubble, which is normal. Uh, then you have pure uh, esophageal atresia, atresia or stenosis. Uh, here you won't have any gas in it. Okay. Uh, if in pure tr uh, tracheal esophageal fistula, uh, since it's tracheal esophageal, that means they both are connected if you see T and E together. If it's just esophageal, it's gonna be disconnected. But if it's tracheal esophageal, it's gonna be connected, right? And then this is called the pure one uh, or the H type one. Uh, and you will see prominent gastric bubble here. Over here, um, it just ends over there. Although the air can enter through the distal portion of the esophageal esophagus, right? because uh, it's attached to the trachea. However, when you're trying to feed it, uh, it's going to, you know, feed a nasal gastric tube. It's going to get stuck over here. Okay. Uh, intestinal atresia. Uh, it presents with bilis, uh, bilis uh, or bilis, vomiting and abdominal distension. Okay. Uh, within the first one to two days of life, uh, you have duodenal atresia, failure to recanalize. Uh, X-ray shows double bubble, uh, dilated stomach, and proximal duodenum, right? And associated with Down syndrome. So why do you have bil bilis uh, vomiting and abdominal atresia, right? So it's because of. Uh, this thing right here, the bile duct enters over here, right? So if there is any problem beyond the duodenum, uh, like after the first half of, or one third of duodenum, over here, over here, uh, say there's a blockage there, then what's gonna happen is the bile. Bile's still gonna leak out of the thing, right? But then it can't go forward. So what's gonna happen? It's gonna go backward, upwards, and then outwards. So that's why you have bilis vomiting. And uh, since uh, nothing's passing through, uh, it's gonna cause abdominal distension. And this happens within the first one to two days of life. Uh, so duodenal atresia, this is due to failure to be canalized. Okay. Uh, when you see the double bubble sign, uh, this is what the reason is. First of all, if they tell you that there's bile and vomiting, you should always think, okay, so bile is not going forward. So something is wrong uh, after the attachment of bile into the duodenum, okay? So that will give you, you know, you can zone down into this duodenal atresia or duodenal or labial atresia. So the difference between the two is that, this, okay, this one. Also, this one is associated with Down syndrome. So they might tell you that the person has a trisomy and uh, bilis vomiting, that should also be a view that is duodenal. Uh, the double bubble, uh, I haven't seen an X-ray show up anywhere. They might even just, you know, use the word. Uh, duodenal and ileoetresia, disruption of mesentric vessels. So typically, uh, severe mesentric artery. It causes ischemic necrosis of fetal intestine and segmental resorption. Bowel becomes discontinuous. X-ray should may show triple bubble. Uh, dilated stomach, duodenum, uh, proximal duodenum. 
and in gas lifts uh, colon it's associated with cystic fibrosis uh, may be caused by maternal cigarette smoking or use of vasoconstricted drugs for example cocaine during pregnancy okay uh, the superior mesenteric artery you should already know about that one because you guys are peers um, right there uh, just normally you should know that foregut is supplied by superior mesenteric artery uh, anything related to midgut it's intermediate and then inferior for hindgut okay so inferior mesenteric artery you see a little bit of orange getting supplied by that uh, W is supplied by celiac trunk sorry and then the intermediate one is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery Okay, so celiac trunk, superior and inferior. There's no such thing as intermediate mesenteric artery. <laughs> so don't make that mistake. So then it gets easier, right? Because duodenal and ileal is part of the midgut, and midgut is supplied by uh, SMA, superior mesenteric artery, right? So when you stop the supply, what happens? Ischemia. Uh, if you st it's still not resolved, what happens? necrosis okay so that's how you end up with the necrosis of fetal intestine they'll tell you that it's um, black and the pigment is black and it's you know it's or they might just come out and tell you that it's necros okay and then there you have some parts that are okay and some parts that are uh, you know s resort so bowel becomes discontinuous because of that uh, what is this due to? Disruption of mesenteric vessels. Okay, that's the pathogenesis to this. You will still have bilis vomiting with this one. Okay, but instead of double bubble, you have uh, triple bubbles. Right. Gasless, associated with cystic fibrosis. Uh, they might tell you that uh, the mother or father has cystic fibrosis. They don't give you this because then it really confuses. Like it could be something else as well. Um, it could help you, but this is not really a giveaway because this is very broad. But this one, triple bubble and the bill is vomiting should, you know, give it to you. Uh, so then we have hypertrophic uh, pyloric stenosis right before it enters into the duodenum so narrow pyloric ch channel and thickened and lengthen lengthened pylorus most common cause of gastric outlet obstruction in infants in this one you won't have the bilis vomiting right so palpable olive shaped mass in epigastric region uh, it actually does feel like a you know mobile hard mass if you press on it uh, visible peristaltic wave and this is how they will uh, you know explain in the question stem as well they will tell you that there's a hard olive shaped mass or something like that in the epigastric region that is important epigastric region uh, you'll see visible peristaltic wave and non villous projectile vomiting at approximately two to six weeks old so important thing here is that it's non bilis because obviously bilis is attached in the duodenum and this is blockage before the duodenum so you won't have any bile in it however you'll be have vomiting because anything you feed is gonna you know not go beyond this so then there'll be back backup of all that and then it comes back out okay uh, the buildup takes around two to six weeks more common in firstborn males and it's associated with exposure to maxillaries so those are your uh, erythro azithro right uh, results in hypokalemic hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis okay so hypokalemic right and hypochloremic so hcl is getting leaked out right so when HCL is going, what's happening? 
uh, CL is going that's uh, going to be taken over with bicarbonate the difference between the anions so uh, since CL is a negative ion and bicarbonate is a negative ion uh, if there's less bicarbonate CL comes in if there's less CL then bicarbonate comes in so you go into metabolic acidosis right also with the CL you're also losing hydrogen ions and hydrogen ions determine the pH uh, for being acidic right so that is also going out so now you have metabolic alkalosis right so uh, so what happens is uh, since it's alkalosis the body tries to gain back the H ions so the potassium is going to get exchanged for H ions so that's how you end up with hypothalamic okay uh, then hypochloramic metabolic alkalosis okay so secondary to vomiting of gastric acid and subsequent volume contraction ultrasound shows thickened and lengthened pylorus uh, you'll see that over there and treatment is surgical incision of pyloric muscles or pyloromyotoma okay just get rid of it This is uh, important one to understand because they ask about the embryology of pancreas and this is like the last bit in embryo. Pancreas and spleen embryology. Okay, this is the stomach and this is this. Let me see if I can find a better place for that. Uh, so pancreas derived from foregut, okay, remember what foregut was, it was from esophagus to uh, uh, duodenum at the level of crown bile duct incision, also known as ampulla of water, that's right there. Okay. So pancreas is derived from the foregut, uh, ventral pancreatic bud contributes to the uncinate process, okay, so that's the ventral pancreas right there. that thing is the ventral pancreas okay uh, that is going to contribute to the uncinate process that's this thing right here so eventually what's going to happen is this ventral bud is going to come back around and like turn and then come here and then these two get fused together okay uh, both ventral and dorsal buds contribute to the pancreatic head and main pancreatic duct so they're talking about the pancreatic head over here and this is the main pancreatic uh, duct, and this is the tail. Okay. Uh, so both ventral, that's this one, and the yellow one is the dorsal, but it's contribute to the pancreatic head. This is the pancreatic head over here, and the main pancreatic duct, that's the main pancreatic duct, because this one comes from this blue one. Right? So it's a branch from that. So you can have annular pancreas this is abnormal rotation of ventral pancreatic bud okay so before that let's look at this so at five weeks what you get is this is uh the bird's eye view of this so this is going to go back around and then under the dorsal bud right so that's going to come back around like that um, then uh, you get rotation of first these two get fused together and then it's coming back around again so five weeks it goes out into that like that okay. and 
Well, it's not going to use. This is a common path, so I guess that's gallbladder. Okay. So gallbladder stays, uh, goes on top. This goes around, around here, and then it glues it together like that. Okay. So that whole turning, uh, there's an abnormal rotation on ventral pancreatic butt. It forms a ring of pancreatic tissue. Okay. And that and uh, tissue encircles the second part of duodenum, which what causes duodenal narrowing right so that's what that is uh, arrowing a right there that's the thing and vomiting it's associated with down syndrome as well so you can just look for that So it's supposed to go out, but instead of that, uh, what happens is there's a little bit of that left over there, and that causes the annular thing. Not a cool picture, but so that's what you end up with, right? It's pressing onto the second part of the duodenum. Okay. So it encircles it. Uh, where? at the second part of duodenum. So will you have bilis vomiting or not? You will, right? Because again, duodenum is being constricted after, uh, like it's, it's second part, right? And this is uh, the first part, I guess. But then it also attaches at that part. So if, I don't know if you will or not. I guess not because they didn't mention it. And also, uh, they use it for this thing, due to the notation, that uh, type of questions there. Okay. So one more time, final. Abnormal rotation of ventral pancreatic bud forms a ring of pancreatic tissue. Uh, it encircles the second part of duodenum, may cause duodenal narrowing and vomiting, associated with du uh, Down syndrome. Then you have pancreas division, that's ventral and dorsal parts fail to fuse at seven weeks of development. Common anomaly, mostly asymptomatic, but may cause chronic abdominal pain and or pancreatitis. Okay. Uh, spleen, arises in mesentery of stomach, hence is mesodermal, but has a foregut supply, uh, which is celiac trunk. Okay. Uh, this is the special thing about it. Uh, don't forget this because they'll tell you that there's an organ in the abdomen uh, which was uh, derived from a different uh, bud or different uh, you know layer but then has a different uh, blood supply from the other structures that derive from the same uh, layer right so spleen is special because it's derived from mesoderm but then it has a foregut supply uh, so splenic artery branch of celiac artery or celiac trunk okay this was ventral and dorsal parts they both failed to fuse these two things at some weeks of development so common anomaly mostly asymptomatic but may cause chronic abdominal pain and or pancreatitis why because this bud is also you know has a branch into the accessory pancreatic duct into the duodenum. So it does have a supply there. So it doesn't have to rely on this uh, main pancreatic duct. So it could be asymptomatic because of that. Okay. Uh, on to anatomy. Uh, these are the retroperitoneal structures. Retroperitoneal structures are posterior to and outside of the peritoneal cavity. Injuries to retroperitoneal structures can uh, cause blood or gas accumulation in the retroperitoneal space. So what does that mean? Let's look at that.
So it's basically a sheath like this, okay? And anything uh, inside of it is uh, considered peritoneal and outside of it is considered uh, retroperitoneal. So this sheath right here, right? That's the peritoneal cavity, right? And anything behind that sheath or the bag that I think of it like a bag, right? So behind the bag of retro uh, peritoneum, peritoneal cavity, uh, everything behind that, all the structures are gonna be retroperitoneal. Okay, so that's what this is. So retroperitoneal space. So this is the bag right here. Okay. Wait. Sorry, this is the bag, the gray stuff. Right. So that's the peritoneal cavity right here. And then uh, structures behind it, like you can see aorta, you can see duodenum, pancreas right here, right? All of that stuff is considered retroperitoneal. So if there's any leakage or anything of that kind, uh, internal hemorrhage, uh, all the fluid is gonna get accumulated in the retroperitoneal space. Okay. It's not gonna show up down here or here, right? So, so that's what that is. So injuries to retroperitoneal structure can cause blood or gas accumulation in the retroperitoneal space. So which structures are there? Uh, we think of it like sac buffer. So suprarenal, adrenal glands. Uh, these are not shown here. But you have to remember that S is for suprarenal, as in the adrenal glands, because adrenal glands are on top of uh, the kidneys. Right, so suprarenal, A is for aorta and IVC. You can see that here. Uh, remember, this is the right side. And this is the left side. Uh, so that's why you're seeing IVC on this side. Sorry. Uh, just so this thing makes sense. Uh, imagine the person is laying down on the table and the head is up here. eyes, you see the nose, you see the double chin and the mouth, okay, and uh, the legs is toward, uh, legs are towards you, so you'll see your, the feet over here, on this side, okay, so that's why this is the right side, and this is the left side. And that's what you're seeing IVC on this side. Cool. So, just to be thorough, the dude is laying down like this. Left leg like that. Okay, and arms are there. And the X ray is viewing from here. And that's how you're seeing this photo. Uh, that's why this is the right side and this is the left side. And yeah, I'm just going through that because this really used to confuse me. Okay, so aorta and IVC, uh, duodenum, second through the fourth part. Okay. Uh, pancreas, except for the tail. Uh, ureters not shown, uh, then you have colon, ascending, kidney, esophagus, and rectum, okay? So again, one more time, suprarenal, adrenal glands, aorta and IVC, duodenum, pancreas, ureters, colon, kidneys, esophagus. So for colon, there's no transverse, okay? It's just descending and ascending ones. Duodenum there, you see ascending, you see descending, uh, you see duodenum right there, and you see uh, pancreas, right, except for the tail. Uh, you see IVC and aorta, you see kidney and suprarenal glands are over there too. Uh, 
Did you return to Sergeant Arcade? Yeah, so. Uh, Esophagus. Is a very important one to remember. So it's like portion. And rectum, partially. Just not sure. So, let's do this. And let's get to that tank. Okay, so sad fucker. Just do it in your head. Important gastrointestinal ligaments. Uh, yeah, this is a important one as well. So this is the liver. This is the similar representation as this one. Dudes laid down on the table like this, and this is where how we are looking at it. So that side is going to be the right side, and that's the left side is the back so liver stomach uh, this is the portal triad this is the spleen over here and these are your kidneys aorta and IBC on the right side uh, we have this is the front side I guess now right the anterior side so this is the falciparum still the right side for the dude right. uh, sorry so this is the diaphragm this is the liver this is the stomach and this is the spleen and transverse colon okay so majority of them are named after the place they are in okay so if except for this one right here so this one is called the falciparum it attaches from the abdominal wall to the liver okay uh, then we have a ligament right here between the liver and the stomach so uh, that's called hepatogastric, right? Hepato for liver, gastric for uh, stomach. Then we have one right here between the duodenum and the liver. So it's called hepatoduodenal ligament, okay? And then we have one between the stomach and the spleen. So it's called gastrosplenic ligament. Then we have one between the uh, stomach and the colon, transverse colon. So it's called gastrocolic ligament. And there's also one here between the kidneys and spleen, and that's called splenorenal ligament. Cool? It just corresponds to the place you're in. Uh, falciparum ligament is the only one that doesn't do that, so you have to remember that one. So falciparum ligament, it connects the liver to the anterior abdominal wall, okay? Uh, so the structures contained are ligamentum teres hepatis, it's the derivative of fetal umbilical vein. Remember, we read about that. And the patent um, uh, para-umbilical veins. We read about this as well in uh, CVS embryo. Uh, these are the derivative of ventral mesentery. Okay, look at, so uh, it contains ligamentum teres hepatis. Okay, that's the important significance of that. Uh, what happens to umbilical vein and artery afterwards, right? So the umbilical vein becomes ligamentum teres hepatis. Also, patent paraumbilical veins are contained within the falciform ligament, and that's where the significance ends. So, liver to the anterior abdominal wall. Then we have hepatoduodenal ligament, that's this little one right there. Right. Uh, So it's that one right there, the one that contains the portal triad, right? So liver to duodenum. And this makes sense because why? Because what does portal triad do? It uh, drains the GIT, right? Why does it drain GIT? Just so real quick. Because you don't want all the uh, waste products going into the circulation, right? So it goes into the liver 
before it goes into the system so that it can get filtered out right that's why there's a direct connection from the uh, duodenum to liver and that's how it transfers its uh, waste products to the liver liver then uh, filters it out okay so hepatic duodenal ligament contains the portal triad proper hepatic artery portal vein common bile duct okay notes derivative of ventral mesentery okay so ventral mesentery that's the one over here as well as this so both of these are ventral mesentery i think this one is left right so let's talk about this one and then these three are dorsal mesentery so that should be easy to remember anything above the line of uh, duodenum is going to be this okay uh why is this significant because of the pringle maneuver okay the pringle maneuver is ligament is compressed manually or with a vascular clamp and omento foramen to control bleeding from hepatic inflow source okay again ligament is compressed manually or with a vascular clamp and omento foramen that's the omento foramen uh, where which contains the portal triad okay uh, control bleeding from the hepatic inflow source okay so from portal veins or hepatic artery versus outflow which is the hepatic vein and IVC so real quick let's just look into what that is so they'll block clamp it like that okay and what happens then if there is bleeding during the surgery if they clamp this and they're still bleeding then it tells them that the bleeding is not from the inflow it's from the outflow but in case there is uh, they block that and the bleeding stop then they know that the bleeding is coming from the portal right so portal vein or hepatic artery okay so and So that's how they clamp it. They bring it out and then they will clamp it like that. Okay. And just so we know the anatomy of this. So you have the hepatic artery and the portal vein coming into the liver, right? So if there's still bleeding after this is blood clamped, then the bleeding is coming from up here, right? But if the bleeding stops, then the bleeding was coming from down here or somewhere here. That's how they figured that out. So it's a ligament is compressed manually or with a vascular clamp or mental form. Okay, so this is the uh, omental bursa, okay. uh, and that would be the omental foramen right there. Uh, so they put their finger in here, and then they dig around for the portal vein and the hepatic artery, and then they bring it back out of here, and then they'll clamp it. Okay, so that uh, thing is the omental foramen. Okay, so ligament is compressed manually or with a vascular clamp and omental foramen to control bleeding from hepatic inflow source versus the outflow source. Okay, so inflow source is whatever is coming into the uh, liver. So you have a portal vein and hepatic artery coming in versus the outflow source. That's your hepatic veins or inferior vena cava. So borders the omental foramen which connects the greater and lesser set this is a part of lesser omentum okay so now that we know what lesser omentum is uh, you need to know what greater omentum is that's this thing right here okay. 
also on the less curvature between the less curvature and the uh, hepatic is the lesser lesser momentum and the fascia between like the one that touches the greater curvature is the greater momentum So that's what that looks like, the momentum, okay, and that's the lesser momentum. So now that we know that's the lesser momentum, so it makes sense that this is part of the lesser momentum because it's also on the lesser curvature of the stomach, right? Okay. And. So, part of lesser momentum. Okay, so hepatic gastric ligament that's between the liver and the stomach. Right, right there. Or right there. On liver to less lesser curvature of the stomach, uh, it contains the gastric vessels. Uh, easy to remember, right? Because hepatogastric, it contains the gastric vessels. Uh, it's derived from ventral mesentery. Uh, separates greater and lesser sacs on the right and may be cut during surgery to as access lesser sac. It is part of the lesser momentum. Cool. Important to remember, this contains gastric vessels. This is important for its perindromal work. It contains the portal triad, that's important too. This is important because it contains the derivative of fetal umbilical vein. Okay, now gastric colic ligament that's gastric, so stomach, and colic, that's the colon, transverse colon, right? So greater curvature of transverse colon, right there. Uh, what does it contain? It contains the gastroepifloic arteries. We'll read about that uh, over here. Okay. These are your gastric epifloic arteries. Uh, and that makes sense, right? Because uh, that's the area we are discussing right now. So this part uh, attached, the ligament attached to this and uh, the transverse colon, so it contains the right gastric epiploic over here and anterior superior pectoral duodenal over here and this is the gastric duodenal. But okay, we'll do that when we come, but now you know what is over there. Okay, gastric epiploic artery. So it's a uh, derivative of dorsal mesentery and part of uh, greater momentum. We didn't talk about dorsal mesentery because it's not important. But real quick, let's see what that is. Okay. So that's your dorsal mesentery, and that's the ventral mesentery when it's you're in your embryonic stage. Okay. They don't really test you on this, so I'm not wanting to go in much detail into it. But uh, what is important is this, gastroepiploic arteries are part of great curvature and transverse colon ligament. So that's gastric colic ligament. You have uh, gastrosplenic ligament. Okay, so that's uh, stomach and spleen. So greater curvature and spleen. Uh, what does it contain? Uh, it contains the It contains the short gastrics and left gastri gastroepifloic vessels. It's derived, okay, so it's short gastric. Uh, that's also in this. Let me just bring this up there. Okay. So it's between the spleen and the stomach, right? So you see short gastric right there and left uh, gastroepifloic, right? So that's why uh, this gastrosplenic ligament contains short gastrics and left gastroepifloic vessels over there, okay? It's derivative of dorsal mesentery. Uh, you just remember it again, uh, anything below the uh, duodenum or, yeah, duodenum, uh, it's gonna be dorsal uh, mesentery. Everything uh, above it, so like hepatogastric, uh, hepatoduodenal, and falciform ligament, it's gonna be ventral mesentery, okay? Uh, 
Uh, then you have splenorenal ligament. Uh, you won't see it in here, but this is between spleen and uh, kidney or renal. Right, so spleen or renal is going from spleen to renal. So spleen to left pararenal space. Uh, what it does it contain? It contains the splenic artery and vein and tail of pancreas. That's uh, tail of pancreas is involved there too. Got to know about that. Uh, see this pancreas right here, this yellow thing? So that's what that is. So if you just imagine a continuation of that line, right there, it will go like this, and then it'll come back, and then it would form the head like that. Right? So it contains the tail of pancreas. Okay, and it's derivative of those same thing too. So splenic artery and vein between the spleenorenal and tail of pancreas. Cool, I think that covers that pretty well. You shouldn't forget the structures contained. That's majority of the time what they're gonna ask for. For this one, they're gonna ask you about the pharyngeal maneuver and what the significance is. So if you uh, clamp it, uh, you can control the bleeding uh, from the hepatic inflow source, so this, and uh, versus the outflow source. Why is this significant? Because if there is in case of uh, bleeding and you control the, you try to control it by clamping this and it still bleeds, then uh, the source is not this, it's somewhere else, basically. Cool. Let's take a digestive look. tract ana anatomy. Okay. So we have layers of uh, gut wall. Okay. This thing right here. Again, you gotta be able to differentiate the layers. So, layers of gut wall inside to out uh, is MSMS. So, M for mucosa. Okay, that's this thing right here. Uh, mucosa, it has the epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis mucosa. Right. Then you have submucosa. It includes submucosal nerve plexus, Meissner. Uh, it secretes. Uh, fluids so SSS right so submucosa contains the submucosal nerve plexus has the my it's all known as uh, Meissner this plexus is known as Meissner and what does it do it secretes fluid okay so that's this uh, river looking like layer right there uh, let's see if there's more Uh, so that's some mucosa right there. So you should be able to look at this one and figure it out. So mucosa, submucosa. Mucosa has uh, gastric glands and gastric pits. And this one has muscularis mucosa. These are gastric glands, this little spongy bubble looking thing. And um, these are the gastric pits. Again, muscularis mucosa. Okay. Cool. So mucosa, tunica mucosa, it contains the muscularis mucosa, it contains lamina propria and the epithelium, right? So epithelium would be outside. Then comes the lamina propria, then the muscularis mucosa. Then you have submucosal, containing the submucosal glands, and the submucosal nerve plexus, which is Meissner, and secretes fluid. Then you have muscularis externa, that's this beefy looking layer right here. Right. It includes the myantric nerve plexus, this is the ore back. Uh, it's the one that's responsible for motility because it's the one that moves things and the one that moves things is muscularis externa that's a beefy looking one okay the layers of muscularis are inner circular layer 
myantric nerve plexus on the or back and the outer longitudinal layer then you have serosa uh, this is uh, when intraperitoneal and adventitia when it's retroperitoneal so in the peritoneal cavity it's called serosa and outside of it is called adventitia okay so that's the serosa level right there and this little thin layer right there would be the serosa okay uh, ulcers can extend into submucosa that's the second layer inner or outer muscular layer okay. the inner circular layer or the outer longitudinal area erosions are in the mucosa only okay uh, that's important to know because they will talk about erosions and you need to know that it doesn't go deeper than the mucosa however ulcers go deep as deep as uh, muscularis externa frequency of basal electric rhythm uh, slow waves which originate in the intestinal cells of cajal and duodenum uh, more than ilium, more than stomach. That's the, they're talking about the rhythm of the waves. Not important. Uh, digestive tract and histology. So now we're gonna talk about these layers, uh, where we find them in regards to the digestive tract. In esophagus, you get non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium under one third. Uh, sorry, upper one third is strident muscles, and then middle and lower two third is are smooth muscles, with some overlap at the transition. Okay. Because uh, you swallow up here, so you need the strident muscles there, but after you swallow it down, uh, the gravity does most of its thing, so you need smooth muscles there. Okay. Uh, then stomach you have gastric glands in the stomach right the spongy little, little things right there right there right there uh you have parietal cells which are eosinophilic pink red arrow and b pink and red arrow and b uh chief cells are basophilic okay that's chief cells right there For stomach, this is the gastric gland, right? So that's those things right there. Upper glandular layer, layer. then you have deeper glandular layer. These, this is your muscularis mucosa and submucosa. Okay. Uh, so parietal cells. Uh, these are your parietal cells over here. Uh, they're eosinophilic. Uh, you have chief cells right there, uh, which are basophilic. Okay. Enterochromaffin cell like chief cell, parietal cell, mucosa, and surface epithelium. Okay, cool. to duodenum uh, it has villi right, and microvilli increase in absorptive surface uh, you have Brunner's glands uh, these are important why because these are the bicarbonate uh, secreting cells of submucosa so this is the thing that neutralizes the HCL that comes from the stomach and that's how it neutralizes the acidic secretions of parietal cells from the gastric glands. Okay. Uh, okay, so yeah, 
they're known to secrete HCl. So when it comes to bi uh, duodenum, they don't need the acidity, so it gets neutralized by Brunner ions over here. Then you have lips of Libricum. Uh, it contains stem cells that replace enterocytes, globulin cells, and pinnate cells that secrete deficins, deficins, uh, lysozymes, and TNF. And you have Plica circularis in the distal duodenum. Since it's in the distal, you can be sure that you'll see that in here as well, duodenum. And there it is, Plica circularis, right? Okay, so let's look at the duodenum. This is the duodenum. It looks way different than uh, the gastric gland, right? So you should be able to tell the difference at least between stomach and uh, duodenum slides. Okay. It has a deeper crypts of Libricum. Okay. And here's Plica circularis. So I guess it's these little things, small ones. Uh, Plica circularis. These are the Plica circularis right there in the duodenum. So, duodenum also has villi, crypts of Libricum. Those are the crypts. Uh, so, these crypts right there, you have. Okay. Uh, and Plica circularis, the circular things. Um, yeah. Uh, taller and, sorry, this is an ilium. I don't know why I keep referring to it, but. It's the same thing, even ilium has this uh, libricum and that stuff. So. Um, the way you know that this is ilium and not anything else is because of this right here. These are the pier patches, and we'll come to that. So tall, more prominent, numerous versus ilium. Okay. Now feathered appearance with oral contrast and increase in surface area. This one's not really that important, the only time it would be important if there are ulcers over here as well. And that would be because uh, by Brunner Grants is not able to overcome the acidity. And it could be because of uh, Zollinger, Allison syndrome, or whatever. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So now Ilium. It has villi and it has pier patches. So that's this thing right here. Why is this important? Because this is the lymph node for intestine. This is where uh, it has the immune cells and all that. So it has lymphoid aggregates and lamina propria and submucosa. That's where it is, submucosa and lamina propria in those two layers. And we know what those two layers are, right? Lamina propria is in the mucosa and then the submucosa itself. Plica circularis, it's in proximal ilium, right, this stuff little circles. Uh, Crips of uh, Libricum, uh, these things. Uh, largest number of goblet cells in small intestine. So this is known for to have the largest number of goblet cells in the intestine. Okay, And then at the end you have colon. Colon is easy to figure out because it doesn't have the crypts uh, as big as the ones you see over here or here. Uh, you don't have it here on these. So crypts of Libricum with abundant globlet cells, but no villi. Okay, so no villi. You don't see the villi here. It's completely flat. Uh, these are the crypts, I guess. And the goblet cells, you would see a spongy looking stuff. Oh, maybe that one right there. And maybe that one right there. Okay. I can't really recognize that over here. But they won't you won't have to differentiate between those. But what you need to know is ilium. Uh, a slide for ilium and slide for stomach. Those two are important. And how to differentiate between the stomach and all the other intestine layers. Abdominal aorta and branches, uh, right and left. Uh, inferior vena cava and aorta. So you have inferior phrenic, superior supravenal, and middle supravenal. Uh, these are branches of celiac, right there. 
uh, segment of the aorta. Then you have superior mesenteric artery. Then under it, you have renal and gonadal, and then renal branches into inferior vein, suprarenal, and then you have inferior mesenteric artery. Uh, you have bifurcation at L4. Uh, right, uh, this is the right common iliac, this is the left common iliac. The middle one is median sacral, because this goes into the sacrum. Uh, you have internal iliac, because they go inside of the hip bone or pelvis. Uh, these one go outside of the pelvis, so that's external iliac, internal iliac, and external iliac go into the side as well. Okay, artery supplying GI structures are single and branch anteriorly. Okay, now this is the anterior aorta side, so they branch all anteriorly. Artery supplying non GI structures are paired and branch laterally and posteriorly. So all the GI structures go anteriorly. Everything that's non-GI go uh, in pairs, uh, posteriorly and laterally. Okay. Uh, two areas of the colon have dual blood supply from distal artery, arterial branches. Um, these are called the watershed regions uh, you need to know the watershed regions for GIT. These are uh, susceptible and colonic ischemia, right? So it's the splenic flexure, and so let's look at these. So it's this area right here, that's the splenic flexure, and this area right here is the, uh, this one, rectosigmoid junction. Okay. So why does this happen? Basically it's because uh, there's one side that's coming in uh, and it's being supplied by a superior mesenteric artery, and then the other side is getting, coming in and uh, it's getting supplied by inferior mesenteric artery, but it's uh, the supply is very limited. It's like at the end and terminals of the branch, right? So terminal branch of this and terminal branches of this is coming in and it's like really, you know, small vessel. So it's not able to perfuse it adequately. So this one is like half-assing the job and this one's half-assing the job. So in any time there is an problem with uh, oxygenation or ischemia there these are the first ones to go okay so splenic flexure and recto sigmoid uh, junction which is the last sigmoid arterial branch from the inferior mesenteric artery and superior rectal artery okay they both are half assing their job so rectal sigmoid junction and splenic flexure so a question will come like, uh, okay, this person was uh, uh, brain dead and they couldn't, uh, you know, they had respiratory depression or something like that, or not brain dead, but like they just, you know, had uh, cerebral depression or respiratory depression. So they weren't breathing as much. So uh, which one of these would be, uh, would be at high risk of damage? So they'll give you all of these areas and then they'll be like one watershed area. Okay, so it would be this. So in in the brain, it's uh, the area between uh, the anterior and middle and middle and posterior cerebral arteries. Those are the watershed for brain. For GIT, it's these. For kidney, it's the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal, sorry, descending uh, in the medulla, descending part of the tubule in the medulla of the kidneys. Okay. Uh, Nutcracker syndrome, compression of left renal art, uh, renal vein. So this is the left renal vein, uh, somewhere here. Okay. So compression of left renal vein, to the left side when it's coming down here, between the superior mesenteric. So. 
to the side. So the left renal vein is coming from here. Oops. It's gonna come from here. And then it's gonna go under the severe mesenteric artery and then supply the left side of the kidney uh, to the left kidney, right? So the, what's happening over here is that superior mesenteric artery is pressing down onto this vein. So compression of left renal vein between the superior mesenteric artery and the aorta may cause abdominal flank pain and gross hematuria, right? Uh, from rupture of thin walled renal varicocities. And these are also, you know, This thing has a little varicose uh, vein going out. So if this is going back up and all this blood is going into this and then all since it can't keep going, it's going to go into these, right? So these are going to stretch out a little. So it can uh, rupture and then you get hematuria as well because of that. Hematuria you get usually because uh, the blood from renal is not, you know, able to give out. So, you know, the blood is not, you know, going out. So, if it's not going out, then there's buildup of blood in the kidney, and now you're going to pee it out instead of going back into the system. So, from a thin mill, renal vertical city. So, it's not that this is here. It's over here inside here. Okay. I read that wrong. Okay. Uh, from rupture of thin walled renal varicocities and left sided varicocele because this one also supplies the gonadal uh, vein. Right. So when the gonads are trying to come in and then supply this vein, but it's backed up here as well. Right. So. Sorry, it's back, not backed up on this side, it's backed up on this side, okay? So that's why there's a Reiko seal here, and then it's going to build up, it's going to get tortuous, and all that. Okay, uh, then uh, you have superior mesenteric artery syndrome, characterized by intermittent intestinal obstruction symptoms, primarily postprandial pain, when uh, superior mesenteric artery and aorta compresses the transverse third portion of duodenum typically occurs in conditions associated with diminished mesenteric fat for example low body weight or malnourishment nutrition sorry so superior mesenteric artery syndrome is characterized by intermittent intestinal obstruction symptoms primarily prosperinal pain so after you eat that's when this happens so when superior mesenteric artery and aorta compresses so this is the superior mesenteric artery and this is the aorta and they compress this duodenum and that's the renal vein right so that can get uh, happen as well the fat is actually cushioning this so and this doesn't happen but when you have weight loss or you're malnourished, you don't have that much amount of weight. So this is going to then push into the duodenum. So after you eat food and food enters here, it's going to travel down and all the way here. And this is going to bulge out, right? So then it's going to be harder for this to pass through between that gap. So as a man, it would uh, compress transverse portion of duodenum typically occurs in conditions associated with diminished mesenteric fat. For example, low body weight and malnourishment. Okay, uh, on to gastrointestinal blood supply and in intervention. Embryonic gut region, artery, parasympathetic intervention, vertebral levels, and structure supplies. For gut, artery, ciliac. Right. So foregut is supplied by the cilia 
mid gut is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery and hind gut is supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. The fore gut has uh, vagus intervention, same as mid gut. Uh, fore gut has, it's at the vertebral level of uh, T12 and L1. Structure supply is pharynx, vagus nerve only, and lower esophagus. Celiac artery only to proximal duodenum. Uh, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, and spleen. Uh, Mesoderm. Okay. Pharynx, vagus nerve only, and. Okay, so it supplies uh, the foregut. Pharynx, vagus nerve only. And lower esophagus, which is celiac artery only, to proximal duodenum. Liver, gallbladder, pancreas, spleen, right up to the uh, ampulla of water. That's where it goes up to. But this one is supplied by, it's derived from mesoderm, right? but it's supplied by this celiac artery. Then you have mid gut, uh, supplied by superior mesenteric artery. Uh, vagus uh, at the level of L1. It's distal structure is supplied. Distal to the duodenum to proximal two thirds of the transverse colon. We looked at that already. Hind gut is inferior mesenteric artery. Pelvic, uh, sorry, uh, pelvic uh, is the intervention for this. Then you have, L it's at the level of L3. Uh, distal one third of the transverse colon to the upper portion of the anal canal. That's like the first or second page of this chapter. Sympathetic intervention arises from abdominal prevertebral ganglia, uh, celiac, superior mesenteric artery, and inferior mesenteric. Okay. So celiac trunk. Uh, branches of celiac trunk, common hepatic, splenic, and left gastric. Okay, so left gastric is three. Uh, common hepatic is blue, and then you have this splenic in purple. Okay, so common hepatic blue, splenic is purple, and left gastric is green. These constitute the main blood supply of the foregut. Strong anastomosis exists between left and right gastroepiploic and left and right gastric. So left and right gastric. So right there so that's the right gastric so there's an anastomos over there and then you have left gastroepiploic and right gastroepiploic right here there's an anastomosis over there okay uh, let's look at the branches for this this was the tail of pancreas we drew let's get rid of that okay so celiac trunk comes in on the right side and it has common hepatic and then the common hepatic splits into proper hepatic and <coughs> and I guess improper hepatic okay so proper hepatic then it splits into the right hepatic and the left hepatic and the right hepatic also gives off a branch to the uh, gallbladder uh, the cystic branch of the right hepatic okay uh, over here we have uh, right gastric right there uh, going to the lesser curve of and the lower curve of the gas uh, stomach. Uh, over here we have gastroduodenal because that's the one from going from the stomach to the duodenum, right, right in between there, right? So this is the start of duodenum and this is the end of stomach. So right in the middle you have gastroduodenal supplied by the common hepatic. Uh, also you all have uh, posterior superior pancreatocranchy duodenal right it's on the posterior side you have anterior superior pancreatoco duodenal over here and right gastric and right epiploic over here okay at the lowest end uh, this is only complicated one these ones are easier to remember because the splenic gives off a uh, short splenic and left uh, gastroepiploic branches uh, those two only. Okay. Uh, then here you have. Okay, so there could be a qu uh, question about uh, 
that there was a lesion while they were trying to cut off this portion of the stomach uh, because of some uh, disease or something so they got rid of this but do in doing so they also damaged right epic fluid uh, gastroepic fluid right uh, however this area was still supplying uh, getting supply uh, blood supply so how is that possible is because of the anastomosis uh, it's being supplied by two different arteries this area okay so let gastroepic fluid gets taken care, taken care of that I don't know what just happened okay I guess that's how you're finishing this one uh, <laughs> I don't know what happened there. the more I do it it just goes crazy let me just like that Okay, uh, then uh, with the left gastric, so don't confuse left gastric with left gastroepic fluid, okay? Left gastric gives off esophageal branches right here, and then you have uh, this branch of left gastric right here, uh, and astomosin with the right gastric, cool. Uh, and then you have cordosystemic anastomosis. Uh, these are four uh, site of anastomosis okay so remember how this thing comes in from the duodenum or you know the intestine uh, into the liver because we don't want waste products circulating our system so first thing that happens uh, the blood supply goes into the liver via proto vein and then it gets filtered over here and then it passes down into the hepatic vein and which goes into the inferior vena cava and then into the system from there okay so the first anastomose we have is over here uh, it's going to be between uh, at the side of esophagus right uh, clinical sign here is esophageal versus uh, but the anastomose is between the left gastric and esophageal uh, which drains into the azygous so one that's purple, that's uh, left gastric, and that's the portal venous system going into the actual system, which is esophageal veins, right? Okay. Uh, so esophageal vein is the systemic one, and this is the portal one. Okay. Uh, over here, you can get esophageal varices. This is why you get that during congestion and right heart failure involvement right uh, then you have umbilicus uh, right, right there between para umbilical vein and the epigastric vein epigastric is easy to remember because it's at the gastric in it so, and then para umbilical is also easy to remember uh, so if you have congestion uh, Hepatic congestion, you will have uh, caput medusa looking thing that looks like that. That's what that looks like. Cool. Uh, it's between paraumbilical and small epigastric vein branches of inferior and superficial epigastric veins of the anterior abdominal vein. The third one we have is at the rectum over here. This is why you get like uh, hemorrhoids. Uh, anorectal varices. So that's, you know, kind of like hemorrhoids over there. Of course, that's not the pathogenesis for hemorrhoids. That can happen for other reasons too. But this is one of them. Anorectal varices. Uh, so superior rectal uh, anastomosing with middle and inferior rectal okay. so that superior rectal coming in from the hepatic and it anastomosis with the systemic on this side with the middle and inferior rectal veins okay, cool. so only the superior rectal vein is 
part of the portal dissociation. Okay, so you can get esophageal varices, uh, caput medusa, or anorectal varices. So varices of gut, butt, and caput uh, medusa are commonly seen with portal hypertension. And the fourth one here, the important one, uh, treatment with tips or transjugular intrahepatic portal system chunks between the portal vein and hepatic vein re relieves portal hypertension by shunting blood to the systemic uh, circulation, right? So that's portal congestion. So there's one way we relieve it. We just, you know, open this shunt up basically. So instead of going, uh, putting in pressure at this er these areas, it just goes straight into the uh, hepatic vein. But you can imagine the problem here then, right? Uh, the blood is not gonna be as filtered as it used to be, uh, right? It's not gonna be filtered. So you will end up with waste product in your system, okay? So between the portal vein and hepatic vein, it relieves the portal congestion or hypertension by shunting blood to the systemic circulation bypassing the liver. Tips can precipitate hepatic encephalopathy. That's what you, the side effect of this thing is, hepatic encephalopathy, due to decreased clearance of ammonia from shunting. Right now, uh, ammonia is not being neutralized. It's getting sent to the system. Uh, pectinate line, also called dentate line, formed where endoderm or hindgut meets ectoderm. Uh, nerves, yeah, arteries, veins, and lymphatic. So, also called dentate line, okay, pectinate line. It's the area where endoderm meets the ectoderm. So, endoderm is the inner layer, ectoderm is the outer layer of the skin. Uh, it's uh, above the pectinate line, you get internal hemorrhoids uh, and adenocarcinoma. And uh, internal hemorrhoids uh, are abnormal distension of anal venous plexus. Risk factor include older age and chronic constipation. Okay. Receive visceral intervention and therefore are not painful. So you don't feel pain for this, but you'll see blood in the stool. Uh, so they receive visceral intervention. That's inferior hypogastric plexus, uh, T12 to L3. Uh, you can have arteries, superior rectal artery, which is a branch of inferior mesenteric artery. Then you have uh, veins, superior rectal vein, uh, inferior mesenteric vein. All right, so it goes from superior rectal vein to inferior mesenteric vein uh, to splenic vein to portal vein. Okay, so go here. So it's going from superior rectal vein to inferior mesenteric vein to splenic vein, this thing right here, and into the portal vein. Okay, this is the portal vein. So I guess it's going from here to here, and then this thing right here. Superior rectal vein is here, so it's supplied by superior rectal artery as well. And for lymphatics, it drains into internal iliac lymph node. So internal iliac lymph node would be right here. So these are the internal iliac ones. So I guess their lymph nodes would be like around this area. Okay, so it drains into the internal iliac lymph nodes. These are important to know because uh, they will ask you about, you know, the differences between this, they'll touch that. Uh, why is this one painful? Below the pectinate line, external hemorrhoids, anal fissures, squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, it's because of somatic intervention, right? And that's coming from pudendal nerve, S2 to S4. Okay, uh, for external hemorrhoids, it receives somatic intervention inferior rectal branch of pudendal nerve 
and are therefore painful if thrombosed. You can have anal fissure. This is quite common. Uh, it's a tear in anoderm below the pectinate line, so pain while pooping. Blood on toilet paper located in posterior midline because this area is poorly perfused. It's associated with low fiber diets and constipation. So low fiber diets, if they're eating out a lot, they might have this and suffer from it. You just start taking fiber and it usually heals this uh, within a few days. Uh, inferior recto, by fiber I mean like a uh, psyllium husk or something. Uh, inferior rectal artery, branch of internal pudendal artery. Uh, then you have, yeah, inferior rectal artery, branch of internal artery. Pudendal nerve, internal pudendal artery. And then you have inferior rectal vein, going into internal pudendal vein to internal iliac vein, and then common iliac vein to inferior vena cava. That's how it reaches inferior vena cava. Because this one doesn't go into the portal circulation. So since this is on the outside ectoderm, that's superficial. So raised to superficial inguinal lymph node. Cool. Just a review. Visceral intervention, somatic intervention. This is inferior hypogastric plexus, T12 to L3. This one is somatic intervention, pudendal nerve, S2 to S4. This one is superior rectal artery. This is inferior rectal artery. The, uh, this one is branch of inferior mesenteric artery, this one's a branch of pudendal artery. Uh, for the veins, this goes into portal vein uh, through this connection, superior rectal vein to IMV to splenic vein to portal vein. This one goes into the IVC from, uh, it follows this path, inferior rectal vein to internal pudendal vein to internal iliac vein to common iliac vein to IVC. Uh, this is inside, so drains to internal iliac nodes. Uh, lymph nodes and this is outside or superficial so it drains to superficial but inguinal lymph node okay it's important to remember this is inguinal this is iliac okay uh, liver tissue architecture uh, it's hard for me to uh, read it from a diagram at this point but you won't be asked about that anyways but just know that, uh, just know what a liver architecture looks like, okay? So we'll look at that. The functional unit of liver is made up of hexagonally arranged lobules surrounding the central vein with portal triads on the edge, okay? So this is bile duct, this is HA, hepatic artery, bile duct, and then this is your portal vein, this thing right here, okay, so you can see this thing look like a little diagram or a triangle right there, right, so, yeah, not a triangle, it's apparently supposed to be uh, hexagonal, but anyways, functional unit of liver is made up of hexagonally arranged lobules surrounding the central vein, so it surrounds this, uh, this central vein right here okay uh, central vein with portal triads so that's the triad that you're looking at over here I guess uh, on the edges consisting of portal vein hepatic artery and bile duct as well as lymphatics okay uh, apical surface of hepatocytes faces uh, bile canaliculi Basolateral surface faces sinusoids. Okay, so if you're looking at this, this is the hepatic artery, portal vein, bile duct, the central vein, and then the blood coming from the portal vein will come here and it gets filtered out from here before it goes into the central vein or the hepatic vein. Right? Uh, these are the sinusoids. Uh, that's these things right here. Uh, this is what the triangle was that I was looking at up here. Right, the triangle that looks like that. Because uh, it includes the central vein, but 
Okay, I don't understand that one. <laughs> uh, okay, so the bile ductule is here. This is the stellate cell. This is the space of discs and coffer cells. Okay, again, apical surface of hepatocyte spaces bile canaliculi, right there. Uh, its basolateral surface faces sinusoids, coffer cells, specialized macrophages located in sinusoids, uh, lack arrows, and D. Yeah. We're not going to talk about that. Uh, yellow arrows and shows central vein clear bacteria and damaged or sensing RBC. So this is the function of coffer cell, right? These things right here, this is where it is. They're in the space of this, right? The coffer cells, what do they do? They clear bacteria and damaged or sensing uh, RBCs. So that's how that gets filtered. Then you have hepatic cell, stellate cells. or ITO cells in space of this, uh, these things right here. Uh, these are the ones that store vitamin A, okay, when quiescent, and produce uh, extracellular matrix when activated, responsible for hepatic fibrosis, okay. This is the one that's responsible for hepatic fi uh, fibrosis, okay. Hepatic stellate cells or ITO cells contain vitamin A when quiescent just when they're like dormant kind of thing. And these cells, hepatic uh, stellate cells are responsible for hepatic fibrosis. That's important. So we talked about coffer cells, we talked about stellate cells in the space of this, we talked about bile duct. Okay, uh, so coffer cell is the one that filters the blood coming from the trans, uh, hepatic artery and the portal vein and they both filtered before they go into the hepatic vein. Uh, there's zone 1, so this is the zone 1, the outer zone, the one that is well supplied by the blood, and zone 3 is the one that's supplied the least by the blood. So this is also considered like a watershed area. Okay. So affected first by viral hepatitis, uh, best oxygenated, most resistant to circulatory compromise, and ingested toxins, for example cocaine. Zone 2, intermediate zone, uh, yellow fever, okay. So yellow fever affects this area of the liver, zone 2. Uh, remember which one this was? It was a flavivirus, right? Uh, it was done with flavivirus. Uh, okay. So... Uh, you also have zone 3, which is pericentral, centrilobular zone, affected first by ischemia, least oxygenated, right, so this is affected by ischemia like a watershed would, it's the least oxygenated one, high concentration of cytochrome P450, most sensitive to metabolic toxins, for example, ethanol, CCL4, halothane, rifampin, and acetaminophen. This is a site of alcoholic hepatitis. Cool. Uh, they will test you on this zone 3 majority of the time. But uh, they could give you this or this. But also know that uh, where vitamin A is stored and what filters, which cell filter the blood. Uh, filiary structure, uh, cholangiography shows filling defect in gallbladder, uh, blue arrow in A, right there, that's the thing there. This is a common hepatic duct, or that thing right there. Okay. Uh, this is just an endoscope, so we don't look at that. And so cholangiography shows filling defect in uh, gallbladder and cystic duct. Uh, so the cystic duct should be here, but since you're not seeing it, it's because there is uh, obstruction over there. Okay. Uh, I think that is the cystic duct. 
gallbladder and then blue arrow. Okay, so that's the gallbladder. Never mind. I can't tell. And then cystic duct is in red. So that's that you can see right there. Uh, gallstones that reach the confluence of the common bile duct. So if you have a gallstone. If a gallstone is made in uh, the gallbladder and then it reaches the confluence of the bile duct and pancreatic duct, so that's bile duct and the pancreatic duct right there, right there. Let's make that brown color. How much time do I have? So confluence of the common bile duct and pancreatic duct at the water of ampulla, right, so that's right there, ampulla water. Uh, it can block both the common bile duct and pancreatic duct, right. Uh, this is the double duct sign. It causes, uh, causing both cholangitis and pancreatitis, so pan inflammation of the pancreas and inflammation of the bile duct, okay, respectively. Uh, tumors that arise in head of pancreas usually ductal adenocarcinoma okay so now we have head of pancreas tumor so this thing right here okay tumor that arises in the head of pancreas usually ductal adenocarcinoma can uh, cause obstruction of the common bile duct which will cause enlarged gallbladder with painless jaundice this is called the coil Corvusier sign, right? Enlarged pancreas, all better, and painless pancreas, uh, jaundice, sorry. Okay, so basically this uh, obstructs, uh, it becomes so big that it starts to obstruct this right here. And so then there will be backup of things into the bile duct and into the cystic duct to the gallbladder. So now you have big gallbladder, enlarged, uh, and you'll have painless jaundice as well. Uh, you need to know what cursor sign is. We'll do that in patho as well. But it's basically just painless jaundice with enlarged gallbladder. That's what that is. Uh, with increase in uh, LFTs. So femoral region. Uh, organization is lateral to medial. It's nerve, artery, vein, lymphatics, or navel. Uh, you are from you go from lateral to medial to find your navel, right? And what they mean is that nerve is lateral, right? So nerve, then first comes the artery, then the vein, and then you see the lymphatics. Right? So that's what they mean. Um, female triangle contains female nerve, artery, and vein. Venous nerve, uh, venous near the penis. Uh, so you don't confuse the artery and vein. Okay, so femoral triangle is this thing right here, the purple. Uh, femoral sheath is a uh, facial tube, three to four centimeters below the inguinal ligament. This is the inguinal ligament, the white one. Uh, three to uh, four centimeters below that, you have a uh, facial tube. Uh, containing femoral vein, artery, and canal. That's uh, which contains the deep inguinal lymph nodes. Okay, so that thing right there. Uh, but do not, but not in femoral nerve. Okay, it does not contain femoral nerve. So femoral sheath does not contain femoral nerve, but that contains it. So you have external iliac vessels here, you have ilius was, anterior superior iliac spine, femoral nerve, inguinal ligament, facial lata, uh, femoral ring, and sartor uh, sartorius, this muscle right here. Then you have inguinal epigastric vessels here, rectus abdominis, uh, those are your ab muscles. 
and then you have inguinal hesselbeck triangle right over here uh, that's the one that contains the lymphatics right uh, femoral vein femoral artery femoral triangle these are there femoral sheath and then adductor longus important thing is to know that it goes from lateral to medial and navel so nerve artery vein and then you have the uh, then you have inguinal canal right uh, you have the periton parietal peritoneum external peritoneal tissue here Transverse fascia, so this is the important one right here. Uh, then transverse abdominis muscle, internal oblique muscle right here, and then eponeurosis of external oblique muscle. You have inguinal ligament right here, uh, superficial external inguinal ring. You have the inferior epigastric vessels. We met them over here. Inferior uh, epigastric vessels right there. So those things right there. You have deep internal inguinal ring. This is a site of protrusion of indirect hernia, okay? Uh, okay, there's a question on this, we'll talk about that. So abdominal wall, site of protrusion uh, for direct hernia, okay? Then you have medial umbilical ligament, uh, Median umbilical ligament, rectus abdominis muscle, pyramidalis muscles, conjoint tendon, linea elba, and spermatic cord. Okay, so they ask question about what would the outer layer of uh, in a direct hernia would be made of. Okay, so uh, the outer layer would be made of either this, right, indirect hernia, or they could be which layer out of these is involved in the spermatic cord or you know in the making of deep inguinal uh, in internal hernia sorry or any of that so you need to know these layers so the outer layer is made from the internal sorry the inner layer is made from uh, transverse facialis or fascia transversalis fascia right there right. so that's made that makes the internal spermatic cord then you have cremestric muscle and fascia, which is made from internal oblique. So that's this one. So that one makes this cremestric muscle and fascia. And then you have the external spermatic fascia, which is made of external oblique. So you remember with this mnemonic ice tie. So ice is for internal spermatic fascia, cremestric muscle and fascia, and external spermatic fascia and the tie is transverse solid fascia internal oblique and external oblique okay we'll read about the that in battle uh, myopectineal orifice we have anterior superior iliac spine right there we have um, pubic tubercle and pubis symphysis right there uh, evagination of transverse salus fascia, internal deep uh, inguinal ring, right there. Okay. And we have uh, inguinal canal contents, the male ductus vas deferens, female brown ligament of uterus, ilioinguinal nerve, and internal spermatic vessel, right there, and then femoral nerve and external iliac vessel. <coughs> Sorry. So what's important out of this? Uh, this thing right here, what's contained in inguinal canal. So you have ductus vas deferens in male and in female you have round ligament of uterus. Okay. 
and uh, internal spermatic vessel. You have to memorize this. Ilioinguinal nerve, rounded metacuteus, inguinal nerve, internal spermatic vessel, ductus vas deferens, inguinal canal contacts. Okay, contacts. Uh, here you have the epigastric uh, vessels, right? Uh, coming out of external iliac vessels. That's it. And the borders of inguinal has a web triangle, the inguinal ligament, and then the pubic tubercle and pubic cephitis here. Cool. I don't think they'll ask any of that. They ask about this. What are the contents or what did you find in this inguinal canal? Vas deferens, round ligament of uterus, ingui iliac inguinal nerve, and internal spermal. Here they ask about this thing right here, ice tag. And here they just ask about. I don't think they really ask you about this. But this is the site you would do your uh, full blood if you need to from femoral region, femoral triangle. Uh, so hernias. Oh. Hernias are part of this. So hernias, protrusion of peritoneum through an opening, usually at a site of weakness. Okay, that's important. That's the pathogenesis. Uh, contents may be risk for incarceration, not reducible, but into the abdomen or pelvis. That's incarceration. Uh, it's not reducible. And strangulation is the one that causes ischemia and necrosis. Complicated hernias can present with tenderness, arrhythmia, and fever. Okay. So diaphragmatic hernia, that's the one that we saw with the tube on the groove. So one cent. Let's see what that looks like. So diaphragmatic hernia on this side. is a severe one okay so you see this tube right so the tube comes in it's going into the stomach but then this is the lung cavity so it's going into that so that tells you that it's going into the lung cavity over there right so there's a hernia over there okay this is a different thing that's happening to the person as well this patient but basically the gastric tube you see the continuation of the gastric tube into this lung cavity so that's how you know it's diaphragmatic hernia okay abdominal structure you know, enters the thorax uh, most common causes in infants it's congenital defect of pleuroperitoneal membrane uh, you get left-sided herniation okay uh, right hemidiaphragm is relatively protected by the liver so you won't see it over there. So the pleuroperitoneal membrane, that's this thing right here. Okay. So congenital defect of pleuroperitoneal membrane, left sided herniation. Right hemidiaphragm is relatively protected by liver. Okay. You see it over here. So this one that the liver protects that but this one I guess is not as well protected. In adults laxity defect of phrenoesophageal membrane okay never mind it's not pleura it's this one this is uh, the membrane So phrenoesophageal membrane, uh, you get hiatal hernia, herniation of stomach through the esophageal hiatus. Okay. Uh, the sliding hiatal hernia, this is gastroesophageal junction is displaced upwards as gastric cardia slides into the hiatus. You get a hourglass stomach, most common type, and it's associated with GERD. Um, 
then you have paraesophageal hyaluronia as this one the junction is fine but it's just that it's weak on this side so gastroesophageal junction is usually normal but gastric fundus protrudes into the thorax okay so the fundus is the one that's protruding the junction between the membrane and the esophagus is okay but it's the fundus that protrudes over the ear is the junction that is displaced so the junction is not okay so that's why it went up there okay so that's called sliding hiatal hernia or paraesophageal hiatal hernia these were your diaphragmatic hernia it's when you have abdominal structure enter the thorax in infant it's because of a defect of pleuroperitoneal membrane and it does it's a uh, defect of phrenoesophageal membrane cool uh in indirect inguinal hernia and direct inguinal hernia so the way you differentiate between the two uh, is quite easy you just look at inferior epigastric vessel and then if it's medial over here if it's medial to the inferior epigastric vessel it's going to be direct so md and then if it's lateral to the inferior epigastric vessel it's indirect so lie so mds don't lie so lateral is indirect medial is direct to the epigastric uh, that's one way to differentiate it another way of differentiating is the path it takes okay so if it goes through the internal deep inguinal ring external superficial inguinal ring and into the groin it enters through inguinal ring lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels it's caused by failure of processes vaginalis uh, We'll come across this in VPRO, but we need to know what that is. So, so that. So, when the testes are descending, when the testes are descending, they descend through uh, what's called processes vaginalis. Okay, so after it uh, descends, what happens to process vaginalis is that it gets obliterated. Okay, uh, so in but say it doesn't and then there's like a weeks a little gap between then there could be uh, when there is intra abdominal pressure the abdominal contents can go through that uh, process of vaginalis the remnant of it and then end up in your groin right here looks like there's a clear photo Okay, so obliterating. So that's uh, the process vaginalis is obliterated. Okay, like that is the last difference. But then sometimes it's open like this. So then when there's uh, pressure here, uh, the intestinal content will travel through this tunnel, known as process vaginalis, and then it will end up in your groin area, or oh, either here, because it's usually going to be here, because it'll get stuck here because of its size. But then, if it's like a little patient, then it could end up here as well. Okay. So now that we know what that looks like, this should make more sense. So it goes through the internal deep inguinal ring, external or superficial inguinal ring, and into the groin. It enters the internal inguinal ring, lateral, right, lateral to the inferior epigastric vessel. It's caused by the failure of processors vaginalis to close. Okay, so that tunnel right there. Uh, too close. It can form hydrocele. Okay. Um, so, process vaginalis can do indirect inguinal hernia and hydrocele. You need to know both of these things associated with process of vaginalis. It may be noticed in uh, infants or discovered in adults. Uh, may much more common in males obviously because process vaginalis is meant to transport testes and women won't have that so it's much more common in this women do have uh, process vaginalis but it's not as you know I think I don't know what the purpose is for that
Okay. So that L five chain. That's what it causes. Okay, so it follows the pathway of testicular descent and covered by all three layers of spermatic cord. Cool. So all three layers of spermatic cord are involved here. So those were your ice pack, right? Ice pack right there. Uh, when you have indirect inguinal hernia, it doesn't go through process vaginalis. Instead, it goes through the inguinal or Hasselbeck triangle, right? So Hasselbeck triangle, we looked at that over here. We didn't really talk about it, but you need to know the border of this, not the this, but this. So the border is made by abdominal muscles, the ingu uh, inguinal ligament, and the vessels, epigastric vessels. Okay. So protrudes through the inguinal or Hasselbeck triangle. It bulges directly through the parietal peritoneum medial to the e inferior epigastric right medial to the epigastric so let me just bring that down here So it bulges through peritone, parietal peritoneum medial to the epi inferior epigastric vessels, right? So that's epigastric inferior, sorry, medial to that because there's the abdominal muscles, right? So there, but lateral uh, to rectus abdominis, right? So lateral to this. Uh, goes through the external superficial inguinal ring only. Okay, it only goes through the external superficial inguinal ring. It's covered by external spermatic fascia, so you need to remember this, right? So if they ask you about ice tie, uh, which layer of this is made up of uh, an external inguinal hernia, it's going to be external oblique, the answer for that, right? For which of these layers is involved in making of in uh, making of direct hernia so that's that in indirect it would be all three of these so then they'll just ask you what is the outer layer so the outer layer would be this or inner layer would be this or the middle layer would be this for that cool so covered by external spermatic phasia uh, usually occurs in older males due to acquired weakness of transverse salus fascia so pathogenesis again so you have peritoneum coming in uh, this is the deep inguinal ring it doesn't take that it takes the external or superficial one though and then it ends up in the groin so that okay so medial to inferior epigastric is direct lateral to the inferior epigastric is indirect okay so that just means when you have this if it was medial to this, uh, you will have indirect, sorry, medial you will have direct. And if it's uh, lateral to it, you have indirect over here. Okay, so that's why you have the indirect uh, or internal inguinal ring over here, which causes indirect. And here it's direct. Okay. Uh, femoral hernia protrudes through below the inguinal ligament so that's the importance over here because these both are above the inguinal ligament and this one is below the inguinal ligament it's uh, so protrudes below inguinal ligament through the femoral canal below and lateral to pubic tubercle this one is more common in females but overall inguinal hernia are the most common ones uh, more likely to present as incarceration or uh, strangulation versus the inguinal hernia. Okay. So instead, intestinal loop beneath the inguinal ligament. Cool. On to physio. Uh, gastrointestinal uh, physiology, gastrointestinal regulatory structure substances. 
we actually looked at a couple of these in the last one, last chapter, but okay, so in the endo, sorry. So gastrin, uh, the source is G cells or antrum uh, of stomach and duodenum, actually. And I think this looks at the other one. This one is better to reference. Okay, so we have guests right now. Okay, so G cells. Uh, G cells are right here. Okay, uh, it's in the antrum of the duodenum, or uh, sorry, antrum of the stomach or duodenum. The action is to increase gastric uh, H ions or hydrogen ion secretion. It increases growth of gastric mucosa and it increases gastric motility. Okay, this is important one because it's involved in the pathogenesis of uh, Zollinger uh, Ellison syndrome. Okay, uh, increase in gastric motility, increase in growth of gastric mucosa, and increase in gastric H secretions. It's regulated by uh, increase, so it's increased by uh, stomach distension, alkalinization, amino acids, peptides, vagal stimulation via gastrin releasing peptides, so GRP right there, that's from vagal stimulation, right? Uh, so GRP, and if there are uh, it's decreased, okay, so it's decreased by um, pH less than 1.5, so acidic. If it's already acidic, it's not gonna make it more acidic. But if it's al alkalized, alkaline, uh, then it's gonna make it more acidic, okay? Now, by stomach distension, that just means uh, when there's food in the stomach, uh, that's when acid gets released, okay? Uh, no, it's increased by chronic PPI use, so proton pump inhibitor. Okay, uh, it's increased by chronic atrophic gastritis, for example, H. pylori, and it's increased in uh, Zollinger Ellison syndrome. That's the one I was talking about. It's also known as gastrinoma. Okay, uh, why is it increased by chronic PPI use? Uh, We'll talk about it in petto, but basically, uh, when you're blocking it, uh, then there's a refractory action happening, and that's why it increases. Okay, because normally you give it give a PPI to reduce the acidity, right? But there is a refractory action happening there because of that too. Okay, uh, somatostatin. That's from D cells right here. Okay. Uh, Pancreatic islet or GI mucosa. Uh, its action is uh, decrease in gastric acid and pepsinogen secretion. Okay, uh, this is the one that uh, breaks down the proteins. Right? So it decreases gastric acid and pepsinogen secretion. It decreases pancreatic and small intestine fluid secretion. Remember, statin, stasis, somatostasis, right? So it stops everything. So it reduces basically everything in here. So it decreases gastric acid it, and pepsinogen secretion. Pepsinogen comes from here. Uh, here, chief cells. Uh, decrease in pancreatic and small intestine fluid secretion. It decreases gallbladder contraction. It decreases insulin and glucagon release. Okay. Uh, it's regulated by increase in acid and decreased by vagal stimulation. So acetylcholine over here. It inhibits D cells. Then you have, uh, so basically if you have uh, vagal stimulating uh, acid cells, right, the one that causes that, so G cells or gastrin cells, uh, while it's doing that, it's also inhibiting D cells, right? So that somatostatin doesn't act on this and stop it. So while Vegas is uh, still doing that, 
it's the only the vagus one that's doing this right uh, there are no other nerves that in, that's inhibiting the t-cells okay so decrease in gallbladder contraction decrease in uh, insulin and glucagon release so it has action on gallbladder pancreas stomach uh, intestine and yeah okay so it's decreased by vagal stimulation it's increased by acid so after you have acid uh, built up in the thing uh, which is less than 1.5 uh, vagus is going to stop in, you know inducing it so then that will act on t-cells and increase in acidity uh, and then you'll get some metastatic to stop it okay uh, in a secretion of various hormones encourages somatostasis of triotride is an analog uh, used to treat acromegaly, carcinoid syndrome, VIPoma, and variceal bleeding. Okay, uh, cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin. Uh, this is from eye cells, so eye cells are down here in the duodenum, right, and duodenum. Okay, uh, action is it increases pancreatic secretion because this is where it's a attachment of water is right uh, ampulla of water so it increases pancreatic secretion increases gallbladder contraction because that's where the bile comes in from through the cystic duct to common hepatic duct to common bowel duct to sorry not common hepatic just common bowel duct to uh, the attachment in the duodenum it decreases gastric emptying so that it doesn't rush through it it takes us time to do its work uh, increase in sphincter of OD relaxation so sphincter OD relaxation we saw that uh, near the side of this thing right here sphincter of OD right there So it increases sphincter of body relaxation so more stuff can come through it. Uh, it's regulated by increase by, uh, it increases by fatty acids and amino acids. It acts on neural muscarinic pathway to cause pancreatic secretion. Okay. So this is the one you need uh, for pancreatic secretion. That's the one it's involved in, right? This and the one that actually says secretin secreting is the one also causing secretion as well so the importance of this is for eye cells it's found in both duodenum and duodenum while this is only found in S cells which are found in duodenum okay uh, it increases pancreatic bicarbonate secretion okay this is the one involved in uh, neutralizing the acidity coming in from the stomach it decreases gastric acid secretion as well and then it increases bile secretion as well. Okay. Uh, it's regulated by, it's regulated. So there's an increase in secretion by acid, fatty acid, and lumen of duodenum. Increase in bicarbonate neutralizes gastric acid in duodenum, allowing pancreatic enzymes to function. So it's an important thing to happen here. Without this, you'll start getting ulcers in duodenum. Without this, yeah, without secretin, not without cholecystokinin, because that was involved in other pancreatic secretions. Okay, uh, then you have GIP or uh, glucose dependent ice insulinotropic peptide, right? So, GIP that's from the K cells right here in the duodenum and jejunum. Uh, its action is exocrine, decrease in gastric. Uh, H secretion and endocrine action is that it increases insulin release okay so that's why it's dependent on glucose when it senses glucose that's when insulin gets released and when you have food you know this won't make sense but exocrine it decreases H secretion and increases this okay uh, it's regulated by uh, fatty acids, increased by fatty acid, amino acid, and oral glucose, 
also called gastric inhibitory peptide so GIP you can think of it that way because it inhibits gastric age secretion uh, until now everything was uh, increasing it okay but this one increases this is an inhibitory so it's going to decrease it uh, this one decreases gastric emptying actually and this one also decreases gastric acid secretion but never mind <laughs> so GIP is gastric inhibitory peptide as well uh, oral glucose load increases insulin compared to IV equivalent due to gastric inhibitory peptide secretion uh, motilin motilin is uh, found in small intestine produces migrating motor complexes uh, or MMC right so it's involved in motility right so it increases in fasting state so motilin receptor agonists for example erythromycin are used to stimulate intestinal peristalsis okay uh, so erythromycin which is a macrolide we give this uh, for constipation uh, to stimulate intestinal peristalsis okay motulin receptor agon and agonists for example erythromycin are used for this so it has dual functions this thing dual mechanism of action one of its action is that it acts on motulin receptors okay and they're found in small intestine uh, important they test you on this knowledge uh, then we have VIP uh, or vasoactive intestinal polypeptide uh, okay so uh, parasympathetic ganglia and sphincters gallbladder and small intestine okay okay it's parasympathetic ganglia and sphincters so you know par what parasympathetic does right it relaxes things so it's going to relax the sphincter it's going to relax the gallbladder it's going to relax the small intestine so if everything is relaxed what's going to happen to things going through it it's going to go straight through right so like a VIP they don't get obstructed anywhere VIP just go keeps going through straight uh, so it increases intestinal water and electrolyte secretion okay increased relaxation of intestinal smooth muscle and sphincters uh, so there will be increased by distension and vagal stimulation but decreased by endogenergic input uh, so what is a VIP OMA uh, you what is uh, actually in like India what is like a appetizer you give to your guests so VIP is a guest so I think of it like okay so you give what up to a VIP okay but uh, you can just think of it like a water right like sounds like water so water uh, okay so VIP OMA non alpha and non beta islets cells pancreatic tumor that secretes VIP so it's associated with watery diarrhea and then you'll have hypokalemia and then you'll have achlorhydria as well okay because you're losing everything because nothing is relaxed uh, nothing is you know blocking it so everything just gets thrown out the system okay so again VIPoma very important you need to know it since it's they'll give you this in the question stem they'll tell you that it's uh, the person suffering from diarrhea it's watery uh, some kind of symptoms of hypokalemia and they'll also tell you that uh, the person is suffering from metabolic acidosis uh, alkalosis okay So nitric oxide, alkalosis or acidosis, should be alkalosis, right? Uh, nitric oxide. So nitric oxide, uh, we know where that's found, right? Uh, and what its action is, the vasodilation. So there's increase in smooth muscle relaxation, including lower esophageal sphincter, okay? Uh, and loss of uh, NO secretion is implicated and in increase uh, lower esophageal structure tone of ecclesia. So ecclesia, what it is, uh, you should know that one. We'll come across it in fat But okay, so 
It's a rare disorder that makes it difficult for food and liquid to pass from the swallowing tube, connecting your mouth and stomach into your stomach. Okay, so basically you have something like this, right? In a normal person, you'll see that. But what happens in ecclesia is there's the the tone, the sphincter muscle tone is lost. So instead of relaxing, uh, it stays constricted. Or did I say that opposite? Yeah, because NO causes what? It uh, relaxes, right? So it relaxes the smooth muscle. But now that there's no NO, this keeps staying constricted. And why do you get this? It's because of the uh, food backup into this. So all the food that you have eat, it gets stuck here. And then that causes dilation and tortuous esophagus. But here, uh, it stays constricted because there is no anode to dilate it. Okay, so if they tell you a person is has difficulty in uh, eating, and then they show you a, they tell you a X-ray is showing, uh, tortuous uh, esophagus and like a uh, hard structure that's not relaxing. Uh, what is the pathogenesis of it? The pathogenesis is that there's loss of anode secretion. Okay, which is why you're getting increased uh, alias tone of ecclesia. Ghrelin, remember gremlin? Uh, its stomach it increases appetite, growling stomach, it wants food. Uh, so it's increased in fasting state and it decreases by food. Uh, increased in predator belly syndrome uh, and decreases after gastric bypass surgery. Uh, we did this in genetics, but just to quickly review what that was. It's, uh, they eat a lot and stuff, right? So yeah. Signs and symptoms, hyperphagia, obesity, intellectual disability, hypogonadism, and hypotonia. Uh, so this thing right here is what's going to cause increase in ghrelin uh, and this one was the one where they laugh right inappropriate laughter in German predator sounds like padre padre is father so there's like a padre, uh, father allele that has or parental allele that is deleted or mutated angel is like a mother <coughs> so this is a maternal one Allele that is deleted or mutated. Uh, Signs and symptoms are seizures, ataxia, severe intellectual disability, and appropriate laughter. So it decreases after gastric bypass surgery, okay? Because, you know, if there's no stomach, then stomach won't have uh, cells that produce ghrelin. Um, then we have gastric acid, intrinsic factor, pepsin, and um, bicarbonate. We don't need that for this. So you have gastric acid, uh, parietal cells, uh, stomach. Right. Uh, action, decrease in stomach pH. Uh, sorry. sorry, okay, so parietal cells right over there. Okay, uh, so what does gastric acid do? It causes acidity, right? Uh, it's regulated by histamine vagal stimulation. So vagus comes here and acts on it. It also comes from uh, ECL cells uh, that releases histamine and does that. And also G cells, right? It comes there, gastric comes and stimulates this to do that. So uh, gastric acid, right? So increased by histamine vagal stimulation, uh, gastrin by 
uh, and it decreases by uh, somatostatin, uh, then GAP as well. Uh, that's the glucose one or gastric inhibitor peptide. And then you have gastric acid inhibitor peptide or uh, prostaglandin secretin. Right? So GAP known as gastric inhibitory peptide. Right? So it's uh, inhibited by one, two, three, and four things. Right? Prostaglandin secretin, GAP, and somatostatin. It's uh, increased or stimulated by gastrin and vagus. Uh, auto, okay, so then we're on to intrinsic factor. You need that for what? B12, okay? So prior to cells again, uh, vitamin B12 binding protein, it's required for B12 uptake in terminal ileum, okay? So they'll tell you that this patient is suffering from uh, B vitamin B12 deficiency uh, because of uh, a gastric bypass or something. So why is this happening? It's because uh, it requires intrinsic factors which are uh, released by parietal cells. Okay. Uh, autoimmune destruction of parietal cells will cause chronic gastritis and uh, pernicious anemia. Why? Because this gastrin is going to keep releasing to stimulate this. So until it has a feedback that, okay, we're here, it's going to keep doing that. So that's how you end up with gastrin. And also pernicious anemia because of this. Okay. Uh, pepsin, chief cells, so chief cells are right there. Pepsinogens is what's required to break down protein. Right. So chief cell in stomach, its action is protein digestion. Uh, its regulation is increased by vagal stimulation, ACH and local acid. Uh, pepsinogen inactive is converted to pepsin, which is the active one in the presence of acid or H ions. And then you have bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is released from mucosal cells in stomach, duodenum, salivary gland, pancreas, and uh, Brunner gland in the duodenum. We just read about that. Okay, it neutralizes acid. Uh, regulation is increased by pancreatic and biliary secretion with secretin. It's trapped in mucus that covers the gastric epithelium, and that's why uh, you don't get ulcers because of acid in the stomach, because of this mucus uh, that traps bicarbonate. But in case uh, there is something that you know causes a decrease in that, or in the mucus or in bicarbonate layer, that's when you start getting. Uh, ulcers and that's what H. pylori does and also chronic use of NSAIDs. Uh, we'll read about that later. Okay, so location of gastrointestinal secretory cells. Uh, you start with G cells, so G cells uh, in the antrum uh, get stimulated by GRP from the vagus and then you have gastrin released from it. The gastrin goes up to the uh, enterochromepin something cells uh, that releases histamine and acts on parietal cells and gastrin also acts directly on the parietal cells right? you have chief cells for pepsinogen uh, in the body parietal cells is in the body as well and then you have mucus cell making mucus in the antrum and then you have D cells making somatostatin uh, inhibited by acetylcholine via acetylcholine from vagus nerve. In the duodenum, you have I cell making cholecytokinin in the I cell. Uh, you have S cell making secretin, and then you have K cells making GIP in the duodenum. Okay. Uh, gastrin increases uh, acid secretion primarily through its effect on enterochromaffin like cells. Okay, we should know. Uh, we should do this actually. 
they tell you it was a cell in one of these layers and then you sh you need to know what cell they're talking about so uh, this is the gastric pit this is the upper glandular layer the deep glandular layer and the mucosa muscularis mucosa over here and the submucosa don't confuse the muscularis mucosa with the muscularis externa okay uh, surface epithelium is up there uh, mucus cells are here parietal cells are the red things they're found in upper glandular layer uh, in the deeper glandular layer you'll see chief cells right, and enterochromaffin like cells and down here <coughs> so deeper glandular layer has chief cells and enterochromaffin like cells okay what do chief cells make pepsinogen and histamine is from ECL okay. then you have parietal making uh, each uh, secreting ACL okay and also uh, intrinsic factors okay and mucus here and surface epithelium over here cool next to the side um, pancreatic secretions isotonic fluid low flow high chloride high flow and high bicarbonate okay so how many pages do we have left Just one, two, and half of them. Okay, two and a half pages. Okay, so let's take a break and come back and then continue with this pancreatic secretions, isotonic fluid, okay, uh, low flow, and then you have high chloride. If it's high flow, then you have high bicarbonate. So it depends on what's there, and that's how pancreas decides what to release. So if it's a low flow, then it's going to release chloride. If it's high flow, then it's going to release bicarbonate. Enzyme role and nodes. Uh, alpha amylase does what? Uh, starch digestion. Uh, secreted in active form. Okay. Uh, you find this in pancreas, also in uh, salivary glands. They release this as well. So you have it in saliva. Uh, lipases this is more specific to pancreas uh, fat digestion okay uh, protease is for protein digestion uh, and also of course the pepsinogens released by what releases it this thing no this one chief cells right. pepsin protein digestion occurs here too and just like uh, pepsinogen is needs uh, as acidic environment to convert into active we have trypsinogen which also requires conversion but instead of uh, H ions or acidic environment it needs enterokinase or enteropeptidase so proteases protein digestion includes trypsin Chimorotrypsin, elastase, and carbopep carboxypeptidase secreted as proenzymes, also called zymogens. Okay. So, protein digested by proteases released from pancreas. Okay. And it also secretes uh, trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, and carboxypeptidase. Uh, then you have trypsinogen converted to active form trypsin activation of other prozymes after and cleaving of additional trypsinogen molecules into active trypsin so there's a positive feedback loop and this is why uh, in some kind of disease or lesion if you have trypsinogen leaking out it's going to make trypsin and then that's going to make more trypsinogen and then more thing and then what trypsin is going to do is going to start degrading pancreas itself okay uh, we'll read about that too so converted to active enzyme trypsin activation of other prozymes which leads to activation of other prozymes and cleaving of additional trypsinogen right so trypsin causes increased secretion of trypsinogen as well as other prozymes and these are the prozymes 
molecules into active trypsin. Okay. Uh, converted to trypsin by enterokinase. Uh, converted to trypsin by enterokinase and enteropeptidase. A brush border enzyme on duodenal and duodenal mucosa. So once it reaches the, those areas, that's when trypsinogen converts to trypsin. Right. Otherwise, trypsin would just start attacking everywhere. Dipeptides and tripeptides degraded within intestinal mucosa. Okay, carbohydrate uh, absorption. So, for fructose, it was five. For uh, sugar or glucose, it was SGLT one or sodium glucose channel. Right. Uh, you have any put uh, sodium potassium ATP is pumped over here. Uh, GLUT two over here. And then, yeah, glute 5 and SGLT1 here on the apical membrane. Okay, that's the brush border. So only monosaccharides, glucose, galactose, or fructose are absorbed by enterocytes. Glucose, galactose, and fructose. Glucose and galactose are taken up by SGLT1. Uh, right, so glucose and galactose are taken up by SGLT1 sodium dependent fructose is taken up via facilitated diffusion by glute 5 all are transported to blood by glute 2 uh, okay so in the blood it's glute 2 by brush border it's SGLT1 and glute 5 and they only take in glucose galactose and fructose okay uh, there's D something called D xylose test this is a simple sugar that is passively absorbed in uh, proximal small intestine blood and urine levels decrease with mucosal damage normal in pancreatic insufficiency pancreatic insufficiency right so these allos test a simple sugar that is passively absorbed in proximal small intestine blood and urine levels decrease uh, with mucosal damage so normal in it's normally in pancreatic insufficiency. So what they're saying here is, see this is the intestinal brush border, right? And then you have blood connected over here, right? So when you have a sugar coming in over here, right, you feed them D xylose, right? Which is a simple sugar. So when you have this coming in, if there is a damage here, normally what's going to happen is it's going to get absorbed right uh, from here. So this thing is going to get absorbed through the cells, rush border, and then into the blood, and then it travels through the blood. Okay, so you'll pick it up in the blood. But however, if uh, there is a damaged intestinal brush border, uh, so it there's it can absorb it. So there will be, uh, you know, in the, it, okay, yeah. So then it will, you'll just, it won't get absorbed and then it's just gonna pass down and into the stool, right? Uh, if it does get absorbed, you'll find it in the blood or urine when it gets filtered out by uh, kidneys. Uh, so if there is damage, you won't find it in blood and urine. Right, so there will be lower levels of that with the mucosal damage. However, uh, this is okay, but say there is pancreatic insufficiency, the pancreas doesn't work. This thing doesn't need uh, any of these. It doesn't need starch, fat, or protein digestion enzymes. Right, it can still get absorbed without those things because it's a simple sugar. If it was a complex sugar then it would need starch digestion but it's not complex sugar it's just simple okay so that's what d silos test is done for it's for mucosal damage but it will be normal in pancreatic insufficiency that's the important bit here uh, vitamin and mineral absorption you have salivary r protein and then you have animal protein over here, or B12. Okay, uh, iron fist row. Okay. 
okay uh, vitamins and minerals insufficient uh, deficiency may develop in patients with small bowel disease bowel resection or bariatric uh, surgery for example vitamin b12 deficiency after terminal ileal resection because that's where it gets absorbed okay iron absorbed as uh, fe2 plus in duodenum and folate absorbed in small bowel Let's just draw. Okay, let's just do it here. Then. Okay, so folly. That's F. Uh, it gets absorbed in the small bowel. So anywhere from here to here to helium, right? Anywhere there. Uh, we have iron. Iron gets absorbed where? In the duodenum. So iron's going to get absorbed right here. In that part okay so if it were to think of it like that this is duodenum this is duodenum and this is helium this is helium duodenum and duodenum diagram is not to scale okay. uh, so we have folate right. that goes in here here and here and then we have Fe plus uh, and that goes in the duodenum right. and then we have B12 that goes in the ileum okay And over here, you also have other things that go there, like uh, bile salts and intrinsic factors that's attached to this, right? So all of this gets reabsorbed in the ileum as well. Uh, Fe is over here in the duodenum, and folate occurs throughout the small bowel. And this is important to remember because they test you on this. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Um, B12 comes in with the P protein attached to it. Pepsin cleaves the protein and uh, parietal cells release uh, intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor then gets uh, carried uh, along with um, B12 and the salivary R protein. They go through this uh, over here with the help of pancreatic proteases. B12 gets cleaved of the protein again and then uh, there's room for intrinsic factor to attach to B12 then it travels all the way down to ileum and that's where intrinsic factor attaches to the brush border and takes in the B12 over there cool so it takes in bisols and intrinsic factor as well uh, beer patches these are the lymphoid tissues right the immune and lymph nodes kind of thing over there so uncapsulated lymphoid tissues right there found in lemina propria and submucosa of ileum that's important to remember it's in the mucosa layer of lemina propria and then submucosa of ileum contains specialized microfold or m cells that sample and present antigens to immune cells b cells okay so they check everything out and then if, if there's a problem then they present the antigen to the immune cells so then the b cells stimulated in the germinal centers of pyre cells 
differentiate into immunoglobin A secreting plasma cells, which ultimately resides in the lamina propria. So immunoglobin A receives protective secretory component and is then transported across the epithelium to the gut to deal with intraluminal antigens. Think of IgA, the intragut antibody. So IgA is not for intragut, right? Uh, important thing here, it has specialized microfold M cells. Okay, what, what, what is their function? It samples and presents antigens to the immune cells. Which immune cells? The B cells, where? In germinal centers. Uh, what do they do? They convert into, uh, or class switch into IgA cells, secreting plasma cells, okay? Uh, bile, it's composed of bile salts, bile, sal bile acids conjugated to glycine and taurine making them water soluble. Taurine is a program for, for jailbreaking iPhones. <laughs> if you guys jailbreak, that's where that shows up in your life. Uh, okay, so composed of bile salts, bile salt conjugated to glycine or taurine, making, making them water soluble. Phospholipids, cholesterol, bilirubin, water, and ions. Uh, cholesterol 7 alpha hydroxylase catalyzes rate limiting step. This is the key rate limiting step of bile acid synthesis. The function of bile is okay, over here you need to remember this uh, and what it's made up of. Okay, so it's composed of bile salts, uh, phospholipids, cholesterol, bilirubin, water, and ions. And then we gotta know. We probably already know the functions is digestion and absorption of lipids and fat soluble vitamins okay that's the most important one because without this bile uh, we would be deficient of uh, vitamin A D E and K okay uh, bilirubin and cholesterol ex excretion uh, body's primary means of elimination right? and then we have antimicrobial activity via membrane disruption so one way to make more uh, deal with hyperlipidemia was uh, with the we blocked the reabsorption of bile so then you it uses up more cholesterol to make bile and that's how you get rid of cholesterol in your body so that was one of the drugs for that uh, okay so anti my microbial activity via membrane disruption okay then you have decrease in absorption of enteric bile salts at distal ileum okay. as in short bowel syndrome or Crohn's disease so this is quite common because you need this to uh, basically they'll say that this person is uh, ma malnourished or has a vitamin deficiency and they have Crohn's disease right so well what is the cause of this anemia so it's because of B12 usually why because B12 gets what absorbed where in ileum so in Crohn's disease uh, you can have short bowel disease or in Crohn's disease it doesn't uh, there's no absorption in that area that's why prevents fat absorption as well and may cause bile acid diarrhea. Calcium which normally binds oxalate binds to fat instead. Okay, So calcium binds to oxalate but when you have um, malabsorption of fat what happens is oxalate then binds to the fat because that's a greater affinity for that. So sorry uh, not oxalate it binds to calcium. Right? So it binds to calcium instead of oxalate because uh, it has a greater affinity between these two so then free oxalate is absorbed by the gut so there's increased frequency of calcium oxalate kidney stones in the kidney because when oxalate travels through the system and then blood and then filtered out by the kidney it meets calcium in the kidney as well and that's where it forms the stones okay. uh, bilirubin uh, <coughs> Okay, let's read this and then we'll look at the diagram. Uh, heme is metabolized by heme oxygenase. Very important. 
uh, to Billy Worden. So they can ask you that this person has a bruise uh, and it's green. So what was the first step in formation of this color? Uh, and you would probably pick Billy Worden because you remember Billy Worden is the color that caused the green. But it's actually heme oxygenase. That's the first step. Heme oxygenase causes this color. Okay. So heme is metabolized uh, by heme oxygenase to bilirubin green, which is subsequently reduced to bilirubin, uh, which is brown. Unconjugated bilirubin is removed from blood by liver. Conjugated with uh, glucuronate, sorry, glucuronate, and excreted in bile. You have direct bilirubin. This is conjugated with glucuronic acid, and uh, water soluble dissolves in water. And indirect bilirubin, which is unconjugated or water insoluble. Okay. You have RBC, macrophage, heme. Uh, it's unconjugated. What does unconjugated mean? That it's not uh, attached to uh, glucuronic acid, right? So it's unconjugated. It attaches to albumin. And then the albumin uh, carries it to the liver, right? So unconjugated bilirubin and albumin then gets carried to the liver where it's introduced to UDP glucuronyl sile transferase where it con uh, gets conjugated with glucuronic acid. So now you have conjugated uh, bilirubin. The conjugated bilirubin then gets uh, excreted through the hepatic bile duct into the duct into the duodenum and from here the gut bacteria converts the conjugated bilirubin into urobilirubin no joke okay that's important uh, gut bacteria converts the conjugated bilirubin into urobilinogen then the urobilinogen uh, majority of it gets excreted into the feces as tercobilin which is brown color of stool or it gets reabsorbed uh, um, reabsorb 20% of it and then 10% of the 20% will go into the kidney and the 90% of that 20% will go into enterohepatic circulation okay if it goes into the kidney it's excreted into the urine as urobilin which is a yellow color in urine okay uh, important things to know here this one right here this is the one responsible for conjugation of bilirubin so if this doesn't happen uh, you'll have unconjugated bilirubin in your body and this is why in newborns uh, uh, there's lack of this and that's why you get neuronatal jaundice it's because of uh, deficiency of this in newborns eventually they start getting it so what do you do to prevent jaundice uh, you give a uh, uv phototherapy or something uh, anyway, so understand it's why is it unconjugated? When is it unconjugated? When is it conjugated? And all that. Okay, so if it's before the liver, it's going to be unconjugated. If it's after the liver, it's conjugated. Okay. Uh, if it's conjugated bilirubin, that's known as uh, direct bilirubin. And if it's before that, it's called indirect bilirubin. Uh, indirect bilirubin is water insoluble. That's why it has to be carried around with albumin. And direct bilirubin is water soluble. That's why it gets excreted out in the kidney as well. Okay. And we're done for the day. Patho. Oral pathologies. Aphthous ulcers, also called canker sores. Common oral lesions that appear as painful, shallow, round to oval ulcers covered by yellowish exudate. So, nothing like that. Recurrent aphthous stomatitis is associated with celiac disease, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, SLE, Behet's syndrome, and HIV infection. Okay. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Most common malignancy of oral cavity usually affects the tongue. Associated with tobacco, alcohol, uh, HPV-16. Patients are, uh, uh, sorry, presence as non-healing ulcers with irregular margins and raised borders. Leukoplakia, white patch. 
click that and erythroplakia which is a red patch are precursor lesions okay it was hpv uh, 16 and 18 that does uh, malignancies and uh, other strains only cause warts uh, cielo tss so like the salivary right so that's what cia means so cielo lithiasis uh, stone formation in ducts of major salivary glands parotid like that one uh, submandibular or sublingual associated with salivary stasis for example dehydration and trauma presents as recurrent pre or peripredinal pain and swelling in affected gland okay so that was just stone formation because uh, lithiasis means stone and cielo is uh, salivary okay now cia again uh, salivary and then adenitis it has itis in it so that's inflammation right so adena is a gland so salivary gland inflammation inflammation of salivary gland due to obstruction infection for example s aureus mumps virus or immune mediated mechanisms for example sjogren syndrome okay uh, yeah uh, then salivary gland tumors you will have so this is uh okay usually benign and most commonly affect the parotid gland submandibular sublingual and minor salivary gland tumors are more likely to be malignant typically presents as painless mass swelling facial paralysis or pain suggests malignant involvement pleomorphic adenoma benign mixed tumor most common salivary gland tumor right uh, composed of chondromyxedema, myxoid uh, stroma, and epithelium, and recurs, re recurs if incompletely excised or ruptured intraoperatively, may undergo malignant transformation. Okay, so this is uh, the pathogenesis, or, you know, patho of pleomorphic adenoma. Okay, adenoma again, uh, the gland, but uh, pleomorphic means different so uh, it's basically a tumor of that but it's menine it may undergo malignant transformation though and then you have warfin tumor that's papillary cystidinoma lymphomatosum benign cystic tumor with germinal centers may be bilateral or multifocal typically found in people who smoke okay so warfin a tumor they won't uh, give you these names as the answer though this is what they give you so that's what you have to remember papillary cystidinum uh, noma and lymphomatosum so you can remember this from this if you want to and then this you have a mnemonic for that aureus from germany love smoking germany for germinal centers it can be both sides or uh, different sites okay. um, mucoepidermoid carcinoma most common malignant tumor um, mucinous and squamous components majority of time uh, they'll talk about this one squamous cell carcinoma because it's easier to point out they'll give you the uh, keratin pearl and all that stuff for this okay uh, these ulcers it's pretty common right um, when you eat too much outside food you end up with these as well uh, called canker sores how do you differentiate between uh, all of these things so for this uh, it's going to be painful okay so that's how you know it's not a cancer because uh, cancer of any kind is not painful so cancer it is shallow and round and oval okay uh, it's usually going to be on the buccal mucosa or like uh, anterior part of the tongue under it or side of it lateral right 
then for squamous cell carcinoma, they'll give you the keratin pearl and all that stuff. Uh, they might tell, tell, give you that this person is infected with uh, papilloma virus. Okay. Um, this, um, they usually tell you if it's a white patch or not, but usually that's, um, they keep those for the questions that are testing you on or thrush and other stuff like that that we'll talk about okay uh, this one they rarely use that but remember for that this one is going to be painful it's usually going to be around the parotid gland although it could be that it's in salivary glands as well right so parotid submandibular or sublingual but this one is the most common one uh, they their breath is going to be smelling uh, Foul smells coming from mouth, something like that. It's going to be painful. Uh, you'll see some stuff, crystals, or some kind of stone formation around the parotid gland. So that's what this is. Uh, for this one, it's going to be inflammation, right? So inflammation does what? Fever, right? You will have fever for this one. Uh, CRP maybe. Uh, stuff like that. You won't have that over here. No fever for that one. Uh, and gland tumors uh, you got to remember that this is a uh, benign mixed tumor and what that means is that it's composed of chondromyxoid stroma and epithelium right and uh, they could say that it they this person had a previous episode of or like previously he had a tumor and then it was excised but now it's reappearing so this is mostly what that one is it's composed of chondromyxoid stroma and epithelium. Uh, for this one, they'll tell you that this person has a history of smoking for a long time. Uh, there's some kind of growth in the mouth, right? And it's on more than one sites. And then you should know that they're talking about papillary cyst edema, lymphomatosum, or Warthin tumor. Mostly, this is what you will be pointing out. Okay, and mucoid, mucoepidermoid carcinoma is the most common malignant tumor. It's made up of uh, mucinous and squamous components. Okay. Uh, let me just make sure. So what keratin pro looks like is this, like that, right? Don't confuse it with uh, somoma bodies. Okay. So that's a keratin pro. That's a keratin pro. That's a keratin pro. And then you need to know what Samoma body looks like to differentiate it from this. Okay, so that's what a carry, uh, Samoma body looks like. So whenever you see uh, keratin pearl, uh, you know it's a squamous cell carcinoma of whatever place it's found in. Uh, ecclesia we already talked about that one it's basically uh, because there is no NO in this area to dilate it so it stays constricted and then you have all the food impaction just backing up right into this so that dilates the esophagus okay so failure of LES lower esophageal stricture to relax due to degeneration of inhibitory neurons the inhibitory neurons are NO well, ones that are containing NO and VIP, right? Remember what VIP is? It relaxes everything, so everything just goes through like a VIP, not getting obstructed anywhere. Uh, containing uh, uh, sorry, nitric oxide and uh, VIP in the myentric or or back plexus of esophageal wall. That was the 
um, muscularis externa layer of the thing, right? Uh, primary ecclesia is idiopathic. Secondary ecclesia may arise from Chagas disease. Chagas disease is the one where everything gets big. So big esophagus, big heart, big intestine. So mega esophagus, mega colon, and dilated cardiomyopathy, right? Uh, it's T. cruzi uh, infection or extraesophageal malignancies, mass effect or paraneoplastic. Chagas disease can cause aclasia. Presents with progressive dysphagia to solids and liquids versus obstruction, primarily solids. Okay, uh, what that means is See, this is your esophagus, right? Uh, so it's saying that uh, if it's obstruction, so like a tumor growth over here on the side, right? and then food comes in, right? Food comes in, it's gonna get blocked over here, right? It can't go through because it's blocked over here. But what happens if it's water? So liquid, right? If liquid comes, it's gonna, you know, just drain from here and it's just gonna go down from there and then you'll end up with water down here. So, it if it's obstruction, uh, dysphagia is due to solids, but in this case, What's happening is this thing, ecclesia is like, you know, this. So this stricture right here is not dilating. To dilate, you need nitric oxide and VIP, right? So majority of time, we don't talk about VIP. We talk about nitric oxide, okay? So when you don't have that, it's uh, the inhibitory neurons which are NO this stays contracted right so that's why no matter if it's water or uh, food right coming in they all are going to get stuck over here okay, okay uh, moving on so it presents with progressive dysphagia to solids and liquids versus obstruction in primary solids, uh, which is due to that. Associated with increased risk of esophageal cancer. Uh, Menometry uh, findings include uncoordinated or absent peristalsis with increased LES resting pressure. Barium swallow shows dilated esophagus with areas of distal stenosis so bird beak appearance right that looks like a bird uh, the eye over there the little eyebrows the nose over there Wings. There you go. Okay, so Barbie. So what's the treatment for this? Surgery, endoscopic procedures, for example, botulinum toxin in, uh, injection, right? So what does botulinum toxin do? Uh, it cleaves the snare protein on the neurotransmitter vesicles so they don't get released right and this one acts on the which ones it acts on ACH vesicles right? compared to the other one which was plus radium I think right or no titini sorry titini so that one titini was on GABA vesicles and botulinum toxin is on 
the ACH one. Okay. Uh, other esophageal pathologies, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, transient decrease in LES tone, commonly presents as heartburn, regurgitation, and dysphagia. Okay, it's just GERD. So, transient decrease in this. Well, what causes this decrease? It could be, uh, do they have it here? No, uh, it's usually because of obesity or overeating or smoking, all of these, or even uh, pregnancy, right? Because uh, progesterone causes, increase in progesterone causes decrease in LES tone as well. So transient decrease in LES tone uh, commonly presents as heartburn, regurgitation, and dysphagia. My, may also present as chronic cough, hoarseness, laryngopharyngeal reflux, associated with asthma. Complications include erosive esophagitis, strictures, and Barrett esophagus. Okay. So why does this happen? Barrett's esophagus. It's because, uh, remember, it has smooth muscles, uh, which are squamous. Uh, and, right, so these are squamous over here. And the stomach has columnar uh, epithelium, right? So, columnar because it has acid to deal with. Whereas here, it's smooth and squamous because it has food coming in and it slides down because there's no, you know, pressing off it to get it down there. Uh, so it's majority of the work is done by gravity, right? So that's why squam is here. Uh, only at the like uh, bottom two third of the esophagus. And here it's columnar. So when you start having acid going, reflux happening, so acid going back up here, it's gonna touch these uh, squamous cells and they're gonna, you know, erode it or burn it or whatever because it can't deal with acid so eventually what your body is going to do is that it's going to go under uh, metaplasia or yeah metaplasia and uh, the metaplasia causes you know squamous to turn into columnar as well as well as uh, having its own uh, burner glands being made Okay, and the burner gland then secretes bicarbonate as well to neutralize the acid. However, uh, metaplasia can lead to dysplasia, which is a malignancy, right? And that's known as Barrett's esophagus. However, when they're talking about a cancer over here, more, li more likely it's about an adenocarcinoma than it is for about anything else like squamous cell carcinoma or something. Okay, esophageal adenocarcinoma is more common than uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So Barrett's is going to turn into adenoma, adenocarcinoma, sorry. Okay, next, uh, esophagitis. Uh, before we do that, I have this note we can look at. So HIV associated esophagitis, we need to know that too. So uh, Candida albicans, uh, it's patches of adherent three white pseudomembrane on erythematous mucosa. Uh, what are you gonna see on microscope? Uh, under a microscope, you'll see yeast cells with pseudohyphae invading mucosal cells, right? Gray white, pseudomembrane also known as oral thrush right. and then you have herpes simplex wires uh, so these are the buzzwords for that uh, punched out ulcers so small vesicles punched out ulcers uh, microscopic findings are going to be eosinophilic intranuclear inclusion bodies also known as cowdery type A in multinuclear squamous cells at upsar margins uh, eosinophilic intracellular uh, inclusion bodies. 
we looked at these when we were doing micro and then we have our lives with this one right so cmv linear ulceration intranuclear and cytoplasmic inclusions okay also known as allies but if you hear inclusion bodies uh, you know there are like only like five or six inclusion bodies that you need to know for sept so these are the two of them Esophagitis associated with reflux, infection, and immunocompromised, so like HIV, right? So Canada will cause a uh, white pseudomembrane like that or thrush. Uh, HSV1, punched out ulcers, right? Uh, that's not here, but just know what that is. Actually, we should look at what that looks like. They might give you a photo. So it's like that. Or that? Right there. These are punched out ulcers. Okay. It looks like uh, it was hole punched through it. Right? Okay. And then uh, you have CMV with linear ulcers. Do you know what that is? If that's a linear ulcer these are linear ulcers as well there's a linear ulcer too you can tell uh, the difference between the few things right that's that's all that matters this is not a linear ulcer that's oral thrush okay, pseudomembrane so caustic ingestion or pill induced esophagitis for example bisphosphonates tetracycline ansates iron and phos uh, potassium chloride uh, you have is eosinophilic esophagitis as well. This is the fourth one. Uh, this is infiltration, infiltration of uh, eosinophils and esophagus, often in patients with atopy. Okay, so they'll tell you that this person has uh, esophagitis and has a history of asthma, or like, you know, allergic to bees or something, food allergy or something like that. Something that tells you this person suffers from atopy. Okay, if they involve that with esophagitis, it's gonna be this one, eosinophilic esophagitis, okay? So etiology is multifactorial. Food allergen, dysphagia, food infection. Esophageal rings and linear furrows. So this is the buzzword for that. Like, and punched out ulcers, linear ulcers or pseudomembrane, if you see that is uh, in the question stamp, they describe the ulcer as esophageal rings and linear furrows, it's going to be this, the answer. Okay, so esophageal rings and linear furrows often seen on endoscopy. Uh, again, pseudomembrane, candida, punched out ulcers, HSV1. Linear ulcers, CMB, and linear furrows or esophageal rings, it's going to be eosinophilic esophagitis. Okay, uh, esophageal strictures associated with caustic ingestion, acid reflux, and esophagitis. Uh, cool. Uh, I think it's also associated with. Uh, Press syndrome, but I think that would be here. So part of press syndrome, but they do s talk about uh, esophageal strictures and crest as well. Okay, but for this, for now, it's this. So acid reflux is going to make uh, esophageal stricture. Okay, uh, plumber Vincent syndrome, triad of dysphagia, iron deficiency, anemia, and esophageal webs. This is important because. That's basically what the question stands will include. The person suffers from microcytic anemia, right? Or it will have its uh, MCV lower than 80, right? Uh, 
the person has difficulty in eating microcytic anemia and has some kind of you know web coming out of the esophagus so that's what this is so they are suffering from Flummerman syndrome increased risk of esophageal squamous cell carcinoma so that would be the risk if not treated right? may be associated with glossitis uh, then you have Miller Weiss syndrome this is the one where uh, you have lacerations and then you have perforations as or four heave syndrome so first is this and this can turn into this this is basically laceration and then if the laceration get deeper it gets perforated then it's going to turn into a four heave syndrome okay Mallory B syndrome this is partial thickness longitudinal laceration of gastroesophageal junction confined to mucosa and submucosa cool the first two layers due to severe vomiting that's why this happens okay when due to vomiting there's acid in there coming out the acid contacts with mucosa and submucosa and it causes you know longitudinal lacerations there often presents with hematomesis because there's bleeding uh, with or without abdominal or back pain usually found in patients with alcohol use disorder and bulimia nervosa okay so this is important if the person has alcohol history of alcoholism or it's a teen uh, who's worried about her weight she's gonna be you know she pukes right that's what they do um, they purge so it can happen in that or it can happen in alcohol use disorder because why this if they become unconscious they sleep on their side or uh, uh, they puke out again acid in the throat or cause laceration it, this one is really important concept so know this syndrome uh, it used to no, sorry esophageal versus this happens in cirrhosis or uh, liver congestion right because of the anastomosis between uh, left gastric vein and a zygous vein right so dilated uh, submucosal veins red arrow in B like that this besides the white that's what the throat should look like so now we have this low bump right here right coming out of this lateral wall so that's the esophageal versus it's dilated submucosal vein red arrow in B in lower one-third of esophagus second to portal hypertension okay uh, common in patients with cirrhosis may be source of life-threatening hematomesis because if this perforates then you will have blood coming out and then you'll be puking the blood out distal esophageal spasm uh, you should know what this looks like in a scan as well because you might get confused with ecclesia okay it looks like a corkscrew okay that's what it looks like this is different than ecclesia so don't confuse the two uh, we'll look at ecclesia as well This one's hard to guess, but this is also diffuse esophageal spasm. They won't give you something that's complicated. It'll be easy to figure out as long as you know what to look out for. Uh, so this is ecclesia. Right? This is a sigmoid-shaped ecclesia right here. Or this even you have food in there but it's not going through so uh, when they describe the history it's going to be different right because in that one you couldn't uh, liquid can't pass or solid food can't pass right 
uh, in distal esophageal spasm, formerly called diffuse esophageal spasm, spontaneous non parallel, non peristaltic, uncoordinated contractions of the esophagus with uh, yeah, normal alveus pressure. Presents with dysphagia and angina, angina like chest pain. Barrow, barium swallow may reveal corkscrew esophagus. This is an important one. Okay. Uh, manometry is diagnostic. Treatment includes nitrates and uh, calcium channel blockers. Okay. This to dilate it, uh, dilate the esophagus. This to prevent the contraction or spasms. Okay. I think in this one, uh, liquid is allowed to go through. And that's part of the thing. Uh, and in the other one, liquid nor food can go through. Okay. But uh, patho is different for both of them. This one is because uh, there's an uncoordinated contraction of the esophagus. It has nothing to do with the LES pressure. Whereas in the other one, it was all about LES pressure and it had normal peristaltic movement. Otherwise, corkscrew is the buzzword for this. Uh, scleroderma, esophageal uh, involvement, crest syndrome, again, what is crest? C was for calcinosis, R was for Raynaud phenomenon, E was for esophageal dysmotility, S was for sclerodactyly, and T was for telangiectasia. Right? So dysmotility, that's because of esophageal smooth muscle atrophy. Uh, it leads to decrease in LES pressure and distal esophageal dysmotility, which leads to acid reflux and dysphagia. Uh, it causes stricture, Barrett's esophagus, and aspiration. Okay. Uh, it's part of Crest syndrome. It's really hard to point out that this is a Crest syndrome in a question stem because you forget that all of these things are all called press, right? So it's scleroderma. However, you have to pay attention to all, like, they'll give you three or four out of uh, the five things. Telangiectasia, sclerodactyly, Reynolds, or calcinosis, right? It, it, the way they describe calcinosis, I think that's where you lose it, uh, the point, but if they have difficulty in eating, you should, you know, think of all of these and then go from there. Uh, esophageal perforation. So most commonly iatrogenic following esophageal instrumentation. So when you have like instruments going down your throat, usually that's the most common reason you would have perforation. But beside procedures, uh, the causes include spontaneous rupture foreign body impact uh, ingestion trauma or malignancy may present with pneumomedia stenum romc okay so these perforations right here the bubbles, the bubbles and this thing right so this thing is traveling down to this and it's going through that layer However, this is the esophagus, right? So you see this gap of air that's perforated esophagus. So basically know where esophagus is on a scan and then you can go on from there. Okay, spontaneous emphysema may be down due to uh, dissecting air. Signs include crepitus in the neck region of the chest wall. This is usually what the give you in the question stem they will say there's crepitus hurt uh, uh, in like the second intercostal space or like near uh, infraclavicular or in in the lateral border of the sternum or something like that or the neck region as well right so if they tell you there's crepitus there it's going to be majority of time uh, it's going to be this because crepitus hurt around the lung area that's where it would be pneumothorax or something like that but on this side if it's near the neck it's going to be about esophageal perforation they usually also give you like heart symptoms like uh, even though heart is normal you do hear like you know distant pulses or 
uh, cardiac tamponade or something like that. I think it's because uh, this perforation is going around the layer and then it's bleeding into the uh, thorax. So you have hemothorax because of that. So you'll hear signs of hemothorax. Okay, uh, uh, Borheim syndrome. This is the transmural, like all the way through the esophagus, all th uh, all three or four layers of it. Uh, usually, distal esophageal rupture due to violent retching, so burping, right? So when they burp really hard, it can cause a rupture, and that's called Borheim syndrome. Um, Barrett's esophagus. This is specialized intestinal no, uh, metaplasia, arrow in A. So that right there. It's replacement of non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, right? Already told you about the squamous epithelium. So it's non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium with intestinal epithelium, which is non ciliated columnar with goblet cells, right? So goblet cells, non columnar. I said uh, burner's gland, but it's not burner, it's actually mucus that they make to protect the area. That was my lab. So arrows in B, right, so whenever you see that, that's goblet cells, okay. In the cell esophagus, due to chronic is uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD, associated with increased risk of esophageal adenocarcinoma, see. So remember, it's going to be adenocarcinoma in esophagus. That's the most common one because from GERD, that's what happens. Okay, uh, so what's the difference between squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma? We'll talk about that. Esophageal cancer typically presents with progressive dysphagia, first solid, then liquids. Okay, so. Uh, the diagram I made, right? So if this is the esophagus and then there's a growth over here. First, it's gonna be just dysphagia due to solid food because liquid can pass by. But eventually this is gonna grow, the cancer is gonna grow and then it's gonna block everything. Solid and then liquid as well, right? So typically presents with this uh, progressive dysphagia, first solids, then liquids and weight loss because they're not eating as much anyways and also cancer causes weight loss right uh, aggressive cause course due to lack of serosa and esophageal wall allowing rapid extension poor prognosis due to advanced disease at presentation so poor prognosis due to advanced disease at presentation Aggressive course due to lack of cirrhosis. Yeah, so there are only three layers in the esophagus mucosa, submucosa, and muscularis. No cirrhosis. Okay, uh, it's uh, because of that there's a rapid extension. Okay, uh, by the time people uh, actually go to the hospital and get it checked out for dysphagia, it's too late. The malignancy has advanced too far. Okay. Uh, cancer part of esophagus affected risk factors and prevalence so squamous cell carcinoma that's upper two-third of the esophagus okay so if this was esophagus being attached to the stomach right so oops this would be like the lower one-third right and then this would be like the upper two third. Something like that. From there to here. So that's one, that's two, and that's three. Right, so this part is going to be where adenocarcinoma happens. And these two parts are where the squamous cell carcinoma happens. Okay, so upper two third. It's usually because of alcohol, hot liquids, caustic stricture, smoking, or ecclesia. Uh, prevalence is it's more common worldwide uh, and the adenocarcinoma which is due to Barrett's uh, and Barrett's is due to like eating and you know obesity smoking 
and all that stuff. So it happens in lower one third. Chronic GERD, right? Overeating can cause this as well. Um, pregnancy, but pregnancy is not going to be chronic. Uh, tobacco will do it. So Barrett's esophagus, that happens because of tobacco or any of these causes. Again, uh, obesity and tobacco smoking. It's more common in America, this one. So you gotta pay attention to that too. If the patient is an immigrant or he's from America or she's from America. Okay. Gastritis, acute gastritis erosions can be caused by acids and decrease in prostaglandin E2 uh, this causes decrease in gastric mucosa protection. Right. Uh, what is the function of this? You need to know about that to understand this. So prostaglandin E2, also known as dinoprostone, is a naturally occurring prostaglandin with oxytocin uh, properties that is used as medication. It helps dilate the opening of uterus in pregnant women. That's what we know this one for. Okay. Uh, but in stomach, it also causes uh, secretion of mucus. Uh, and mucus protects the lining of the stomach from the acid that is in the stomach. Okay. So when you take NSAIDs for a long time, uh, it's going to affect the mucus production in the stomach. So decrease in gastric mucosa protection because of that okay you can have burns uh, curling ulcer ulcers uh, hypovolemia will cause mucosal ischemia as well or you can have brain injury this is the cushion ulcer sorry uh, increase in vagal stimulation increase increase in vagal stimulation will cause increase in acetylcholine which obviously will produce more leach productions. Okay. Especially common among patients with uh, alcohol use disorder and those taking daily NSAIDs, uh, for example, for rheumatoid arthritis. So burned by the curling iron and always questions the brain. So burned, this is called a curling ulcer or brain, it's called a cushion ulcer. If it's brain, it's gonna uh, affect through the vagus nerve and if it's the other one then it's just gonna you know, cause a shame because of that we have chronic gastritis okay so one of them was NSAIDs right uh, you can have acute gastritis because of NSAIDs but chronic gastritis can affect can happen because of H. pylori or it can be autoimmune so mucosal inflammation often leading to atrophy so hypochlorhydria will lead to hypergastrinema right uh, let me go back to this chart Okay, so basically what it's saying is hypochlorhydria. So if this is not uh, releasing HCl, uh, the G cells are going to keep releasing gastrin, gastrin, right, to stimulate parietal cells to make more of this, or even via this, you know, passively. So that's why you get hypergastrinema. That's just more gastrin. Increased levels of gastrin, right? And interest intestinal metaplasia so there's increase in gastric cancer okay uh, yeah that's basically it H pylori most common it increases risk of peptic ulcer disease or mouth lymphoma affects antrum first and spreads to the body of stomach so it affects here first and then it just goes through and it affects this area as well or this. So, uh, 
uh, autoimmune autoantibodies on T cell induced to the H uh, hydrogen potassium ATPase pump on parietal cells and to intrinsic factors so it increases risk of pernicious anemia because you need intrinsic factor to absorb vitamin B12 from the ileum right so if you have antibodies against this on the parietal cells that means the parietal cells are now not going to have you know not going to attach to gastrin or histamine and get stimulated by that because it's busy fighting off or busy with autoantibodies right it affects body and fundus of the stomach that's where it is right body and fundus that's where you find parietal cells uh, Meniere's disease uh, it's the hypoplasia of gastric mucosa and this one they give you the extra for this one so let's look at what that looks like oh okay why is it showing me directions okay so that's what it looks like it looks like brain in the stomach right uh, that's trying to look for a good picture that they might use so I guess this is basically the best one I can come across there okay so you would have that and this to figure out what it looks like okay uh, so hyperplasia of gastric mucosa hypertrophy uh, rugae or baby like green guy right? right causes excess mucus production with resultant protein loss and parietal cell atrophy with decrease in acid production it's precancerous it presents with weight loss anorexia vomiting epigastric pain edema and due to protein loss pronounced wave uh, that's okay you don't have to memorize it just you know if you look at that it's Meniere's what's Meniere's uh, it's the hypertrophied uh, reggae why because there's hyperplasia of gastric mucosa what does it do it causes excess mucose production with the resultant protein loss and parietal cell atrophy with decrease in acid production so it's precancerous uh, so wherever you see cancer you're going to have weight loss anorexia right uh, vomiting you can think of epigastric pain probably and edema due to the protein loss right? so decrease in oncotic pressure so it doesn't pull anywhere any it doesn't pull liquid into the vessel right that's why Uh, onto the gastric cancer uh, this one is really easy to find out out of all the cancers in this book because these ones have what's called signet singlet ring or signet ring yeah that's right. so it's these things that look like a ring okay so if you know uh, it's a stomach sample, they probably uh, give you that. Then you just look for these ring-like ones. Uh, that's not a good photo. Okay. Uh, that's a ring right there. Okay. So it looks like a ring with a stone on it. That's what I mean by ring. Okay. Let's see if there's a labeled one. that's a good one so all of these ones that's basically what it looks like so that's a signet that's a signet ring that's a signet ring that's a signet ring that's a signet ring that that you know 
So you, it looks like rings with a stone, right? I sh don't need to show you a ring. Like a flat stone. Right? So that's what it looks like. <laughs> I know you guys know what it looks like, but I want to look at rings. Okay. Uh, gastric carcinoma. So signet rings. Most commonly, uh, gastric adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, GI stromal tumor, carcinoid, pretty rare. Uh, this one you find in the colon and lungs, right? If it's in the lungs, you have wheezing. Early, aggressive, uh, and by the time you figure out it's in the colon, it's gonna be too late, why? Cause uh, the liver basically breaks down the serotonin or whatever uh, histamines and all that stuff that this thing uh, secretes so if you start picking it up in the system you know uh, it's too late because now even the liver can't handle the you know met metabolism of its stuff okay so by the time you figure out it's carcinogenic cancer you're going to be in advanced malignancy stage Early aggressive local spread with node and liver metastasis. Often presents late with weight loss, early state teeth. If you have weight loss, you know it's cancer. And if you see this, then you know it's gastric cancer. Or if they give you gastric, uh, it's a stomach slide, and they give you weight loss, uh, you know you have to look out for the signet rings. Okay, so weight loss, early state teeth abdominal pain, obstruction, and in some cases, acanthosis, nigricans, or lecithrilite sign, okay? Uh, this is important too. Uh, they usually give you uh, this as well, that the workout nodule or workout node. So that's the involvement of left supraventricular node by metastasis from stomach, okay? Uh, what is lecithrilite sign? It's basically overnight or like you know really fast within like a few days the person will start developing these kind of uh, rash uh, well not rash but pigmentation or moles of this kind right so like on Monday uh, their back is like really clear and then by the time it's Thursday they take out their shirt and they look in the mirror and they get scared because they see all these pigmentation but if it's that fast uh, it looks like melanoma, but it's not. Uh, it's actually less a trillet sign, and it's because of it only happens because of gastric cancer. Okay, uh, acanthoco acanthosis nigricans. Uh, that's not really a specific sign because that can happen in a lot of things, including diabetes or fungal growth or something like that. Okay, uh, intestinal associated intestinal. So it's associated. Uh, gastric cancer is associated with H. pylori, dietary nitrosamine. This is smoked food common in East Indian uh, countries. Okay, so that's an important one. Tobacco smoking, achlorhydria, chronic gastritis. Commonly on lesser curvature, looks like ulcer with raised margins. Diffuse, not associated with H. pylori. Most cases due to E. cadrin mutation. Uh, gotta remember that one. And then you have signet rings, mucin filled cells with peripheral nuclei. So that's what signet rings are. They're just, you know, mucus in the cell. So it pushes out the nucleus from the cell into the periphery. So it looks like a stone on a ring. Uh, stomach wall grossly thickened and leathery. So linitis plastical that's what it is uh, you have workout node involvement of left supraclavicular node by metastasis from stomach Krokenberg tumor metastasis to ovaries typically bilateral abundant mucin secreting signet ring cells sister misophorous uh, nodules these are subcutaneous paraumbilical metastasis and then you have lumbar bloomer shell palpable mass on digital rectal exam suggesting metastasis to 
recto uterine pouch or pouch of Douglas. So all of these signs they could give you uh, for this, uh, including the lesser trillip sign. Okay, again, what is Krukenberg tumor? This is an important one. It's metastasis to ovaries. Okay, typically bilateral. We'll read about this in repro as well. It's abundant mucin secreting signet ring cells. So if you see signet ring cell uh, and there's like uh, lower abdominal on the left right side pain and then also on epigastric pain or like you know weight loss or something you know it's that and then since it's two things it's going to be Krukenberg tumor. Uh, Sister Mary Joseph nodule it's subcutaneous periumbilical metastasis I just think of you know uh, probably not appropriate but a sister or Mary Joseph who wears a crop top so you can see the umbilicus but so subcutaneous periumbilical metastasis is how I remember for this one. Uh, workout nodule, we already went over it twice. Uh, it was in some other chapter as well. Probably immune, I think, or the one that involved lymph nodes. Uh, so involvement of left supraclavicular node by metastasis from the stomach, right? And then bloomer shell, palpable mass on digital. I haven't come up, came across this, but yeah. Rector uterine pouch or pouch uh, we'll do this after the break. Ulcer disease. Uh, for peptic ulcer disease, there's gastric ulcer and duodenal ulcers. Okay. Uh, so let's just make a little stomach. And do to me. Okay. Um, so pain can be greater with meals. Uh, leads to weight loss. Okay. Why? Because say you have an ulcer over here, right, uh, in this area. The way I, this is how I remember it, this is not what it is, okay. And you have acid that's this, at this level, okay. So acid's not reached at this level yet. And so you put in food, uh, let's make it green, right. So you put in food, then what's going to happen to the acid? It's going to rise, right. And now the acid is going to affect the ulcer. So that's why it can be greater with meals. Um, and since eating food hurts you, you don't eat it. So you lose weight because of that. Okay. So each pylori infection is uh, approximately 70% of the time. Other causes are NSAIDs. Okay. The mechanism is that there's decrease in mucosal protection against gastric acid. Uh, risk of carcinoma there's in there's an increased risk of carcinoma biopsy margins to rule out malignancy okay so that's how you rule it out uh, duodenal ulcers uh, this is also these are ulcers in the uh, duodenum right so it decreases with meals so there's weight gain okay why because now so you have the food coming in and this ulcer is down here right so normally um, without food there is no burners or like you know alkalinization of this area so the acid is going to come in and hurt this area but when you have food there are mechanisms that involve uh, you know secretion of alkaline stuff or bicarbonate and stuff so that's going to neutralize the acid coming in so it's not gonna hurt that much at over here so that's why uh, it decreases with meal okay and since it decreases with meals you're going to increase the amount of frequency you have meals which will lead to weight gain h pylori infection uh again 90 percent of the time this is higher why because remember h pylori happens in this area so chances are the ulcers are going to lead ulcers are going to be here as well like higher chances of having it here than over here right because here majority of the time it's because of this even though it says h pylori but you also got to remember that h pylori can cause it at over here and here so you got to differentiate and there are other techniques to do that uh, they'll give you that 
there's a peptic ulcer in the stomach or peptic ulcer in the duodenum and then they ask you why why is this so even though h pylori is majority of the time uh other causes uh zollinger ellison syndrome okay i don't know if we went over that one yet so it's the rare di digestive disorder that results in too much gastric acid right so it's like a tumor of the G cells. Right? Okay, so recognize in which one or more tumors form in your pancreas or the upper part of the small intestine. So not the G cells, then, is it? Because that would be gastrinoma. So it's a condition that occurs with one or more tumors in NIH external link called gastrinoma. Okay, so I guess so we'll read about it somewhere here. But yeah, just remember, Zollinger Ellison causes increase in acidic, uh, as acidic environment, and that goes down here, right? Acidic environment goes down here, and then the you know the things that cause neutralization of this acid, uh, it can't keep up with the amount of acid coming in. Okay, and that's how you end up with ulcers there. So again, decrease mucosal protection or increase in gastric acid secretion. Uh, risk of carcinoma, generally it's benign, not routinely biopsied because it's hard. Okay, ulcer complications, uh, hemorrhage, right? Ulcer can get perforated or it can go into blood supply or something. So hemorrhage in gastric and duodenal posterior more than the anterior okay why we'll look at that too So in duodenum posterior more than the anterior one, right? Like you can see the even the anterior one is coming from the back, right? Over here. The supply. It's not going over it and then coming in. Right? It's coming from the back. So that's why the posterior one bleeds and not the anterior one, because anterior one doesn't have the blood supply anyways. Uh, as rich as it does on the posterior side that's why so gastric and duodenal posterior more than anterior most common complication ruptured gastric ulcer on the lesser curvature of the stomach over here uh, this will lead to bleeding from the left gastric artery okay so that's the left gastric artery right there uh, an ulcer on the posterior wall of the duodenum leads to bleeding from the gastroduodenal artery. So these are the this one right here. So that's the gastroduodenal artery that turns into the anterior superior pancreatic duodenal, and it gives off a branch to the posterior superior pancreatic duodenal artery. So okay, so gastroduodenal on the posterior side. Because it's not, there's a rich blood supply on the back than in the front. Important to remember that they test you on that. Okay, uh, obstruction, pyloric channel, and duodenal. So obstruction could occur over there because of the ulcer or uh, duodenal. So the pyloric channel remember it's the valve between duodenum and so if this is the start of duodenum and this is the stomach then it's going to be right there that's where the pyloric channel is okay and obstruction can also happen at the duodenum channel perforation 
uh, duodenal, anterior more than posterior. Why? Because anterior duodenal ulcers can pro perforate into the anterior abdominal cavity, potentially leading to pneumoperitoneum. Okay, it's basically because the back is supported. So if something pushes there, uh, there is resistance, but there's not as much resistance anteriorly. That's why there's chances of perforation anteriorly than posterior. Okay. Uh, anterior duodenal ulcers can perforate into the abdominal, uh, anterior abdominal cavity, potentially leading to pneumoperitoneum, so air in the peritoneum may see free air under diaphragm and that's what it looks like they give you this uh, so you need to know about this okay may see air and free air under the diaphragm uh, pneumoperitoneum uh, with referred pain to the shoulder via the irritation of phrenic nerve remember phrenic nerve supplied the diaphragm right now uh, Okay, which is why when you have gas buildup in the stomach, it presses up against the inferior border of the heart. So it can be mistaken as heart uh, cardiac arrest or something, but it's just gas. Uh, okay, uh, another thing about this, they tell you that uh, there is no perforation in the intestine, but uh, there is air under the diaphragm. So how did it get there? This person is suffering from uh, stones, gallbladder stones of some kind, okay? And it's, so when uh, bile gets reabsorbed into the, into the ileum, uh, it comes back up and then it goes into the thing, right? So somewhere along that pathway, there was perforation there instead of the intestine, uh, from in the duodenum or anywhere but there's a perforation there because of the stone and the air is leaking out of that path okay so that would be the reason you have air when duodenum is intact it could be because of gallstones impacted somewhere along the intestine or most more more than likely it's going to be at the end of the ileum at the uh, where the colon starts and ileum uh, ends there's a valve there for sickle valve or something like that uh, also you have appendix nearby there as well so okay just heads up for that one acute gastrointestinal bleeding uh, upper GI bleeding originates proximal to the ligament of trysts which is a suspensory ligament of duodenum. So this is basically, let's look at that. So do you know what that is? Because it's a landmark. Okay, so you had duodenum like that. And there's a suspensory ligament like this. Okay. So that's the ligament of trits. So, how do you differentiate between upper and lower GI? Because you need to know where the bleeding is coming from, right? So, if it's originating proximal to this suspensory ligament, uh, it's called upper GI bleeding, okay? So, uh, usually presents with hematemesis and or melena, associated with peptic ulcer disease and variceal hemorrhage. So it's associated with peptic ulcer disease or variceal hemorrhage. Uh, lower GI bleeding it originates distal to the ligament of trysts. Usually presents with hematochesia, that's blood in stool, associated with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, diverticulosis, angiodysplasia, hemorrhoids, anal fissure, and cancer. So you just need to know what about this basically and then also that it's at duodenal duodenal flexure and superior mesenteric artery bypasses beyond like proximal to it. Okay. Uh, it attaches next to the esophagus, right crust of the diaphragm. 
and city active trunk is right there. Looks cool. A malabsorption syndrome. It can cause diarrhea, steatorrhea, weight loss, weakness, vitamin and mineral deficiency, screen for fecal fat, for example, student fat, uh, stain, sorry, student stain or Sudan stains. It's like a tongue twister for me. Sudan stain. Okay. So there's, uh, there are three, right? So there's one that's celiac disease. One that's about lactose intolerance, and the third one is Whipple's disease that you need to know about. Uh, this one is fairly easy to figure out, uh, but you can confuse it. I guess this one as well, but it gets confusing between lactose and celiac in a question stem because they have similar symptoms. So let's see what uh, celiac disease is about. It's also called gluten sensitivity, uh, sensitive enteropathy. Celiac sprue is there, or sprue, spur, sprue. Autoimmune mediated intolerance of gladin. Okay, that's gluten protein found in wheat, barley, or rye. It's associated with HLA DQ2 and HLA DQ8. So we remember that with Dairy Queen. So if you see Dairy Queen, it's going to be celiac disease. In Northern European descent, primarily affects distal duodenum and or prognal duodenum okay uh, this is important the location of it so distal duodenum end of duodenum and or start of duodenum okay uh, there's malabsorption and steatorrhea because of that that's bad in stool right and malabsorption is just you know malabsorption uh, treatment is gluten-free diet uh, it's associated with dermatitis herpetiformis. Okay, you gotta know what this is because they'll give you uh, bad in stool and then you won't know if it's celiac or something else. But then if they tell you that there's this uh, hep dermatitis heptiformis, like this, like that. Da, 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 da. That happens in uh, gluten sensitivity. Or gluten allergy so that's gluten allergy is what celiac disease is uh, associated with uh, dermatoform dermatitis hepatiformis decrease in bone density more moderately increase risk of malignancy for example t-cell lymphoma uh, you do d xylose test right it's going to be abnormal because this is what it checks for the uh, brush border damage right and since it is going to be damaged because of this uh, it's going to be abnormal when do you have this normal uh, in which disease and in pancreatic insufficiencies these xylose test will be normal right uh, okay serology positive for IgA anti-tissue transglutaminase Okay, so basically anything it comes uh, in contact with, it's going to be anti that. So before we do this, let's look at this diagram. So you have a healthy villus right here, right? And then the, there's atrophy of the villi. So it looks like that. That's atrophy, all of that, right? Uh, so why does that happen? Gluten comes with gladin. Gladin goes in. It gets uh, tissue tr uh, transglutaminase via that. It goes in, and then you have deaminated gladin after that. And then that gladin is then taken up with the in the APC cells, and then APC cell presents it to T cell, right? Uh, via which one? HLA-DQ2 and 8. It presents it to T cell. Then T cell there is, it uh, sends it to B cell. B cell there is class switching, and then uh, it turns into uh, immunoglobulins against or antibodies against this tissue transglutaminase or TTG. Uh, this diaminated gladin or anti-diaminated gladin, right? And also endosmeal. So that's, I guess, over there. So endomesial. Okay. 
Uh, so it causes villus atrophy over there. So here, D xylose test will be negative. And yeah, his intraepithelial lymphocytes there. Cool. Serology. So it will be positive for immunoglobin A. Remember, A is for the ones uh, immunoglobin in the intestine, right? So anti tissue transglutaminases. Uh, IgA, TTG, remember they're found in where? Usually in the pear patches, right? That's where they get secreted out of, in the M cells. Uh, M cells have the B cells and plasma rich in a carbs there as well. So IgA, TTG, anti endosmeal and anti deaminated gladin or peptide antibodies, histology. So this is what you'll be given in the questions then. Vellus atrophy, crypt hyperplasia, or intraepithelial lymphocytosis okay those are the lymphocytes they will increase because of the uh, inflammation or all the things that are happening there crypt hyperplasia because you know all these things are gonna make it thicker and then villus atrophy we know that because there's anti endosmysial antibodies so it's gonna break it down as well Okay, very important, this whole thing. They'll test you on each aspect of this. So look up a YouTube video if you need to, to you know, understand that. Uh, then you have lactose intolerance. Uh, this is lactase deficiency, okay? So normal appearing will, will I, uh, except when secondary to injury at tip of will I. This happens, for example, because of rotavirus. Uh, viral enteritis, uh, rotavirus or norovirus as well, I think. Osmotic diarrhea with decreased dual uh, pH, right? So it's acidic. Uh, lactase does what? It makes it uh, more alkaline. So without lactase, it's going to be acidic. So colon why? Because colonic bacteria ferments lactose. That's why. Okay. Because uh, normally lactose will break down the lactose, so bacteria can't ferment it. But now that it's not being broken down, it's going to be fermented by bacteria. That's why you you also have flatulence because of that. Okay. And with all the gas buildup, it also you get epigastric pain or bloating and that kind of stuff as well. Lactose uh, hydrogen breath test. Uh, you'll have positive for lactose malabsorption if post lactose breath hydrogen value increases more than 20 ppm compared with baseline. Cool. Straight enough. Pancreatic insufficiency due to chronic pancreatitis, cystic fibrosis, obstructing cancer, causes malabsorption for fat and fat soluble vitamins. That's A, D, E, K, as well as vitamin D12. This is, uh, remember, this is because of you need intrinsic factor and then it gets absorbed in ileum, right? Uh, so it's due to chronic pancreatitis, cystic fibrosis. Why cystic fibrosis? Because of uh, the mucus formation and uh, the pancreatic ducts uh, causes a uh, backup and then stasis and the stasis then leads to insufficiency okay uh, and the stasis can also cause inflammation so you can get chronic pancreatitis from that as well but this is usually for because of uh, increased amounts of triglycerides okay uh, cystic fibrosis obstructing cancer again same similar concept as cystic fibrosis uh, it blocks causes stasis and then insufficiency because of that uh, causes malabsorption of fat and fat soluble vitamins uh, remember this is the one that gives off lipase and lipase causes fat digestion right so fat soluble vitamins are a d e and k so if you don't have fat to take this in uh, you will have deficiencies of these as well as vitamin B12, okay. 
uh, there is decrease in uh, duodenal bicarbonate and pH and fecal elastase. So decrease in duodenal bicarbonate. So what will that do? Increase the, it will decrease the pH. So you'll probably end up with ulcers because of that as well. Uh, and pH and fecal elastase. Okay, so d test is normal. So they might give you this in the question set that there's fecal elastase positive. So you should think of pancreatic insufficiency, but majority of the time they'll give you symptoms of these deficiencies. Like here, it would be, you know, uh, the clotting factors are not working. Uh, this is with like CNS symptoms, but uh, no megaloblastic anemia or no uh, PMNs, right? Hypersegmented PMNs. Uh, with D, it's uh, what was the other D? It's probably uh, you have calcium, uh, low serum calcium or something like that, I guess. Um, with the A, you'll have dry skin and all that retinol stuff. Right, scaly skin, uh, dry eyes, bite touch spot, stuff like that. Okay, and B tell it's megaloblastic anemia with CNS symptoms. Uh, usually happens after three years, so they probably won't give you that because it's that is basically giving it away. Right, so. Uh, tropical sprue, uh, that's similar findings at celiac sprue, uh, affects small bowel but responds to antibiotics. So if it responds to antibiotics, uh, it's this one. Cause is unknown but seen in residents or, uh, of or recent visitors to tropics. Decrease in mucosal absorption, affecting duodenum and duodenum, but can involve ileum with time. Associated with megaloblastic anemia due to folate deficiency and later B12 deficiency. Cool. Uh, Whipple disease. This is because of trophyrhymal Whipple. You need to know this one. It's important. They'll ask you this in this or in micro questions. It's infection with uh, trophyrhymal Whipple. Intracellular gram positive. Uh, easy to remember, it's past positive foamy macrophages and in intestinal lamina propria. Okay. Why is it easy? It's because of this thing. Uh, so pass the foamy whipped cream in a can. That's a, it's mnemonic. So pass because it's past positive. Foamy because of foamy macrophages in where? Lamina propria, intestine. Yeah, mesentric node. And then can is cardiac symptoms, arthralgias, and neurologic symptoms are common. Diarrhea, steatorrhea occur later in disease course, most common in older males. Okay. So, trophyrima Whipple. Uh, you have inflammatory bowel disease. Also, let's see if this one has They're not labeling it, but they'll show you an intestinal one, and then you will see that there's. Uh, I don't know what it is. I can't read this. Okay. But yeah, that thing. So you're looking at. Is it this? Okay, so 
show the pink stuff here. Okay, moving on. Uh, they'll give you this though. They'll give you the past positive, maybe for me macro pages. And they'll say that the person is wearing arrhythmias or joint pain or, you know, has difficulty walking. Or maybe reflexes are different or something like that. Okay. Ataxic gait or something. Anything that tells you that's neurologic. Okay, so can. Past positive, past of it, green, and then can. Okay, inflammatory bowel disease. There's Crohn's disease and then there's ulcerative colitis. Crohn's disease happens only at some places. Ulcerative colitis happens throughout. It's continuous. Okay. Crohn's disease, it's any portion of GI tract, usually the terminal ileum and colon. So if I were to draw the stomach, That's the ileum, that's duodenum, that's the duodenum, and that's the stomach, right? And then this area is the colon. colon. So just pretend the black part is the colon. Uh, okay, so any portion of the GIT tract, usually the terminal ileum, so this area, uh, this area, or this area, right? And this is important because that's what they'll tell you if it's on the left lower quadrant of abdomen, pain in there, then it's going to be Crohn's disease. It's not going to be ulcerative colitis, okay? Uh, and colon. So colon it can happen here. It can happen here, or even here. Uh, there are skip lesions, so rectal sparing. It doesn't uh, go up to the rectum, uh, and it's skip lesions. That means there's space between these lesions, right? So there's space there. There's space here before going into the red circle. Okay. Um, gross morphology is transmural inflammation fistula, cobblestone mucosa. You need to know what that looks like because they might just give you a photo of this. So that's what it looks like. Okay. Uh, see how it looks like a cobblestone street. Right? If you don't know what cobblestone is, it's these things. Right? Uh, okay. So transmural inflammation, fistulas, cobblestone mucosa, creeping fat, uh, bowel, wall thickening there's a string sign on small bowel follow through so that's this thing a little string looking thing over there okay. uh, linear ulcers and fissures okay uh, microscopic morphology is going to be non caseating granulomas that's the one without the central clearing know what non caseating granulomas are because you need to know this so you can differentiate between diabetes uh, sorry tuberculosis and uh, sarcoidosis or any of the non caseating ones okay so this is a non caseating one okay so there's no central clearing between the two okay and that's going to be your sarcoidosis or berylosis uh, Crohn's There was another one with B that I forgot again. Okay. Punia wires. There you go. I think that's the one. Let me just make sure. Does it happen on Punia? 
No, it's not the wood. Why is this color? Oh yeah, leprosy, you need to know about that as well. Uh, that one also causes it. All of these will cause it, but the ones that bury most of those aren't the ones that start with D that I can't remember. And that's the one I always forget. It'll come to me. Bartonella, yes, that's the one. Thanks. <laughs> Bartonella. That's it. So those are the non-case eating granulomas. Uh, lymphoid aggregates. Okay. Uh, complications: malabsorption, malnutrition, colorectal cancer, uh, increased risk of pancreatitis. Okay. Uh, fistula. For example, enterovesical fistula, which can cause recurrent UTI and pneumoturia. Phlegmone uh, abscess. Stricture causing obstruction, perineal disease, perianal disease. Okay, these are okay, uh, but you gotta focus on these, and then you gotta figure out uh, if it's this or this. Okay. Intestinal manifestation is gonna be diarrhea that may or may not be bloody, but if it's bloody diarrhea, it's gonna be the other one for sure. But you can't be sure now, right? Because it could be this too. But if it's sorry, if it's not bloody diarrhea, it's gonna be Crohn's disease. Okay, it can't be this. Uh, extra intestinal manifestation. There's a rash, pyoderma gangrenosum, or erythmoidosum. We looked at this in uh, another disease as well. Right. So that's that. And then we had. Erythma notosum, we looked at that too. Okay, looks like uh, cellulitis, uh, vasculitis kind of thing, cellulitis, right? Okay, uh, eye inflammation, episcleritis, uveitis, oral ulceration, epithis, stomatitis, arthritis, peripheral spondylitis. Uh, in Crohn's, you can get kidney stones, usually calcium oxalate. Why? You already know the mechanism, right? It's because of the fat malabsorption. So the fat now binds with calcium. Calcium binds with fat instead of oxalate. So then oxalate gets reabsorbed into the body, uh, into the bloodstream. And then when it goes into the kidneys to get filtered, uh, it finds calcium there. And then it's going to combine there and cause stones. Uh, you can get gallstones, uh, similar reason, uh, you know, bile is not being uh, reabsorbed anymore, so uh, at some point they're going to run out making more bile, and then you'll have cholesterol buildup in the gallbladder, and then the cholesterol becomes into, uh, stones there. So it may be positive for anti-saccharomyces uh, cerevisia antibodies or ASCA okay so if you have ASCA uh, positive then it's going to be this because on this side you have MPO myeloperoxidase ANCA or P ANCA okay and this is pretty handy because they will give you one of these things and that will give it away so if it's the fancy one which is MPO or P ANCA it's going to be ulcerative colitis if it's just the basic one that's ASCA then it's going to be a basic dude called named Crohn's. Okay. Uh, treatment, glucocorticoids. Okay. Anything that suppresses immunity and all that stuff. Inflammation, immunity, or all that. So, glucocorticoids, azathioprine, antibiotics, for example, ciprofloxacin or metronidazole. Biologics, for example, infliximab or adalimumab. I believe these are the ones that are against uh, transcription factors into looking two, right? I think I'm not too sure about that, but basically they 
suppress the production and conversion of T cells. Right? Uh, then you have disease activity, which is fecal calprotectin used to monitor activity and distinguish from non-inflammatory disease, irritable bowel disease. Okay. Uh, ulcerative colitis location. Uh, so this happens on colitis is colon inflammation, right? So continuous colonic lesions always with rectal involvement, okay? If the rectum is involved, it's going to be ulcerative colitis because Crohn's not about that ass. Uh, gross morphology, mucosal and submucosal inflammation only. Why? Because Crohn's basic, yo. <laughs> Esco. Okay, <laughs> Crohn's morphology. Mucosal and submucosal inflammation only, right? And this one went through and through, okay? So if you have, uh, let's say you have uh, some kind of fluid, a clear fluid coming in, in your stool, uh, where is it coming from? It's coming from the bladder because there was a transmural inflammation. It went through and through and then it also went through the bladder. And now the bladder is leaking into the colon and that's how you have clear fluid there. Or you can have uh, the opposite. You can have fecal matter in the bladder, which is causing uh, cystitis or something like that, or UTI, right? Uh, that's how you get the recurrent UTI by the way, right? Uh, so that's the fistula, right? And that's how you end up with all of that stuff, okay? Uh, on this side, it's only mucosal and submucosal inflammation only. So you have friable mucosa with superficial and or deep ulcerations. Compare normal with diseased. So this is the normal one. And then this is the friable one. It looks like it's fried out, right? And maybe like even pseudocytes kind of thing happening there. Okay. Uh, so you have superficial and or deep ulcerations. Actually, we should look at what this gross looks like too. Okay, so that's what that's basically what it's gonna look like. It's a continuous lesion. It's red throughout the whole thing, right? Red throughout the whole thing. The times you will see this, uh, it's basically gonna be for this or it's gonna be for uh, carcinoma. Okay, so like that that's a carcinoma maybe even for polyps so that's a polyp that's a cancer that's a polyp okay so you can tell the difference right because you can make out that this is polyp this is a different growth this is a growth and here it's just inflammation of colon right right there or right there this is a pretty good picture and right over there or over here this one's not that good actually this one's good so that's ulcerative colitis there's no space where they're skipping the lesion right so there's no skip lesion in Crohn's you have skip, skip lesions but not in this okay so when you put that under a uh, x-ray you're gonna have a lead pipe for x-ray So it looks like a lead pipe, right? You need to know what a lead pipe looks like. That's what a lead pipe is. <laughs> and now uh, we have lead pipe of some. Okay. So that thing right there. Yeah. It looks like a pipe uh, stuck inside of your stomach. Right there, right there. That's not a very good example, but anyways, right? So that thing right there. Cool. Lead pipe on now. 
CT or MRI, I don't know. Okay, so lead pipe appearance on imaging. Now, on a microscopic level, uh, the morphology is going to be crypt abscess or ulcers. Uh, it's going to be bleeding uh, with no granulomas. Here you have non caseating granulomas. Here you have no granulomas. Complications same malabsorption, malnutrition, uh, colorectal cancer, and you have increased risk of pancreatitis. We know what this looks like now. Uh, fulminant colitis, toxic megacolon, right? It looks toxic, so that should be easy to remember. And there could be perforation. Okay, it can happen, but usually it's fistula. Okay, the only time it's going to be perforation is if it's involved in the right lower quadrant, and it's usually because of uh, because of diverticulum or diverticulosis okay uh, the difference is that diverticulosis perforation happens in older adults so like they're going to be 70 or 80 or something like that uh, and if it's a young crowd then it's going to be because of UC okay uh, intestinal manifestation bloody diarrhea usually nocturnal and with pain extra intestinal manifestation uh, again rash eye inflammation oral serration arthritis uh, here it's the primacy primary reason for uh, sclerosing cholangitis for this we need to know what that means so cholangitis is uh, it's a rare disease that attacks the bile duct. Okay. So this is cholangitis, bile ducts, inflammation, sclerosing, it's hardening of the tissue. Primary, uh, not caused by something else. Okay. So fibrosis, this is that, and this is dilated. Cool. We'll read about that. Uh, it'll come. Associated with MPO. Anka and P anka. Uh, that's important to remember. They'll give you that. Uh, treatment is uh, by amino salicylic acid preparation. For example, mesalamine. Okay. Uh, six mercaptopurin and infliximab. Again, antibodies. Okay. So you're reducing the inflammatory cells. Uh, so that's what they're doing. Uh, disease activity fecal cal protein used to monitor activity and distinguish from non inflammatory diseases or irritable bowel disease, right? Cool, very important page. Uh, when you do question, you might want to refer to these so you remember it perfectly and then you want to look at it again. Uh, microscopic colitis this is inflammatory disease of colon. Uh, that causes chronic watery diarrhea most common in older females colonic mucosa appears normal on endoscopy okay so it looks normal but then they have watery diarrhea so history shows lymphocytic infiltrate in lemina propria we know what that looks like with intraepithelial lymphocytosis or thickened subepithelial collagen band okay uh, not that high yield in my opinion uh, irritable bowel syndrome it's recurrent abdominal pain associated with more than two of the following uh, you have either it's either related to the defecation or change in stool frequency or change in the form of stool okay the consistency of the stool so at least two of these gotta be involved if you want to get diagnosed for irritable bowel disease or syndrome uh, IPS. No structural abnormalities, most common in middle aged female. Uh, that's important. Chronic symptoms may be diarrhea predominant, constipation predominant, uh, or mixed. Pathophysiology is multifaceted, may be associated with fibromyalgia and mood disorder, anxiety, depression. First line treatment is 
lifestyle modification and dietary changes okay uh, appendicitis acute inflammation of appendix uh, okay important one here they're gonna tell you that there's a uh, you know lower left lower abdomen oh sorry llq so left lower quadrant pain in the abdomen and then it can be you know either crohn's it could be appendicitis it could be ectopic pregnancy it could be uh, ovarian inflammation uh, right o o inflammation of the ovaries it could be uh, impaction uh, stool impaction at the between the ilium and colon so between all of these things uh, you need to know how to differentiate or different do differentials between them so you can rule them out right and if you come to appendicitis they tell you it's that uh, for this there are two signs that you can do right it's suas and uh, sorry Mac. you look at where it is and there's like other things rosing that's what it's called or illicit suas or obturator or rosing sorry you can do that and then they will ask you which bacteria is the culprit for this right it's going to be fragilis that's the bacteria that's the culprit b fragilis okay so acute inflammation of the appendix yellow and arrow uh, yellow arrows in a can be due to obstruction by ficklith red arrow so that's the ficklith uh, in adults or lymphoid hyperplasia in children proximal obstruction of the appendiceal uh, lumen so there's a closed loop obstruction so it leads to increase in intraluminal pressure uh, which leads to stimulation of the visceral afferent nerves fiber at t8 to t10 okay uh, so this is why uh, this is the reason you would elicit suas because that's what it does so initial diffuse peri umbilical pain uh, inflammation extends to serosa and irritates parietal peritoneum oh yeah also uh, along with the uh, differentials i told you you also gotta do a differential for suas abscess because that also hurts there okay uh, pain localized to right lower quadrant wait did i say left yeah i meant right sorry so right lower quadrant uh, mcbrainy point okay that's one third the distance between from the right anterior superior iliac spine to the umbilicus uh, nausea fever may perforate uh, and may uh, cause uh, peritonitis may elicit suas obturator or rosing that's severe right lower quadrant pain with palpation of the left lower quadrant pain so what does that mean uh, the dude is sleeping like that and let's give him a big tummy, legs, arms, right? So it's on the left side, right? That's where it is. No, sorry, right side. I keep confusing my rights and lefts. Okay, so right side, that's where the pain is, right? Is it pain? Okay, so uh, how do you figure out if uh, how do you do rope sing is basically you make him sleep on the table uh, relax the stomach by crossing the knees and then you press this this way you palpate or press this stomach from here and it's gonna start hurting here and that's how you know it's this that's the rope sing side okay uh, there will be guarding and rebound tenderness on examination what does that mean that means when you're you know doing your physical you're pressing here 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 and when you come here you press it it hurts uh, you press it it's firm okay that's what guarding is and then when you let go it hurts more okay so that's rebound tenderness on examination treatment is you know taking it out appendectomy cool uh, let's do diverticulum after the break Crohn's and ulcerit uh, ulcerative colitis we give uh, 
infliximab, right? And I said it was IL-2, I was wrong. It's TNF-alpha inhibitor, right? Similar action though, um, right? Uh, Anti-TNF-alpha monoclonal antibody, that's what it is. So just a throw back to that. And continuing on to diverticular of the GI tract. Uh, important thing to know about this is this is uh, what the layers are serosa, muscularis, submucosa, and mucosa, right? And uh, you gotta remember uh, which one, which layers are in true and which ones are in false as well. Okay, so diverticulum, what is that? It's a blind pouch like that one, it's protruding from elementary tract that communicates with the lumen of the gut. Most particular esophagus, or stomach, duodenum, colon are acquired and are termed false diverticula. True diverticulum, all gut ball layers out pouch. So that's Meckel's diverticulum. Okay, so in Meckel's, all gut layer, gut walls are, wall layers are involved. And we'll learn about Meckel's here. Okay. Uh, False diverticula or pseudo diverticulum is also only mucosa and submucosa out pouch, right? So this is mucosa and this is the submucosa. Okay, uh, you don't get muscularis layer, so that's important to know. And false one uh, occurs especially where vasorecta perforate muscularis externa. Okay, so if this is the lumen right here, right? The lumen's like that. Um, Vasorectum perforates here, and then that's what causes the leakage of the layer into this. Okay. Important to know: true, all layers, and false is first two layers, and serosa too. So, and diverticulosis. That's many false diverticula of the colon, and that's what that looks like. Let's see a few more pictures of that. So that's what that looks like, right? So in a 3D graph, you'll see black dots like that near that area. Okay, so when you see that, you need to know what it is. As well, so it's many false diverticula of the colon, uh, commonly sigmoid. It's commonly at the sigmoid colon, and that's why uh, you find this in the left lower quadrant. Okay, so that's why you find that in left lower quadrant. Um, Many false diet common in okay, so it's yes, yeah, so commonly in sigma, common in approximately 50% of people more than 60 years of age. Okay, so it's going to be older people caused by intra uh, increase in intraluminal pressure and focal weakness in colonic wall. Okay, uh, they don't eat fiber as much or something like that, so that will also increase intraluminal pressure. And since if there's any point of weakness anywhere in the wall, it will out bulge into a diverticulum. Associated with obesity and diets low in fiber, uh, high in total fat and red meat. Okay. They might describe their diet as well, so you need to know that. Often asymptomatic or associated with weight discomfort. Complications include diverticular bleeding, so that's painless hematochesia, blood and stool, and diverticulitis. Uh, they do tell you that there's blood in stool and then you have to differentiate between diverticulosis and uh, ulcerative colitis okay. Or even this one uh, Crohn's disease because It does occur on the colon as well in that area So usually it's between Crohn's and diverticulosis actually but it could be colitis as well. You'll see. Uh, so in diverticulitis, inflammation of diverticula with wall thickening, red arrow in C. Okay, so the wall is thickened. 
um, classically causing left lower quadrant pain. Again, same area. Like so. Hopefully, I'm not messing up my left and rights when I'm explaining this. <laughs> I'm getting confused as well. Uh, so, fever. Okay. Leukocytosis. Uh, treat with supportive care, uncomplicated, or antibiotic uh, for complicated. Okay. Uh, complication abscess, fistula, colos, vesicle fistula causes uh, pneumometriuria. Obstruction, uh, inflammatory stenosis, and perforation, white arrows. Uh, this leads to peritonitis. Uh, you can have uh, hematochezia, which is red. Okay. Normally, this is what's tested on diverticulosis. Okay. It occurs uh, in the left lower quadrant as well. Okay. Because uh, that's where the sigma colon is. Uh, we have Zenkers diverticulum. Uh, this is the one where it causes foul smell in the breath, foul breath, right? So uh, it's because of these uh, weakness between these two constrictor muscles. Okay. So pharyngo esophageal false diverticulum, esophageal dysmotility causes herniation of mucosal tissue and an area of weakness between the thyropharyngeal and cricopharyngeal parts of the inferior pharyngeal constrictor. Constrictor, so Killian triangle. You need to remember these two muscles and that's what it will be based on. Uh, cricopharyngeus muscle, maybe it's just uh, weakness of cricopharyngeus muscle or maybe it's just weakness in this. Uh, so what's happening through the Killian triangle, uh, this thing comes out. Uh, Zenker's diverticulum. Okay. Presenting symptoms are dysphagia, obstruction, gurgling, aspiration, foul breath, neck mass. Most common in older males. Okay. They might give you this photo, uh, this radiograph, or they might just ask you that there's foul smell, uh, neck mass. Uh, what may be the cause of this? And that is because of weakness in one of these muscles or both of these muscles. Meckel's diverticulum is, uh, this is the true diverticulum, so it involves all three layers of the intestine. Persistence of vitiline omphalomesentric duct may contain ectopic acid secreting gastric mucosa and or pancreatic tissue. Most common congenital anomaly of GI tract can cause hematochezia, melena, which is less common, and right lower quadrant pain. Okay. Uh, it can cause interception as well. Intersusception, uh, volvulus, or obstruction near terminal ilium. We'll learn about these. Okay. But uh, you need to know the pathogenesis of that. Is the persistence of the vitellin duct or omphalomesentric duct. Okay. Uh, and it can secrete acid. So they might give you there's a low growth that's secreting acid, and you should know yeah, that it's Meckel's diverticulum for that too. Okay, so the rules of twos are it's two times as likely in males, two inches long, two feet from ileocecal valve, two percent of the population has it and commonly presents in two years of life. May have two types of epithelia, gastric and pancreatic. Okay. Uh, you diagnose it with uh, 99MTC uh, per technite scan, also called Meckel scan. This is important. Uh, this is all this is used for. It What it does is it uh, looks for the gastric mucosa, okay? Uh, 99M TC per technitate uh, scan, also called Meckel scan. Okay. Uh, her spring disease, uh, nervous plexus, that's like this, uh, enlarged colon, and this. So this is the uh, failure of uh, 
ganglions to our nerve system to migrate into the intestine so that's what it is so what happens is it's not able to function as properly so there's constipation due to that because every all the whole stool system stops right here it gets accumulated here it dilates this area because uh, it's not squeezing through so when you put a finger up here and you know cause dilation all of this will come popping out and that causes the explos explosive or yeah explosive explosion of feces this is called the squirt sign okay so it's the congenital megacolon characterized by lack of ganglion cells enteric nervous plexus so Orbach and Meisner plexus right that's the sub uh, mucosal layer and that's the muscularis layer okay so Orbach and Meisner plexuses in distal segment of colon due to failure of neurocrest cell migration that's the patho of this so you need to know about that it's due to the failure of neurocrest cell migration associated with loss of function mutation in ret okay we know ret where else to have you seen it in men right you saw that there too i think or am i wrong let me make sure RET was also here, uh, meant to A to B, uh, medullary and papillary thyroid carcinoma and free from acetone. Okay. Okay. Uh, associated with loss of function mutation in RET. Um, presents with bilious emesis, abdominal distension, and failure to pass meconium within 48 hours. So it, there's chronic constipation. Normal portion of the colon proximal to the aganglionic segment is dilated. Right. So this is the normal portion. This is the abnormal portion. Okay. Um, resulting in transition zone so that would be right there transition zone risk increases with down syndrome explosive uh, explosion of feces squirt sign that is empty rectum on digital exam diagnosed by absence of ganglion cells on rectal suction biopsy there is increase in acetylcholine esterases in hypertrophied nerve spider fibers in lemina propria okay uh, so that will break down the acetylcholine uh, neurotransmitters treatment uh, is resection you just cut that out so rect mutation and rectum cool. uh, malrotation okay so malrotation you'll see lad bands so you need to know about that so let's go look at that before we read okay so what are lead bands so these are the lead bands right there uh, the cecum is up here, right? Because of mal rotation. Okay. This is normal. This is what it is normally like. And here we have this. So. Okay. And then bends are attached from the sickle area to the liver. like that small intestine cool okay let's read about it 
So now rotation, we have stomach here, uh, small bowel here, and that's the liver over there. Anomaly of mid-gut rotation during fetal development, improper positioning of bowel, small bowel clumped onto the right side. Okay, so that's the right side. And it's all clumped together over there. What's clumped together? The small bowel. Okay, it doesn't involve the colon. Uh, formation of fibrous bands, lat bands. It can lead to valvulus and duodenal obstruction. Okay, so it comes in from the stomach and it goes into the small bowel and then into the small bowel. So the lat bands, uh, since they're passing over the duodenum area of the intestine, it can cause duodenal obstruction there. Okay. Uh, this is valvulus, so we'll read about that there. Uh, interception, we already talked about it. Do I remember the, what was it? Right, the collapsing antennas, that's what it is. Right, I think you got that here. So that's what this is. So it's telescoping. Maybe I should look for that. Instead of antennas. Okay, so that thing right there. So that's what happens to the intestine. So telescoping of proximal bowel segments into the distal segment, most commonly at ileocecal junction, typically seen in infants. Okay. Uh, you have to know where you'll uh, see this, right? So, typically seen in infants, rare in adults. It happens in skid as well, so you gotta remember to grab that one. Uh, usually idiopathic in children, less frequently due to an identifiable lead point. Idiopathic form is associated with recent viral infection, so adenovirus or rotavirus vaccines. So it's contraindicated in that as well. Uh, this is a parapatch hypertrophy may act as a lead point. Okay. Now common lead points are in children, Meckel's diverticulum, small bowel wall hematoma, IgA vasculitis, adults, intraluminal mass or tumor, cause, uh, causes are small bowel obstruction. It causes small bowel obstruction and vascular compromise leads to intermittent abdominal pain, vomiting, bloody current jelly stool. Uh, normally, uh, you see this in sputum, and then that's because of Klebsiella, right? Uh, physical examination, right? So sausage-shaped mass in right abdomen. Uh, patient may draw their legs in uh, two legs to chest to ease the pain okay imaging uh, ultrasound ct may show target sign because it's collapsed into on itself right so from top down it's going that's what it looks like okay important to know where it happens uh, right abdomen right? so right abdomen consists of your Ascending colon. Right. Also, since this is the colon, and then you had duodenum like this, right? It's smaller than the large colon. So what happens actually? So this is the ileum, right? So what happens is this tends to go inwards and once that happens it keeps sliding inside and then going into this and that's how interception happens as well okay uh, that's cool now rotation we talked about first spring we got it uh, this is an important concept uh, you gotta know remember this you gotta remember this Oh, gotta remember that as well. 
is anchored to spouse smell and midline mass or neck mass. Uh, weakness of that crico, what's it called? Cricopharyngeus muscle and thyropharyngeus muscle. So thyro and crico. Cool. Uh, onto valgus. Okay. Uh, twisting a portion of bowel around its mesentery. Okay. It can lead to obstruction and, and infraction. Can occur throughout the GI tract. So it looks like a bean, right? So gotta look out for that bean sign. By bean, we need to know what that bean is. That's what the bean is. Right. So that's what the sign looks like. Okay, this looks like that kind of bean. Uh, so twisting and uh, twisting a portion of the bowel around his mesentery, so like superior mesentery or inferior mesentery, right? Those kind of basic the blood supply gets uh, cut off, so it can lead to obstruction and then infraction. Look at that can occur throughout the GI tract. Gastric valvulus are more common with anatomic abnormalities like paraesophageal hernia and presents with severe abdominal pain, dry heaving, and inability to pass nasogastric tube. Okay. Uh, Midgut valvulus more common in infants and children. Uh, in minors. Okay, so okay. gastric valvulus is more common with anatomic abnormalities, paraesophageal hernia, and presents with severe abdominal pain, dry heaving, and inability to pass the nasal gastric tube. Okay. Uh, Midgut valvulus uh, more common in infants and children or minors. So midgut is more common in minors. And then you have sigmoid valvulus. This is coffee bean sign on x-ray, more common in seniors, older adults. Okay, so, so for seniors, it's sigmoid valvulus, for minors, it's midguts, and then uh, gastric and all the others. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Different pictures for valvulus. Okay, you can't pass the nasogastric tube to it if it's gastric. Uh, more common in children is midgut valvulus and then sigma. Okay. They didn't give you the Backup for this is just twisting a portion of bowel around its smith and tree. Uh, other intestinal disorders acute mesentric ischemia, so critical blockage of intestinal blood flow, often embolic occlusion of uh, superior mesentric artery. So we discussed a question on the group about that myxema, myxoma, right? So there was movable mass on the valve and the person was suffering from abdo pain. It was because the myxoma was broken off and went into the mesentric arteries and then caused a blockage there, causing ischemia, causing the abdo pain. Okay, so critical blockage of intestinal blood flow, often embolic occlusion of superior mesentric artery small bowel necrosis okay so that's this that's what the necrosis would look like it's black <coughs> nothing special abdominal pain out of proportion to physical findings uh, macy red cart jelly stools that's 
because of the blood then you have angiodysplasia tortuous dilation of the vessels So torturous dilation of the vessels, uh, this leads to hematochezia. Most often found in the right-sided colon, more common in older patients, confirmed by angiography, associated with end-stage renal disease, von Willebrand disease, and aortic stenosis. If you see this step letter type of uh, x-ray, uh, it's gonna be this. And your dysplasia. Mm -hmm. I said extra, but they're showing me CT scans. This stuff saying something else. Hmm. Yeah. So I guess these are the vessels then. Okay. Well, they're pretty big, I think. They want to ask you this. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, chronic mesenteric ischemia. Intestinal angina. Atherosclerosis of celiac artery. Uh, superior mesenteric artery. Most commonly affected. Or inferior mesenteric artery. This will lead, in, uh, lead to intestinal hypoperfusion. Uh, Postprednal epigastric pain. Uh, and then you have food aversion and weight loss. Okay. So... Atherosclerosis of celiac artery or this or this any of that you know it's basically goes down to just being blockage of the artery right so oxygen can't reach that area that it supplies to so there's ischemia and because of ischemia you get food aversion and weight loss and you get postprandial epigastric pain colonic ischemia this is crampy abdominal pain followed by hematochezia Commonly occurs at watershed areas. This is splenic flexure and recto sigma junction. Typically affects older adults. Thumbprint sign on imaging due to mucosal edema and hemorrhage. Ileus, that's in intestinal hypomotility without obstruction, which leads to constipation and decrease in flatus. Distended uh, tympanic abdomen with decreased bowel sounds. It's associated with abdominal surgeries, opiates, hypokalemia, and sepsis. No transition zone on imaging. Uh, treatment is bowel rest, electrolyte correction, cholinergic drugs stimulates uh, uh, intestinal motility. Uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, seen in premature formula fed. This is an important one. They test you on this one. Uh, that's what it looks like so why does it happen it's when a preemie is fed uh, formula so seen in premature formula fed infants with immature immune system that's why so necrosis of intestinal mucosa happens most commonly so wherever you see formula fed uh, or this patient wasn't breastfed and they were fed formula or something like that Always go to this and then from there on you can read the whole question and see if you can rule it out. Otherwise it's going to be about this. So, seen in premature formula fed infants with immature immune system. Necrosis of intestinal mucosa, most commonly terminal ileum and proximal colon, which can lead to pneumatosis, 
intestinalis, RMC, like that, and pneumoperitoneum or portal venous gas. Okay. Okay, so it looks like you know it's a classic presentation. You can't you can't mix it up with other stuff because as soon as you look into it, yeah, it's necrotizing enterocolitis, right? Uh, small bowel obstruction that's normal flow of intraluminal contents and uh, sorry normal flow of intraluminal contents is interrupted so this leads to fluid accumulation and intestinal dilation proximal to the blockage and intestinal decompression di distal to the blockage okay so if you're zoned out it's just you know something like this and then there's the blockage and then you have this below the blockage so before the blockage it's or proximal to the blockage is dilated and distal to the blockage it's uh, smaller so normal flow of intraluminal contents is interrupted fluid accumulation and intestinal dilation proximal to the blockage and intestinal decompression, right? So that's decompression, distal to the blockage. Presence with abrupt onset of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension, compromised blood flow due to excessive dilation or strangulation may lead to ischemia. So since this dilates too much, uh, it actually, you know, causes increased resistance in like small vessels around you because of the wall tension itself so that can cause uh, strangulation and may lead to ischemia necrosis or perforation most commonly caused by intraperitoneal adhesions uh, like fibrous bands of scar tissue tumors or hernias in rare cases meconium plug in newborn meconium ileus Upright abdominal x-ray shows air filled levels okay. and measurement is gastrointestinal decompression, volume resuscitation and bowel rest. Cool. Uh, colonic polyps, so now these are like important ones. Okay, so colonic polyp, it's growth of tissue within the colon grossly characterized as flat or sessile or pedunculated right so sessile is this or pedunculated is this and flat will be just you know flat sorry uh, okay so grossly characterized as flat sessile or pedunculated on the basis of protrusion into the colonic lumen generally classified by histologic type so these are the histologic types and these are the characteristics. So generally non-neoplastic, so it doesn't have uh, cancer risk uh, or they're not cancerous, right? So that's what non-neoplastic means. And then these are the cancerous ones uh, that can turn into cancer. Okay, so these ones don't turn into cancer. So hematomas or, yeah, hematomas, uh, hematomas polyps. So these are solitary lesions do, which do not have significant risk of transformation. Growths of normal colonic tissue with disordered, uh, distorted architecture. It's associated with Peutzeger syndrome and juvenile polyposis. We'll do that over here. Uh, important thing about this to know, it has a classic sign as well. Uh, is pigmented lips right so lips when you see it like that uh, you're going to think of Peutzeger and they have hematomas okay hematomas polyps okay so it's associated with Peutzeger syndrome and juvenile polyposis hyperplastic polyps most common generally smaller and predominantly located in rectosigmoid region occasionally evolves into serrated polyps 
and more advanced lesions. Not that important. They don't really test you on this, so let's move on. Inflammatory pseudopolyps due to mucosal erosion in inflammatory bowel disease. Yeah, don't ask you about that either. Mucosal polyps. Okay, they might ask you about this. So mucosal polyps are small, usually less than five millimeters. They look similar to the normal mucosa and class clinically insignificant though. Okay, because uh, they're non-neoplastic. And then you have submucosal polyps may include lipomas, leomyomas, fibromas, and or and other lesions. Cool. Yeah. So the potentially malignant ones are adenomatous polyps. So out of these, uh, this is the main one, and just know that these ones exist. But that's about it. They don't really ask you about these two. So important thing about these is that they are non-neoplastic. Okay, the neoplastic ones or potentially malignant ones are adenomatous polyps and serrated polyps. Okay, uh, this is easy because there are two types, uh, three types, but two of them are pretty easy to remember, and three times just the third one is just a combination of the two. So, adenomatous, adenomatous polyps are neoplastic, okay, so cancerous, via chromosomal instability pathway with mutation in the APC and CRAS. So here I'll give you the mnemonic for that one and then we'll look at it after. So it's AK53. Right, so like the gun. AK53. Okay, so that was that's AK53. It's a I think it's Russian. Never mind, it's Switzerland. It's Swiss, not Russia. Okay. So, uh, neoplastic via chromosomal instability pathway with mutation in APC and CRAS. Okay. Uh, tubular, so B. So, that's what tubular ones look like. And, okay, so. Uh, okay, uh, tubular uh, histology has less malignant uh, potential than villus. So you can remember villus is more villainous. Okay, villus histology is villainous. That makes tubular less malignant potential than villus. And then you had tubulo villainous, which has intermediate malignant potential. So if it was a spectrum, tubular would be on the left side, which is less potential. Uh, malignant potential and then villus would be on the right side and this would be in the middle right uh, usually asymptomatic may present with occult bleeding so a question with this for this uh, they'll just tell you that uh, on on a histo slide uh, they found that uh, that this whatever this polyp is it's very uh, it has a high potential for malignancy uh, what type of uh, endomatous polyp is this? It's the villus type, right? So that's what the question would be. Uh, serrated polyps, uh, neoplastic. It's characterized by CPG island uh, methylator phenotype. We came across this in uh, biochem, right? So CPG island methylator phenotype, CAMP cytosine based uh, base followed by guanine it's linked by a phosphodiesterase bond so that's basically what this looks like cytosine with guanine uh, with a phosphodiesterase bond between them so cpg like that okay defect may silence mismatched repair genes Okay, so the repair genes get silenced and that's why you end up with serrated polyp. For example, MLH1 expression, mutations lead to microsatellite instability and mutations in PRA. Uh, you have sawtooth pattern of CRIPS on biopsy. Up to 20% of the cases are sporadic CRC. <coughs> 
um, they'll give you this and then they'll ask you what kind of defect is it so it's uh, the defect is in this um, silence is mismatched repair gene uh, or it can be this mutation which leads to microcell like instability and mutation and breath right remember breath what the fuck and then you have mlh1 expression or i mean the mismatch gene mlh so m is for mismatch okay uh, it has sawtooth pattern in crypts right so it looks like that that's what they mean by sawtooth pattern uh, let's see if we can see it on close. Okay, so that's what they mean, I guess. So I guess look at this and think of sawtooth. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, these are the ones that usually get tested on. So um, polyposis syndromes. Okay. So you have fat. This is familial adenomatous uh, polyposis. This is autosomal dominant mutation of APC tumor. Okay. So let's bring this over here. Okay, so when you have mutation of APC, so again, that was this thing. AK53, that's what we look at. Okay, so A is for APC, K is for cross mutation, and 53 is for TP53. Okay, so A is the first one, so it goes from normal colon, uh, and if you have mutation of APC or loss of APC gene, you get the colon at risk, the polyps. And then the polyps turn into adenoma if you have cross mutation or the K. And then the adenoma turns into carcinoma uh, if you have uh, loss of tumor suppressor gene. Right? So TP53 or DCC. Okay, so fat happens right here. So it leads to this. Uh, autosomal dominant mutation of APC tumor suppressor gene on chromosome 5Q21 to Q22. Uh, this is a two-hit hypothesis. That means you gotta uh, have the mutation in both the chromosomes, not only one. Okay, uh, so you don't have to. I don't think you have to remember this because I don't. Uh, okay, so thousands of polyps arise starting after puberty. Okay, so right after puberty, you start seeing, you know, increase in proliferation and decrease in intracellular adhesion. Uh, this is pancolonic, always involves the rectum, and prophylactic uh, colectomy, uh, or else 100% progresses to colorectal carcinoma. Okay, that's the colorectal carcinoma. So loss of APC causes fat. Cool. Next. Also, uh, there is adenomatous polyposis in the name. So eventually it's going to lead to this, right? So if it's, uh, you know, going along the line, it can lead to carcinoma as well. Uh, gardener, I just think of a garden in your intestine, right? So that's fat. So this thing plus osseous and soft tissue tumors. So osteomas of skull or mandible, congenital hypertrophy of retinal uh, pigment epithelium and impacted supranumerary teeth okay so you have fat it looks like a garden in your intestine and then you have bone stuff happening so let's look at the x-ray for these okay so you have growth in your teeth like that 
what's this one saying? So super supernumerary teeth, dental abnormalities like that. You have osteoma, so you have you know growth over there on the bone. You have adrenal gland tumors, okay. Polyps in the stomach, the garden in your stomach in the gardeners. So you have garden forming inside of your intestine and on your skull bone and in your teeth, right? So garden of teeth, gar garden gr growth on your skull bone. Okay. So osseous and soft tissue tumors, osteomas of skull are mandible. Um, congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium. Okay. Uh, this is the important one right here. That's the one they'll give you excerpt for and they'll ask you or maybe this one as well they might give you that just in writing any questions there? okay this also happens because of uh, loss of APC G cool uh, on to Turquoise uh, syndrome that's FAP uh, or Lynch syndrome plus the malignant uh, CNS syndrome so for the Turquoise I remember turban right so turban uh, is in the head so CNS tumor so this is the one with the CNS plus fat or Lynch okay uh, so yeah that for example medulloblastoma or glioma so turquoise equals turban cool uh, Peutzeger syndrome autosomal dominant syndrome featuring numerous hematomas polyps throughout GI tract along with hyperpigmented macules on mouth lips hands and genitalia so we already looked at that one more time you see it over on the lips and that's what they will show you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Where was I? Yeah. So normally it's uh, they show you a photo of lips, but it can happen in mouth, inside of the mouth, hands, and genitalia as well. Associated with increased risk of breast and GI cancers, for example, colorectal, stomach, small bowel, and pancreatic. Pancreatic. Okay. Uh, this is an important one. You need to know what this is and what it consists of. It consists of these hematomas, polyps. Okay. And last uh, is juvenile, actually, second last. So, juvenile polyposis syndrome. This is autosomal dominant syndrome in children, typically less than five year old, years old, uh, featuring numerous hematomas, polyps, and the colon, stomach, and small bowel. It's associated with increased risk of CRC. Okay, so this is basically this, but in children, okay? So autosomal dominant syndrome, this was also autosomal dominant, in children, typically less than five year old, featuring numerous hamartoma polyps, okay? So it's basically this, but, you know, juvenile. In the colon stomach and small bowel however you won't have this okay so if they give you hyperpigmented macules it's always going to be this but if they don't give you that and they tell you there are numerous polyps in a child it's going to be juvenile polyposis syndrome or hamartomas polyps which are non-neoplastic or something okay however uh, they do have an increased risk to turn into cancer uh, then you have Lynch syndrome. This is your HNPCC. Uh, this is formerly called, was called uh, hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, or HNPCC. This is autosomal dominant mutation of mis mismatched repair gene. We know that it starts with M, so MLS, uh, sorry, MLH1 or MSH1. Okay, uh, sorry, MSH2. Uh, with subsequent microsatellite instability. This is the patho of uh, Lynch, important to know. Uh, mutation of mismatch repair gene. And it's known as this, hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, and Lynch. Not to be confused with 
uh, the self-mutilating one that was edgy PRT or something, right? And biochem. Uh, 80 per, approximately 80% progress to colorectal carcinoma. Proximal colon is always involved. Okay, so the starting, the sending colon. Uh, it's associated with endometrial, ovarian, and skin cancer. Cool. It's closer to the endometrium, it's closer to the ovaries, and it's obviously has a skin overlaying it. So. Lynch. Uh, got the NGPNRT or NGPRT one was called Lynch Nehan syndrome. And this is Lynch syndrome, which is HNPCC. Don't confuse them. Uh, okay, so now you have colorectal cancer. I will do that one. So diagnosis. It causes uh, iron deficiency anemia in males, especially mo uh, when they're more than 50 years old. And postmenopausal females raises suspicion. Okay. Why? Cause uh, during menopause, uh, sorry, menstruation, they lose iron, so they normally suffer through iron deficiency, anyways. So it's quite normal to see that in a female. However, if you have iron deficiency anemia in a postmenopausal uh, female, uh, you should suspect colorectal cancer. Okay, and. In males, it's much easier to catch it because, you know, they don't go through that. So screening, uh, average risk, screen at age 45 with colonoscopy, uh, polypsine and A. Alternative include flexible sigmoidoscopy, fecal occult uh, blood testing, uh, and fecal immunochemical testing. Uh, they do this in Canada. I know that. Not sure about America. Uh, fecal immunochemical testing, they do that too. Uh, fe fecal DNA and CT colonography. When I say they do this in Canada, it's like quite common. Uh, like if your doctor wants to know, this is what he will ask you to get instead of sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy. Okay. Uh, Patients with a first degree relative who has colon cancer, uh, screen at f age 40 with colonoscopy or 10 years prior to the relative's presentation. So if your uncle got it at like 50, then you will get uh, screening done at 40, right? Uh, patients with IBD screen eight years after onset. So if you got it at like 35, you do it eight years after that. Uh, apple core lesions seen on barium enema x-ray okay so if it looks like that it's going to be uh, colorectal carcinoma okay uh, CEA uh, this important tumor marker this is a tumor marker for colorectal carcinoma okay uh, However, you should know its name as well. CEAs, uh, the full form of this is what's it? Carcino embryonic antigen. I think that was the name. Okay, so carcino embryonic antigen, and this is a um, tumor marker for colorectal carcinoma okay cool moving on to epidemiology uh, most patients are more than 50 years old approximately 25 percent have a family history how much time do i have so uh presentation uh more commonly it's at the rectal sigmoid uh than the Second, it's at uh, ascending, and third, it's at descending. Okay, so if I was to draw that, so there's a colon, 
ascending, transverse, descending, and then the sigmoid folding like that into the rectum, right? So this is the most popular spot for colorectal carcinoma. First, and then the second most common cause uh, spot for colorectal carcinoma. And this is the third most common cause. So if you have a growth over here, uh, don't think it's this colorectal carcinoma. Okay, it's going to be probably like ulcerative colitis or something. Okay. Uh, most are asymptomatic, right side. Uh, sequel ascending associated with occult bleeding okay so this is also important if it's on the right side the ascending one it's associated with occult bleeding okay uh, that's clotted blood in the stool uh, left side is going to be rectosigmoid associated with hematoschisia so that's fresh blood in the stool and obstruction okay uh, narrow lumen leads to decrease in stool caliber ascending uh, you'll find exophytic mass iron deficiency anemia and weight loss you need to know this because this is what they'll give you in the question stem and then you have to figure out if it's if the cancer is in the ascending or descending part of the body uh, colon so exophytic mass iron deficiency anemia weight loss for ascending for descending it's infiltrating mass partial obstruction cloaky pain uh, hematoschisia it can present with uh, it can present with s bovis or galacticus right remember that uh, important cause of uh, cancer so can present with s bovis uh, bacteremia endocarditis or an episode of diverticulitis so if you pick up a culture of this from the heart uh, what does that mean that means you have uh, you either have a high risk of having it or you already have colorectal cancer okay uh, endocarditis how do you know you have endocarditis you have the crp the splint hemorrhages in your nails and stuff like that okay. increase in uh sorry risk factors this is adenomatous and serrated polyps familial cancer syndrome uh inflammatory bowel disease tobacco use diet of processed meat with low fiber okay it's important to eat fiber if you don't have fiber in your in your diet then you can just grab a box of psyllium husk and then have it every night and that should be good enough as well right uh, it also protects you from not only this uh, but also also anal fissures okay because that one also was due to low diet uh, low fiber and diet okay molecular pathogenesis of colorectal cancer chromosomal instability pathway mutations in APC right uh, causes FAP uh, Chromosomal instability pathway mutations in APC causes FAP and most sporadic ca cases of CRC via adenocarcinoma sequence. Uh, I think I already explained this pretty good, so I'll just go read through it. Microsatellite instability pathway mutations are methylation of mismatch uh, repair. That's methylation is just silencing. Uh, for example, MLH1 causes Lynch syndrome or non-polyposis hereditary disease and some sporadic uh, CRC via serrated polyp pathway. It usually leads to right-sided colorectal carcinoma. Okay, that's not really that important, but I guess remember that. Overexpression of COX-2 have been linked to colorectal cancer. Uh, NSAIDs can may be chemo-preventive. That's important. NSAIDs can be given because uh, it has overexpression of COX-2 uh, which have been linked to colorectal cancer, right? So what do NSAIDs do? They block this. Okay, so chromosomal instability pathway, normal, colon, then you lose the APC gene, two-hit hypothesis, and then you get color at risk. Then you have CRAS mutation, uh, then you get unregulated intracellular signaling, so you 
secrete adenomas then. Then you have loss of tumor suppressor genes or TP53 DCC. Um, this is where the tumor red genesis occurs and then you have colorectal carcinoma. That's this big. Okay. Uh, real quick, let's see what adenomas look like. Okay, uh, they won't ask you that, so let's not worry about it then. Uh, anything that I missed? No, I think I got it. Uh, just remember this, uh, AK53, A4 APC, K4 CRAS, and 53 is in the between the last two. Cool. Three minutes. Uh, this is important microcellulite uh, uh, let's talk about this one more time so ascending colorectal you have exophytic mass iron deficiency anemia and weight loss and descending you have infiltrating mass partial obstruction cloaky pain and hematochezia they should tell you if the uh, blood is fresh in stool it's from a nearby source right if it's uh, occult it's clotted uh, it's going to be from a uh, further source than this right and then iron deficiency anemia is an important thing to remember and yeah as bovis remember that if you find this in the heart uh, you have colorectal cancer or it's associated with that okay after break we'll uh, portal hypertension okay uh, cirrhosis is diffuse bridging fibrosis via stellate cells Remember, those ones were the ones uh, carrying the vitamin A, right? Uh, and regenerative nodules disrupt normal architecture of liver. Increased risk for hepatocellular carcinoma can lead to various systemic changes. Okay, so like that. Etiologies include alcohol, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Uh, chronic viral hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis, biliary disease, genetic or metabolic disorders. Uh, for cirrhosis, uh, you just need to know how it happens and that it carries the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma and signs and symptoms for whatever this is, okay? Uh, etiologies are all of these things, so it can be anything causing cirrhosis. Uh, portal hypertension, increase in pressure in portal venous system. Right? Uh, etiologies include cirrhosis, most common cause in developed countries, vascular obstruction, for example, portal vein thrombosis, uh, bite carry syndrome, and uh, schistosomiasis. Remember the cholangio, whatever it was. Somatosis, the sensi, uh, hematidin, and japanicum, those ones, the liver fluke ones. Okay, uh, we'll learn about Bird Carey syndrome, it's pretty easy. Okay, so what do you get when you have this, right? So these are the signs and symptoms of all of this of uh, what cirrhosis, okay, or even portal hypertension. So you get jaundice, you get spider angiomas, also known as uh, telangiectasia, right? Uh, you have, so you need to know what this looks like. Uh, that's what it looks like, spider angiomas, okay. Um, Palmar erythema. You don't know what that looks like. And you have already seen it. Okay, redness on the palm. Uh, purpura and pitechi. Okay. Uh, effects of portal hypertension is all the varices, right? So esophageal and gastric varices, hematemesis and melena. You get caput medusa as well, and you get anorectal versus as well. And 
you had esophageal acute yeah. and then you had uh, tips remember that's what it was okay so ascites spontaneous bacterial peritonitis okay all of this can happen uh, sorry uh, reproductive uh, you have testicular atrophy this is important they'll give you that you have gynecomastia okay and amenorrhea okay uh, out of these uh, spider angiomas and palmarisma and gynecomastia or testicular atrophy that is due to increase in estrogen okay uh, you have neurologic hepatic uh, encephalopathy why estrogen increase because it's broken down by the liver and now that liver is not uh, functioning uh, estrogen is not being broken down and now it's being the levels are increasing in the serum so now that you have increased amount of estrogen is doing things to you which is in the form of testicular atrophy or gynecomastia or spirangioma and pulmonarisma okay uh, neurologic hepatic encephalopathy and asterisks which is flapping tremor this is important we looked at that somewhere as well uh, it moves right so that's what that is uh, you have uh, foul breath or fetal hepaticus okay. uh, anorexia nausea vomiting dull abdominal pain uh, these are very vague so this is not going to be very specific to it if they give you this you can zone down to it but if they give you spider angiomas or testicular atrophy with one of these viruses then you can you know zone down or clue down into cirrhosis or portal hypertension okay now uh, hematologic thrombocytopenia why because liver makes it right anemia again uh, same thing um, anemia it's mostly because what was it I'm skipping on the reason for that uh, coagulation disorder and splenomegaly um, then you have renal, hepatos renal syndromes, right, and metabolic, so hyperbilirubinemia and hyponatremia, uh, CVS, cardiomyopathy, peripheral edema, right there, okay. Uh, they'll give you like two or three of all of these, and they'll also give you the LFTs, so your AST or ELT, uh, values and that will pretty much tell you that they're talking about the GIT and liver okay if no, this is normal it's going to be something else okay spontaneous bacterial peritonitis right so this one right here also called primary bacterial peritonitis common and potentially fatal bacterial infection in patients with cirrhosis and ascites often asymptomatic but can cause fever chills abdominal pain ileus or worsening encephalopathy commonly caused by gram negative organisms for example e coli klebsiella or less commonly gram positive streptococcus okay uh, pretty easy to remember diagnostic paracentesis with acidic fluid uh, absolute neutrophil count is anc uh, Right, ANC is going to be more than 250 cells per millimeter cube. Empiric first line treatment is third generation cephalosporine or cephotaxin. Right, you do tax in the third month. So that's how I remember that. Uh, serum markers of liver pathology. So ESD and ELT. So aspartate aminotransferase is as ESD. And ELT is alanine amino transferase. So EST. Uh, so if there is increase in mo, okay. So increase in most liver disease will cause increase in ELT more than EST. Okay. So liver disease L for L. And if it's alcoholic, increase in alcoholic liver disease, it's gonna be EST. EST. Uh, you toast with alcohol, so toast has EST in it. So that the ratio is usually two to one so double of whatever it is uh, 
ALT is. So ASD does not typically exceed 500 though in alcoholic hepatitis. Cool. ASD more than ALT in non-alcoholic liver disease such as progression to advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. Uh, there is an increase in amino transferases and more than 1000. So in non-alcoholic liver disease suggests progression to advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. Okay, uh, if the levels are more than 1,000. Differential includes drug-induced liver injury, for example, acetaminophen toxicity, ischemic hepatitis, and acute viral hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis as well. Okay, cool. Uh, alkaline phosphatase is increase in cholecystitis, cholestasis, for example, biliary obstruction, infiltrative disorder, bone disease, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase is increase in various liver and biliary disease, such as just as ELP can, but not in bone disease, located in canalicular membrane of hepatocytes like ELP associated with alcohol use okay so basically uh elp is going to be increased in liver and bone diseases right uh, or you know biliary or bone disease or infiltrated disease okay the liver pathology so liver or bone disease primarily so if you have increase in elp how do you differentiate it between liver and bone diseases you do gamma glutamyl transpeptidase if this turns out to be normal, then it's uh, not going to be liver, right? So it's going to be bone disease type. So increase in various liver and biliary diseases, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, just as ELP can, but not in bone disease, right? So yeah, GGT is not increased in bone diseases. Uh, it's located in canalicular membrane hepatocytes like ELP, but not in bones. Cool. It's associated with alcohol use. Okay, functional liver markers. So bilirubin, uh, it increases in various liver diseases like biliary obstruction, alcoholic and viral hepatitis, cirrhosis, and hemolysis. Albumin decreases in advanced liver disease. Why? Because albumin is uh, synthesized in the liver. So decrease in advanced liver disease, markers of liver biosynthetic function. Okay. And again, this is also made there. So prothrombin time increases in advanced liver disease because the clotting factors uh, decrease, right? So if that decreases, then the PTT is going to increase. Uh, PTT is uh, intrinsic factors, right? And extrinsic factor is PT. So intrinsic ones are the uh, 2, 7, 9, 10, CS, and extrinsic is 7, I think. Wait, 2, seven, not 7. 1, 2, 9, 10, I think. Okay. Uh, we'll do that in HEMAT. Screw it. <laughs> Increase in advanced liver disease, decrease in production of clotting factors, thereby measuring the liver's biosynthetic function, platelets. Decrease in advanced liver disease, decrease in thrombopoietin, liver sequestration, and portal hypertension. Splenomegaly uh, or splenic sequestration also occurs. Okay. Uh, what is rise disease or raise disease? Uh, that's when you give a child aspirin. That's this one. So it's rare, often fatal, childhood. Uh, hepatic encephalopathy okay uh, it's associated with viral infection uh, for example uh, herpes simplex virus 3 or varicella zoster virus and influenza that has been treated with uh, aspirin influenza is what kind of virus uh, orthomyxovirus Okay, so that has been treated with aspirin. Aspirin metabolites decrease in beta oxidation. 
by reversible inhibition of mitochondrial enzyme. Influenza orthomegalovirus, it has eight segments. Okay. So the metabolites decrease beta oxidation. Okay, so, and you need beta oxidation, right? So decreasing beta oxidation by reversible inhibition of mitochondrial enzyme. Um, this is the part that's really bad, right? So that's going to cause a lot of problems. Uh, mitochondrial abnormalities, fatty liver, because uh, it's not being oxidized anymore. Microvascular fatty changes, hypoglycemia, vomiting, hepatomegaly, and coma. Avoid aspirin in children except in Kawasaki disease. So in Kawasaki disease, this is the only exception. We do give aspirin. Uh, salicylates are array of sunshine for kids why shine uh, it's for steatosis of liver hepatocyte hypoglycemia hepatomegaly infection uh, vzv or influenza not awake so coma or encephalopathy as well okay um, cool why do we not give aspirin in our child because it causes mitochondrial enzyme to reversible uh, reversible inhibition of mitochondrial enzyme and decreases beta oxidation causing mitochondrial abnormality and fatty liver okay important alcoholic liver disease uh, hepatic stetosis so this is macro this was micro this is macro vascular fatty change so that's what it looks like okay kind of looks like uh, renal cell carcinoma Alcoholic hepatitis required sustained requires sustained long-term consumption, swollen and necrotic hepatocyte and neutrophilic infiltration. Uh, you'll see mellor, mellory bodies, so inclusion bodies right here. Out of all the inclusion bodies, this is another one added to the list. So intracytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusions of damaged keratin filament. So remember Mallory body, if you see Mallory body, they're talking about alcoholic hepatitis. Uh, they might not tell you that it's a Mallory body, they'll tell you that it's an intraplasmic eosinophilic occlusion of damaged keratin filaments. Okay. Where we see keratin pro is going to cell carcinoma, so you're not hinting towards that when you're talking about keratin filament being damaged. Okay, especially if they're inside of the eosinophils. Cool. Uh, alcoholic uh, cirrhosis, final and unusual, uh, usually irreversible form. So this is sclerosis that's hardening around the central vein. Right. So cler sclerosis around the central vein, arrow and C. May be seen in early disease. Regenerative nodules surrounded by fibrous bands and response to chronic liver injury there is it also leads to portal hypertension and and stage liver disease okay so important thing is right here is this sclerosis around central vein they might give you that in the question stem that there is hardening of the central vein uh, what was the etiology of this cirrhosis? Okay. Uh, then we have non-alcoholic fatty uh, fatty liver uh, disease. This is metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, uh, obesity, right? So fatty infiltration of hepatocytes. Okay, you see the fat there okay now when you see that they usually just ask you what is the cause of this so it's going to be fat right so you see fat it's going to be fatty acid liver disease uh cellular ballooning and eventual necrosis may cause cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma independent of alcohol use 
so if you see this and they tell you this person does not drink it's going to be non-alcoholic okay sorry now autoimmune hepatitis that's chronic inflammatory liver disease uh, more common in females more may be asymptomatic or present with fatigue nausea pruritus often positive for anti-smooth muscles or anti-liver kidney microsomal one antibody labs are going to show that it's increase in elt and esd histology is going to show this is the important one that they give you so how do you know it's autoimmune if you see lymphocytes right what's lymphocyte it's the t cell b cell and b cell also changes into uh, antibodies right so this is important if you see lymphocytes anywhere it's going to be something to do with auto uh, autoimmune system right so portal and periportal lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate uh, this is actually what they use for buzzword for autoimmune hepatitis uh, very high yield okay portal and periportal so in the portal and around the portal you'll see lympho uh, lymphocytes infiltration okay uh, then you have hepatic encephalopathy this is cirrhosis with proto systemic shunts this decreases uh, ammonium metabolism neuropsychiatric dysfunction which is reversible which may range from disorientation to asterisks okay. smile to difficult arousal or coma the triggers are increase in ammonium produc production not ammonium sorry ammonia production and absorption Right, that's ammonia, and ammonium is NH4, I think. Let's just confirm it. Yeah, so ammonia. And NH4 is ammonia. Cool. Uh, so increase in NH3 production and absorption due to GI bleed, constipation, and infection. Uh, decrease in NH3 removal due to renal failure, diuretics, bypass, hepatic blood flow, post uh, tips, right? So we do this to reduce the uh, portal pressure, uh, but in doing so, it's the blood is not being, or the blood coming from the intestine or like the splenic circulation is not getting filtered and now you have ammonia in your system. Right, which is causing all of this disorder. Not that, but this, these is symptoms. So treatment is lactulose. So this increases ammonium generation. Why ammonium instead of ammonia? Because this is a non-toxic version of this. And rifaximine uh, that decreases uh, ammonia producing gut bacteria. Uh, you have liver tumor okay so these are the tumors you find uh, hepatic hemangioma also called uh, cavernous hemangioma most common benign liver tumor venous malformation okay that's what it looks like uh, typically occurs at age 30 to 50 biopsy contraindicated because of risk of hemorrhage okay so Cavernous hemangioma, most common uh, benign liver tumor. So if they give you a photo like this, first of all, you're gonna see these uh, new vessels growing inside of a cavity, right? So that should give away what this is. You see a cavity with like red dots, that's our new vessels forming. So that's hemangioma, okay. Uh, what else uh, they'll say that it is benign so how should you diagnose this uh, and they'll give you biopsy so don't do that to diagnose it because there is a risk of hemorrhage there because remember these are vessels so if you biopsy a vessel that's cutting out the vessel and then they're gonna bleed okay uh, focal nodular hyperplasia second most common benign liver tumor 
occurs predominantly in females aged 35 to 50 years. Hyperplastic reaction of hepatocytes to an aberrant dystrophic artery marked by a central stellate scar, usually asymptomatic and detected incidentally. Okay, this is the second most common benign liver tumor. They don't test you on this, they test you on this. Uh, hepatic adenoma, a rare benign tumor often related to oral contraceptive or anabolic steroid use. Uh, very important, this one. May regress spontaneously or rupture. Okay, so it's going to be uh, this person who had a checkup a few months ago, but now when they did a checkup again, they found some kind of mass on the liver. And then they're going to give you a history that this person has recently started you know, going on a contraceptive pills. So what is this growth? It's an adenoma, right? Why? Because it's a rare benign tumor often related to oral contraceptive or anabolic steroid use may regress spontaneously or rupture. So it could be uh, a checkup or it could be there in the emergency because of a rupture okay uh, hepatocellular carcinoma so HCC also called hepatoma most common primary malignant liver tumor in adults that's what it looks like very important that you know how to identify it on an x-ray they have started doing that now Not extra, sorry. Okay, uh, so in the scan, you should know that this is a hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay, or that, or that. It could be multiple, too. It could be more than one. Okay. So that. Here you have one, two, three, and four. Okay. You have a we have one, two, three. You see multiple uh, lucencies over there. Okay. So similarly here. So you should be able to identify that. Okay, hepatocellular carcinoma, also called hepatoma, most common primary malignant liver tumor in adults, associated with hepatitis B virus, uh, with or without cirrhosis, and all, all other causes of cirrhosis including hepatitis C virus, alcoholic, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, autoimmune disease or hematochromatosis, Wilson's disease, alpha-1 antitrypsin disease, and specific carcinogens like APOC toxin from aspergillus. Findings are anorexia, uh, obviously weight loss because it's cancer, uh, jaundice, tender hepatomegaly, may lead to decompensation of previously stable cirrhosis, for example, ascites, and polomene thrombosis spreads hemat hematogenously, that means by the circulation, blood circulation. Diagnosis is ultrasound screening or contrast CT or MRI. Uh, this is for confirmation. And biopsy is uh, Biopsy if diagnosis is uncertain. Okay. So first you do CT and MRI, and then if you still don't know, then you just go in and check out how the cells look and if it's dysplastic or dysplasia is happening. That's this. Cool. Hepatic angiocarcinoma is rare malignant tumor of endothelial origin associated with exposure to arsenic and vinyl chloride. We saw this before too. Uh, metastasis, most common malignant liver tumor overall. Primary uh, sources include GI, breast, liver, uh, sorry, lung cancer. So this should be obvious because GI obviously uses the portal circulation to go to liver. So majority of the time that's going to be the site of metastasizing. But then it also goes to the breast and lung cancer as well. Uh, 
so metastasis, uh, metastasis are rarely solitary. Okay, more uh, it can be more than one. So now we are talking about Bud Carey syndrome. What was B? Okay, malignant tumor in adults. Okay, that's all. So Bud Carey uh, syndrome is hepatic venous outflow tract obstruction. Okay, and uh, so that's this one, and then we have in inlet or portal vein coming in and the hepatic artery that they're not talking about so hepatic venous obstruct uh, outflows tract obstruction for example due to thrombosis or compression okay uh, with centrilobar congestion and necrosis okay. centrilobar congestion so whatever it's like over there some kind of thing happening here that's pressing onto this causing obstruction and necrosis right if it just necrosis uh, and then you have um, okay so then that leads to congestive liver disease or hepatomegalyositis versus abdominal pain liver failure absence of jugular venous distension okay there'll be absence of this because uh, it's being obstructed here so there's going to be decrease in blood pressure going upwards and decrease in venous return as well so there's no backup of that it's associated with uh, hypercoagulable states okay so this is important because this is how you know uh, that bread carry it's bread carry and it's not because of some kind of cardiac reasons right for any cardiac reason this is happening because if it was a cardiac reason and you know right heart failure then you would get increase in JVD right? that's why it's an important note to make associated with hypercoagulable state because uh, that's how you get the thrombus uh, polycythemia vera again that's also a hypercoagulable state uh, and postpartum state that's also a hypercoagulable state uh, why because it's a defense mechanism in case there's bleeding your body's prepared to coagulate all the bleed sites and ECC right, uh, may cause nutmeg liver or multiple appearance okay let's see what that looks like moving on alpha antitrypsin deficiency if there is a problem in the liver and lungs together this is the one that you gotta think about uh, so you have EST ALT and the person has difficulty in breathing then this is the one or they have emphysema and they have little problems with this okay so misfolded uh, gene product protein aggregates in hepatocellular endoplasmic reticulum leading to cirrhosis with past positive globules okay uh, you see that stuff right there the little circles around the blue that's what they're talking about okay so misfolded gene protein aggregates in hepatocellular ER so ER is now getting bigger in the cell okay uh, leading to cirrhosis with past positive glo globules in the liver where else did we see past positive something it was in trypanoma whipley right so whipple's disease you pass pass me the can of uh, whip cream whipping cream in a can can was for cardiac a was for arthralgia and n was for neurologic symptoms okay back to this co-dominant trait often presents in young patients with liver damage and dyspnea without a history of tobacco smoking. Okay. In lungs, there's decrease in alpha-1 antitrypsin, uninhibited elastase in alveoli, decrease in elastic tissue, causes pancinar emphysema. Okay, emphysema is what happens. Uh, this is actually the pathogenesis of emphysema. Decrease in 
uh, four pens in our uh, emphysema. There's another one that's centrally lower emphysema. Uh, its pathogenesis is different than this. Okay. Uh, then you have jaundice. Uh, jaundice is abnormal yellowing of the skin and or sclera. Right? Uh, it's due to the bilirubin uh, deposition. Hyperbilirubinemia, secondary to the increased production or decreased clearance. So it's being made a lot or it's not being cleared out uh, enough. So impaired hepatic uptake, congestion, conjugation, sorry, and excretion. Okay. Uh, so you have hot liver, uh, common cause of decrease in bilirubin liver level, hemolysis, obstruction, tumor, and liver disease. Let me just draw a little. You have blood going into the liver, and then this going into the bile, and then outwards. Okay, into the intestine. This is the intestine where the gut bacteria start chloralis and then converts it into urobilinogen. So we have conjugated, right? So for conjugation, what do we need? You need UDP uh, glucosyl transferase, right? So UDP gluconeural transferase. Okay, before uh, it gets attached to that, uh, what happens? Bilirubin uh, gets, a, you know, if there's a cell lysis or, you know, something like that, breaks down or something, then you have bilirubin there and then bilirubin gets uh, at attaches itself to albumin and then albumin brings it to the liver and then liver then uh, splits those two and then con combines it with glucuronic acid right and uh, then it becomes conjugated and that's called conjugated bilirubin so you have conjugated direct hyperbilirubinemia this is because of so now if there's any problem in here, it's going to be direct uh, uh, hyperbilirubinemia. If the problem was before it reached uh, the liver, before it got uh, involved with UDP glucosyl transferase, it's going to be indirect hyperbilirubinemia, right? So let's do indirect first. So how do you have hyper indirect hyperbilirubinemia? It's the one that is free or bound to albumin, right? So that's hemolytic, benign or neonates. You can have kregler najjar or Gilbert syndrome. So that's over here. Okay, so where do you have the Gilbert? That's this part right here, I guess. Wait, what numbers are those? Okay, so one and two, right. Okay, so unconjugated bilirubin, that makes more sense. So if this doesn't happen, it's uh, Gilbert Najjar and Gilbert syndrome over there, right? Okay. So hemolytic, benign, uh, Kregler Najjar or Gilbert syndrome. You have beta glucuronidase, that's lysosomal enzyme that deconjugates direct bilirubin. So even if it's conjugated, it deconjugates this, right? It's ACE, so it cleaves. Also found in intestinal brush border and in breast milk, sometimes leading to neonatal unconjugated hypobilirubinemia. Okay, and this is an important line. It's found in intestinal brush border. Okay, so if the person has, person is found to have a indirect bilirubin in the stool, it's because of this. The bacteria is involved in that process that have uh, how do bacteria do it they do it via beta glucuronidase okay that's an important topic okay uh, and this is also this is not the reason actually yeah why do you have uh, benign okay they talked about it here we'll talk about that okay so Kregler Kregler Najjar and Gilbert is 
indirect okay gilbert is just uh benign uh, a little benemia because it happens due to stress and then it goes away so if you listen to Golian, he talks about how it can happen to interns interning in a hospital so the their colleagues tell them that oh, dude you're yellow in the eyes you have your jaundice right so then by the time they go home and they look in the mirror it's gone because it's because they rested and then you know it's not there anymore so it's benign so it's indirect if it was direct it would be more concerning right and Kregler Najar, well, I don't know how you can remember that one, but we'll do that. Okay, uh, then conjugated direct hyperbilirubinemia, that's anything after uh, it's dealt with, you know, the conversion. So that could be biliary tract obstruction, that's the biliary tract obstruction between this and this. so from here to here uh, you can have gallstones so inside of the gallbladder so that would be here right. uh, this is the bile so let's not do that to the gall bladder right so problem with this or problem with this uh, cholangiocarcinoma, cancer of the bile duct, right? Pancreatic or liver cancer, or the liver fluke. Any of these will ca cause, uh, will have conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, there are also biliary tract uh, diseases, which is primary sclerosing cholangitis and primary biliary cholangitis. Excretion defect is Dubois Johnson syndrome or Broder syndrome. It just like Kregler, Najar, and Gilbert, now we have Dubin Johnson syndrome and Roder syndrome. Okay. Uh, then we have mixed hyperbilirubinemia. So again, the obstruction between liver and the uh, gallbladder, so bile tract obstruction, then that will cause uh, gallstones, cholangiocarcinoma. Oh, uh, sorry. It could be because of gallstones or cholangiocarcinoma, pancreatic, or liver cancer, or liver fluke. Okay, so anywhere in there. Uh, then you have biliary tract disease. So, primary sclerosing cholangitis or primary biliary cholangitis. I think I'm messing this up. It's not that it goes directly to the gallbladder, right? It goes through the hepatic bile duct. And then there's also another duct coming from this uh, gallbladder joining here and making the common bile duct. Okay, so the problem is over here. Why can there be a problem here? Because there's a uh, gallstone here that travels down and blocks this area. So now there's blockage over here. Okay, I think we'll go over that further in the chapter. Okay. Uh, then we have mixed hyperbilirubinemia, both direct and indirect hyperbilirubinemia. Bilirubinemia. Why does it, does this happen? It's hepatitis and cirrhosis. So you'll have problem having the blood come in or bilirubin come in. That's why you have indirect. And even after it's came in uh, and conjugated, it's going to have a hard time going into the bile and stuff. Okay, uh, benign neonatal hyperbilirubinemia. So this is the neonatal jaundice. Why do you get that? It was physiologically, uh, it was called physiologic neonatal jaundice. Okay, uh, it's mild unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia caused by increase in fetal RBC turnover. Okay, and increase in hematocrit and decrease in fetal RBC lifespan. So that's why you have the turnover. Immature newborn liver, they don't have the UDP glucose glucuronal silyl transferase activity. Okay, so it's decreased, that's why. So it doesn't conjugate. 
the bilirubin. Sterile newborn gut. There is decrease in conversion to uropilinogen, uh, which leads to increase in deconjugation by intestinal beta glucuronidase. So this causes an increase in enterohepatic circulation. This is an important one too. So in sterile newborn gut, there's decrease in conversion to uropilinogen. So then that is right. So if it doesn't make this uropilinogen, what's it gonna happen? What's gonna happen? There will be increase in decongestion, conjugation. Sorry. Uh, by this right. So we did this and uh, we looked at this in endo. Let's just do that right now as well, just to make it complete. Oh, no. What should I type? This is repro, not enter. That didn't help. Oh, there you go. So it comes in, right? So RBC, heme, unconjugated. Albumin, it attaches to albumin, so unconjugated bilirubin and albumin go into the liver, and when it's introduced to UDP glucuronylase transferase, it gets conjugated, right? Uh, to conjugate, it's conjugated with, where to go, uh, glucuronic acid, right? Uh, so that's important. Okay, after it's conjugated, it goes into the bile duct, uh, into the gut where gut bacteria converts it to uropilinogen. If it can't do that, uh, the beta, you know, back to where we were. So if it doesn't do this, it's going to get converted uh, to unconjugated by beta Um uh, Right? So that thing right there. So sterile newborn gut, it decreases conversion of uterine bilinogen, gets in, uh, leads to increase in deconjugation. Okay. Now, it occurs in nearly all newborns after first 24 hours of life and usually resolves without treatment in one to two weeks. So you gotta wait for two weeks. If, uh, if there's neonatal jaundice even after two weeks, then it's uh, concerning. So exaggerated forms of uh, benign neonatal hyperbilirubinemia are breastfeeding failure jaundice and breast milk jaundice. Okay, so breastfeeding failure jaundice is insufficient breast milk intake And uh, this leads to decrease in bilirubin elimination in stool, which causes increase in enterohepatic circulation. So the more it's in here, the more it's going to cause bilirubinemia. Okay, and then you have breast milk jaundice. Um, there's increase in beta glucuronidase in breast milk, leads to increase in deconjugation. So. Uh, increase in enterohepatic circulation again, same thing. Okay, but it's benign, so no need to worry about it. Okay, uh, remember this is found in intestinal brush border and in breast milk, leading to neonatal unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Cool. Uh, severe cases may lead to chronic icterus. This is deposition of unconjugated or indirect bilirubin lipid-soluble bilirubin in the brain. Okay, so chronic icterus is bilirubin in the brain, particularly basal ganglia. Uh, treatment is, mostly everything happens here uh, when it comes from the system. Okay, uh, treatment, phototherapy, non-UV. Okay, that's important. I think I made a mistake somewhere saying that you do UV phototherapy, you don't do UV, it's non-UV because obviously UV would cause 
other things to happen. Uh, so isomerizes unconjugated failure into a water soluble form. So you can just pee it out. Uh, or the patient will pee it out. Uh, biliary atresia, most common reason for pediatric uh, liver transplantation. So, you know, atresia means it's not there or blocked or it just did, it just wasn't made. Uh, most common reason for pediatric liver transplantation, fibro obliterative destruction of bile ducts. Uh, leads to cholestasis, right? So, choli, bile, duct, uh, and stasis, that's, you know, stagnant or stopped, not moving. Often presents as a newborn with persistent jaundice after two weeks of life. And so, even after two weeks, there's jaundice, then it's, you know, concerning. So, you think of this. There's darkening urine. It's because there's so much bilirubin in there. And out acolic stools, because there's no bile. Why? Because there's no bile duct. Right? Uh, hepatomegaly. Uh, labs are increased in uh, direct bilirubin and gamma glutamate transferases. Cool. So. All of these are autosomal recessive. Uh, you have Gilbert syndrome, uh, which is mildly. Okay, so Gilbert syndrome ha happens here. So first you have hemoglobin, circulating bilirubin, albumin bound, unconjugated water soluble. They go into the coffer, into the liver, uh, where it's filtered out with, uh, by coffer cells, which are macrophages of the liver, and go through the space of this. And then it goes into you know, it's taken up and on conjugate bilirubin, it gets introduced to UDP, glucuronyl transferase, makes conjugated bilirubin, and then from there, you know the rest, right? So intracellular transport goes to the bile, bile flow, bile canalicular lumen, one, two, three, and four. So first one is Gilbert syndrome. It's mildly decreased uh, in UDP glucuronyl transferases, Conjugation, asymptomatic or mild jaundice, usually with stress, right, or illness, or fasting. Okay, all of these things can cause that, but it's benign. Okay, increase in unconjugated bilirubin without overt hemolysis. Relatively common, it's a benign condition. Then you have Kregler Najjar syndrome, type 1. This is not that there's decreased amount, it's just absent. ADP glucuronal, glucuronosyl transferase. Presents early in life, but some patients may not have neurologic signs until later in life. Okay, so even though it it's present early in life, uh, they're asymptomatic until later in life. So findings are going to be jaundice, pernicterus, that's unconjugated bilirubin deposition in the brain, increase in unconjugated bilirubin. Again, you don't have this, so there's no way unconjugated is going to get conjugated without this thing right here, right? So it's all going to be unconjugated, these ones. That's before it enters the liver, right? Or it enters and it gets converted, sorry. Uh, okay, treatment is plasma pharesis and phototherapy. It does not conjugate uh, unconjugated bilirubin, but it does increase increase the polarity and increases water solubility to allow excretion. Liver transplant, splant, uh, liver transplant is curative. Type two is less severe and responds to phenobarbital, which increases liver enzyme synthesis. Okay. So type two is less severe and responds to phenobarbital, which increases liver enzyme synthesis. Then you have uh, the conjugated ones. Uh, errors in con after conjugation, right? So that's Duvin Johnson syndrome and Drouder syndrome. Uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia d due to defect in liver excretion. So you have grossly black liver. This is uh, what they will give you that they have a dark liver or black colored liver. It's due to impaired excretion of epinephrine metabolites. Okay, that's your HMA and 
H or B A or something like that. Okay. Uh, it is benign though. The Felinic something metaboy, I don't remember right now. But you'll see it in uh, biochemistry. And then you have Rotor syndrome. This is phenotypically similar to Dubin Johnson, but milder in presentation. It's without the black or liver, so it's regular liver. How do you remember that? R is for rotor and regular, and Dubin's D is for dark or, yeah, okay. Uh, it's due to impaired hepatic storage of conjugated bilirubin. Cool. How much time I have? Seven minutes. Okay, so excreting pieces, we looked at that and we looked at those. Uh, On to that, I think we'll take a break here because we finished, finished all of this. Okay, so Wilson's disease, also called hepatolenticular degeneration, autosomal recessive mutation, and hepatocyte copper transporting ATPase. Okay, this is uh, Wilson, is copper, that's how you remember it. Uh, I usually mix it with the Williams disease. Williams disease is the one with elf-like elf faces, right? Because uh, Will Ferrell was in the movie Elf, so Elfian face and William, and then then it's just Wilson, and Wilson's uh, associated with the uh, copper. So, what does it do with copper, right? So there's mutation in hepatocyte copper transporter, uh, ATPase. Okay, so copper doesn't get transported. So ATP7B gene on chromosome 13. So there's decreased copper incorporation into the epicelluloplasmin and excretion in bile. Let's see if there's a thing for that. A diagram so we can understand that better. Okay, so we have uh, this cerebroplasmin. Need to know what cerebroplasmin does. Okay, so autosomal uh, recessive defect ATP to B goes into cerebroplasmin, and then what does cerebroplasmin do? We'll learn about that. Okay. Uh, so decrease in copper incorporation into the apocerebroplasmin and excretion into bile. So there's decreased serum cerebroplasmin then. Because if it doesn't go into bile, it's not going to be taken up again. And if it doesn't get taken up, you won't have cerebroplasmin uh, go to the serum. So there will be decreased serum in cerebroplasmin. Sorry, decreased cerebroplasmin in serum. Uh, copper accumulates especially in liver, brain, again, basal ganglia, it's always basal ganglia, uh, cornea, uh, kidneys, and increase in urine copper, okay. Uh, it presents before age 40 with liver disease, for example, hepatitis, acute liver failure, cirrhosis, neurologic disease, for example, dysarthria. Uh, dystonia, tremor, Parkinsonism, psychiatric disease, uh, Kaiser Flesher rings, it deposits in decimate membrane of cornea, so that's what it looks like. You see that copper lining in the cornea. Um, hemolytic anemia, renal disease, for example, Fanconi syndrome. This is important to remember too. Uh, we'll read about that in renal. Treatment is chelation with penicillamine or trantine, oral zinc. Liver transplant is in acute liver failure related to Wilson's disease. Wilson disease, right. Okay, so this is the pathogenesis, uh, autosomal recessive mutation in hepatocyte, copper transporting ATPase. So what happens when that doesn't happen? Uh, copper doesn't get uh, incorporated into the epicellular plasmin and doesn't get excreted into the bile. So you have decreased serum serial plasmin 
what's the function of this? They didn't go over that. It is a protein that is made in liver. It stores and carries copper from the liver into the bloodstream, right? And to the part of body that needs it. So it's basically a transporter. So the transport is less. And what's this? The main copper binding protein. Okay, so this binds the protein. And some other fluids as well known copper dependent. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, this is a sign. Uh, you need to know about that. Because that's basically how they'll uh, explain it. So, that copper lining that you see over there, over there, there, there. Next is hematochromatosis, uh, autosomal recessive, mutation in HFE gene, FE for iron. So it's located on, so him, so H for that, and then FE for iron, right? So it's located on chromosome six. It leads to abnormal or low hepcidin production. Okay, for that, you need to know what hepcidin does. Okay, it's important that you know that. This one, remember this? So it basically acts on the ferroportein, right? So it sequesters iron. If it's over here, it's gonna sequester it over here and the enterocyte, if it's in the macrophage, it's gonna sequester it in the macrophage. So ferroportein is a port that uh, iron leaves from, so it blocks the port. That's what hepcidin does, it comes from the liver, okay? And transferrin carries the iron after it comes out of the port. It's like a ship that travels through the blood. So, uh, leads to abnormal low hepcidin production, increase in intestinal iron absorption. Uh, iron overload can also be secondary to chronic transfusion therapy, for example, beta thalassemia major. Iron accumulates, especially in liver, pancreas, skin, heart, pituitary, joints. So, you need to know what it looks like as well. Uh, so, you can, you know differentiate it so that's hemochromatosis that you'll see a uh, right there like that right so again you have to differentiate between this and that uh, age-related pigment lipofusion And also heart failure cells. So that was lipofusion. And then heart failure cells. Okay. And I guess melanoma as well, I think. Melanin. So that's what that looks like as well. Uh, so it's uh, important to understand the history and from history you can differentiate between them. So it won't be that hard. So here they tell you that it presents as, wait, let's finish this sentence. <laughs> uh, iron overload can only be secondary to chronic transfusion therapy. Okay, so secondary only to transfusion therapy. So after it's transfused, it breaks down again and then breaking down releases all the iron. For example, beta thalassemia major. Iron accumulates especially in liver, pancreas, skin, heart, pituitary, and joints. Hemocytrin or iron can be identified on the liver MRI or biopsy with Persian blue stain. Right? So 
if you see blue and pink it's hemochromatosis because that's the one that you do uh, Persian blue stain for uh, first step at least that's the only place where it comes up Persian blue stain uh, you have but don't confuse it with the silver stain because it looks a lot similar to that too. Uh, presents after age 40 when total body iron is more than 20 grams. So iron loss through menstruation slows progress progression in females. Okay. So this is why in females it's not uh, usually noticed until they reach menopause. Uh, in males, it's easily noticed again, just like uh, we did somewhere here. I forgot which one it was, but yeah, okay. Uh, so it presents after age 40 when total body iron is more than 20 grams. So iron loss through menstruation slows the progression in females because they bleed it out. Uh, classic triad of cirrhosis, diabetes, mellitus, and skin pigmentation. It causes bronze skin. Uh, skin. So it's known as bronze diabetes because it does, you know, get accumulated on the pancreas as well. Right? So that will cause diabetes. Also causes uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy because it uh, goes on the heart as well classic or dilated uh, cardiomyopathy uh, which is reversible hypogonadism and atropathy so calcium pyrophosphate deposition especially metacarpal phalangeal joint hepatocellular carcinoma is common cause of death uh, cool uh, they'll tell you the skin pigmentation is br uh, browns or brownish or chocolatey or something like that I think they use the word bronze uh, treatment is repeated uh, phlebotomy. Uh, that's basically just, you know, cutting into the blood vessel and leaking out the blood. So, the same to pronunciation. You know, a procedure in which a needle is used to take blood from a vein, usually for lab testing. But you actually do it... Uh, as a treatment therapy for hemochromatosis. So for a vampire, a uh, person with hemochromatosis would make a great news for a vampire. <laughs> Mutual benefit there. Iron Fe chelation with uh, deferoxamine and deferoxamine and deferoprone. Everything has Fe in it, and as soon as you see these words, you know it's something to do with chelation, and it has Fe, so chelation of iron. Cool. Uh, biliary tract disease may present with pruritus, jaundice, dark urine, light colored stool, hepatosplenomegaly. It's typically, uh, typically with cholestatic pattern of LFTs, that's you have conjugated uh, bilirubin that's after conjugation the problem starts right increase in cholesterol why because uh, there is no bile leaking out so uh, it's picking up more cholesterol to make sure that there's enough even if there's like a little bit of bile increase in ELP uh, we already know about that one and we know about increase in GTP because that happens in what liver and pancreas diseases I'm uh, sorry bile gallbladder diseases and pen uh, liver but not in the bone right before going to this let's look at the dirty medicine video i'll just go through this real quick but this is the one that you should watch if you have a hard time understanding this uh, it's by dirty medicine okay uh, I have i'm not gonna play that so we'll just go through this so he's talking about these and then he tells you that it goes from low severity to high severity, um, cholelithiasis, that's just stone, uh, in the gallbladder, and then cholecystitis, that's inflammation of the gallbladder, and then you have cholelithiasis, so that's stone in bile duct and the gallbladder, and then cholangitis, 
that's inflammation of the bowel duct okay so this is uh, liver this is right and left uh, hepatic uh, duct bile duct hepatic bile duct and this is gallbladder and this is the cystic duct and this is the common bowel duct right here okay you would have pancreas here going into the uh, bile duct uh, Sorry, not bothered into the duodenum along with this, right? Okay. So cholelithiasis, that's just stone and gall gallbladder, right? So choli is gallbladder, and then lithiasis is just stone formation, right? So it's stone formation in gallbladder, cloaky pain, worse with fatty foods. Uh, diagnosis or differential is uh, right upper quadrant. Uh, Sorry, diagnosis, yeah. So right upper quadrant uh, ultrasound. And then treatment is elective cholecystectomy. You just, you know, cross that out. Uh, cool. Then comes uh, cholecystitis. That's uh, inflammation of the gallbladder and the cystic duct, right? So cystitis and the gallbladder inflammation of that so why does that happen it's because there is some kind of uh, obstruction here so cystic duct obstruction happens there there is positive Murphy's sign uh, what is Murphy's sign it is um, Murphy's sign is inspiratory arrest on right upper quadrant palpation due to pain inspiratory arrest on right upper quadrant uh, palpation due to pain okay so when you press on it there's pain there uh, however pain may radiate to uh, however it's only sorry it only happens when there's inspiration okay uh, but it doesn't happen during uh, expiration why because when you're inspired the diaphragm goes below and presses on it and so if you're pressing from above and it's coming from the side uh, then it's going to get squished because there's already stuff under it right that's creating the pressure as well but if it's uh, you know just because of the diaphragm and you're not pressing into it it's just going to go upwards and then it's not resisting anymore I guess that's how you can think of that uh, in spite of your rest on so they won't be able to breathe basically okay uh, when they're when you palpate they won't be able to uh, inspire basically so inspiratory arrest on right upper quadrant palpation due to pain pain may radiate to the right shoulder due to irritation of the phrenic nerve that's the one that supplies the diaphragm okay uh, that's it for that so Murphy sign and then there's constant versus cloaky pain right so this there's a constant pain here Okay, uh, fever, leukocytosis, diagnosis, again, ultrasound, right upper quadrant, and HIDA scan. And treatment is the same thing. You cut this out as well, along with this. Cholecystectomy. Bunch of stones. Get okay. Uh, then you have... Uh, Cholidolit... That's uh, duct, uh, bile duct. Okay, uh, it's not the gallbladder. It includes the gallbladder. It includes the duct. It includes the stone right there. Right. So it's the stone going into the duct <coughs> from gallbladder to the duct. I guess common bile duct obstruction because now you have the stone over here. So proximal inflammation. So anything above it is going to get inflamed. Okay, so the duct is going to get inflamed the gallbladder is going to get inflamed uh, proximal inflammation obstruction obstructive jaundice uh, so this is going to be your conjugated bilirubinemia right or direct uh, bilirubin dilated hepatic bile ducts why because since everything is coming in and it's not going past this it's going to create a backflow 
so both of these uh, hepatic bile ducts are going to get dilated okay uh, treatment is same as uh, what you would use for diagnosis that's ERCP uh, we'll learn about that under this in the book okay uh, so that should help with that and then you have cholangitis uh, this is the inflammation of the whole uh, cystic duct and the bile duct and all that okay all the all three of those things so uh, cholelithiasis plus infection so why is this one uh, bad it's because this can lead to infection okay that's why this is bad so after this cholelithiasis plus the inflammation So, plus the inflammation will cause cholangitis. Um, Cholidol cholelithiasis plus infection. Charcot striad. Okay, we could, we'll learn about that. Reynolds pentad. Okay. Uh, so, charcot striad is right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, and fever. And then the pentad or Reynolds pentad is again right up a quadrant pain jaundice and fever but on top of that you have hypotension or shock right and altered mental status okay uh, diagnosis is again ultrasound and treatment is ERCP okay and that's the conclusion for that okay let's go to this Okay, so biliary tract disease may present with pruritus, jaundice, dark urine, like colored stool, hyperosplenomegaly, typically with cholestatic pattern of LFTs, increase in colon, uh, conjugated bilirubin, uh, increase in cholesterol, increase in ALP, and increase in GGT. Okay, uh, first one is primary sclerosing cholangitis. Uh, again, there's a Okay, so here the buzzword is going to be onion skin. Okay, so it's unknown cause of concentric or onion skin bile duct fibrosis. And that's how you know it's primary sclerosing cholangitis. Sclerosing means hardening of the uh, duct, uh, the bile duct, right? Uh, and inflammation, that's what that means. So onion skin bile duct fibrosis, alternating strictures and dilation with beating of intra and extra hepatic bile duct on ERCP so see these little beads of things happening over there so that's what that means uh, this whole thing is just ERCP tool okay. uh, magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography MRCP okay you just put that there uh, so epidemiology is classically in middle-aged males with ulcerative colitis if they have ulcerative colitis and it's a middle-aged man uh, you would think of this but they will probably just give you this right away fibrosis of bile duct and then you should come to primary sclerosing cholangitis uh, if they don't give you that, they'll give you any of these. So if they tell you it's MPO ANCA positive or P ANCA positive, you will think of this. And remember, these were positive and ulcerative colitis as well. Because Crohn is basic, so it's just going to be ESCA over there. So associated with ulcerative colitis, MPO ANCA and P ANCA positive. Increase in immunoglobulin M can lead to secondary biliary cirrhosis. Increased risk of cholangiocarcinoma and gallbladder cancer. Along with this, there's also increase in ALP for this one, but you'll have normal LFTs or amino transferases. 
So normal aminor transferases, that's your EST, ELTs, but increase than ELT for this one. Okay, remember the onion skin or uh, concentric onion scale part of fibrosis. That's usually what they talk about. Or they'll give you this, that there's increase in ELP, but not amino transfers, because that's how you differentiate between uh, liver and biliary diseases. Just like you would use GGT to differentiate between the bone and the specific disease, right? Then you have primary biliary cholangitis. Right? This was sclerosing, that's hardening. And this is just, you know, inflammation without the hardening. So pathology here is that uh, there's autoimmune reaction, which leads to lymphocytic infiltrate with or without granulomas, destruction of uh, lo lobular bile ducts. Okay. Uh, so increasing ELP here as well. So that means it could be liver, bone, or uh, liver, bone, or this uh, bile duct, right? So, but there is increase in amino transferases for this one as well. No, wait, wrong about that. Sorry, there's increase in uh, GGT. So gamma glutamyl trans peptidase. And there's also increase in direct bilirubin. Okay. Uh, classically in middle-aged females, this one is found in females, whereas clarosing one, you know, because it's stronger, it could be males. Sorry for feminists, uh, to feminism, but it's just easier to remember that way. I don't agree with it. Uh, Anti-mitochondrial antibodies, positive, right? Uh, increase in, uh, you have to remember this one because this is important. And then there's increase in IgM that was here as well. But this thing is uh, very rare. You won't see it anywhere. It's only for this primary biliary cholangitis. If you look at patho, turn the page all, all the way there, you'll see it there. That this is the only thing that it's positive for. Associated with other autoimmune conditions like uh, Hashimoto thyroiditis, rheumatoid arthritis, and celiac disease. Am I wrong then? I thought it was only for this. Let me go check. Yeah, so primary biliary cholangitis. That's right. Cool. Back to what's it for? Okay. Uh, so it's associated with uh, autoimmune conditions like Hashimoto thyroiditis, rheumatoid arthritis, and celiac disease. Treatment is uracidiol. Uh, don't need to worry about that. They don't ask you that. Uh, then secondary biliary cirrhosis. Uh, this is extrahepatic uh, biliary obstruction. Okay. So basically this one was inside and outside of the liver, right? So intra and extra hepatic bile duct. So this is the liver and then it has the right hepatic and the left hepatic coming out and you have gallbladder here with cystic duct coming into the this place and then making the common bile duct over here right so over here it's both of these inside and outside uh, bile ducts of hep uh, liver but for secondary biliary uh, cirrhosis that means everything inside is anyways going to be screwed up right so because of that you have extra hepatic biliary obstruction as well uh, for some reason here so there's increased pressure in the intrahepatic 
uh, duct as well. Okay. So for some reason, there's something over here that's blocking it, that's causing backup of the thing, causing increased pressure in intrahepatic duct as well. Cool. Uh, leads to injury, fibrosis, and biostasis. Okay. Bile is not going anywhere. Click the obstruction. Uh, fibrosis because of the something. Oh yeah, the periportal thing. Cool. Whatever that was. The periportal one, where was that? It was somewhere here. Oh, autoimmune, that's where it was. Okay. Nope. Yeah, very poor. That's what I was thinking of. Never mind. Okay. Uh, patients with known obstructive lesions, gallstones, biliary stricture, and pancreatic carcinoma may be complicated by acute cholangitis as well. Okay. Acute cholangitis. All right. So that's uh, these are the biliary tract diseases. They involve the biliary tract inside and outside of it of the liver the one that's on the you know, just about the bowel duct actually okay, so how do you differentiate between the three primary they'll tell you it's an onion skin like uh, bowel duct appearance or uh, bead like appearance on it if any of these words uh, come up they're hinting towards sclerosing sclerosing is hardening like a uh, onion skin uh, uh, epidemio, uh, not that important, but it is associated with ulcerative colitis, and this is the important one: PNK and MPO NK positive. Okay, it has increase in ELP, so that tells you it's either uh, of liver, pen, uh, gallbladder, or like bowel duct or bone, right? So then you go to see the. I want to transfer this and the whole question stem it's not going to have anything to do with about bones it's going to be you differentiating it between this and the liver so it, since it's this you will have normal amino transferases okay then for primary biliary and cholangitis they'll tell you that it's lymphocytic infiltrates and autoimmune reaction uh, and they found that anti mitochondrial antibodies there is increase in ELP and GGT, and there's increase in direct bilirubin, so that tells you it's something after it's conjugated. So something with the bowel duct present. Uh, this is with or without granuloma, so that doesn't help. Cool. Uh, then secondary biliary cirrhosis. This is due to the obstruction causing backup and causing increase in pressure of the intrahepatic. Uh, not really sure what they would hint at for this. I don't think there are too many questions about this. They don't test you much for this. They'll test you on this definitely. And maybe this. Okay. Uh, cholelithiasis and related pathologies. Uh, this increase in cholesterol and or bilirubin, uh, decrease in bile salts and gallbladder stasis all cause sludge or stone two types of stone there's cholesterol stone and pigment stone uh, the cholesterol stones radiolucent with 10 to 20 percent opaque due to uh, calcification this is 80 percent of stones okay it's associated with obesity crohn's disease advanced age and estrogen therapy uh, multiparity rapid weight loss right so multiparity uh, estrogen therapy multiparity why because uh, progesterone does what to the gallbladder motility it decreases it right so that will cause cholesterol uh, stones to form because of that uh, rapid weight loss uh, medications for example five rates will do that uh, race increase incidence in white and native american populations now pigment stones pigment stones are black uh, which equals okay black so it's going to be radio opaque uh, it's going to be made of calcium by bilirubinate uh, 
it could be due to hemolysis right so it could be because of any of these so in black the pigment okay so pigment stones there are two types right there's black and there's brown brown is for because of uh, infection okay so B for infection or bacteria uh, brown and that and black you can think of you know uh, if you leave bilirubin out it's going to turn black so it's how where do you get him uh, bilirubin from from hemolysis right so calcium bilirubinate hemolysis and which is radio opaque and then brown is radiolucent infection associated with Crohn's disease chronic hemolysis so they're talking about pigment stones uh, associated with Crohn's disease chronic hemolysis alcoholic cirrhosis aged advanced age biliary infections total parenteral nutrition most common complication is uh, cholecystitis it can also cause acute pancreatitis and acute cholangitis as well okay diagnosis uh, diagnosed with ultrasound treat with elective cholecystectomy uh, if sym symptomatic uh, risk factor uh, five F's. So, risk factor for stones, uh, gall stones are female, fat, bird oil, uh, 40, and fair for race. Okay. So, you have uh, all those factors and decrease in cholesterol 7 alpha hydroxylase. Uh, you have increase in cholesterol, decrease in bile salts, gallbladder stasis, supersaturation of bile with cholesterol and that's how you get cholesterol stones on this side you have chronic hemolysis biliary tract infection uh, you have increase in unconjugated bilirubin gallbladder stasis uh, supersaturation of bile with calcium bilirubinate important to remember that this is the cause uh, for pigment stone or that's what they're made of okay also this one's important to remember too total parental nutrition that one sneaks up on you. Okay, uh, then you have related uh, pathologies. Okay, uh, for some reason I highlighted this and wrote increase in beta gluconate gluconite. I don't remember why I did that though. I'll figure it out later. By the way, this thing is will cause I think uh, the colky pain, colky pain or whatever. Uh, you have biliary colic. Okay, I guess that one causes colky pain. Uh, it's associated with nausea, vomiting, and dull right upper quadrant pain. Neurohormonal activation, for example, by uh, CCK after a fatty meal that's cholecystokinine right from the stomach secretion uh, after a fatty meal it triggers contraction of gallbladder forcing stone into cystic duct labs are normal ultrasound shows cholelithiasis okay so Coli, that's gallbladder, and lithiasis, that's stones. Okay, so. Uh, then you have colido, coli lithiasis, that's gallbladder and bile duct uh, stones. So, presence of gallstones in the common bile duct, often leading to ele elevated ALP, GGT, direct bilirubin, and or uh, EST and ELT. So that's similar to this one, isn't it? The findings of these. Okay. Um, cholecystitis. They actually give you this kind of uh, x ray. There's thickened gallbladder wall there and gallstone right there. Okay. So acute or chronic inflammation of gallbladder. They're. Uh, you have to know how to differentiate between the two and the only way I remember is that a uh, cholecystitis happens in 
critically ill patients. So these are the patients who are, you know, constantly chronically ill, and they are on parenteral uh, nutrition. So that's the stone that happens in them. So the question stem will have that. So since it's seen in critically ill patients, they'll tell you the patient has been in the hospital for like two or three months on parenteral feeding and there's some kind of stone there so what kind of stone will it be or what is it like whatever so it's going to be a colculus cholecystitis or something okay uh do you have acute chronic inflammation of gallbladder calculus cholecystitis that's most common type due to gallstone impaction in the cystic duct okay so that's cystic duct uh, gallbladder cystitis, cystic is uh, cystitis and then that's the inflammation itis okay resulting in inflammation or uh, and gallbladder wall thickening so arrow and B so you have gallbladder thickening and you have cystitis it can produce secondary to infection a calculus uh, is so calculus one was with the thickening of gallbladder Right, and uh, cystic duct inflammation. A calculus cholecystitis, it's due to gallbladder stasis, stasis, so it's not moving. Uh, so you have hypoperfusion. Why is it not moving? Because there's no cholesterol coming in, uh, trying to make it move or anything else, because they've been on the bed for a long time and on parental feeding. So uh, due to gallbladder stasis, hypoperfusion or infection, for example, CMV, seen in critically ill patients. Uh, Murphy sign, this is again, inspired tree arrest on right upper quadrant uh, palpation due to pain. Pain may radiate to the right shoulder due to irritation of phrenic nerve. There is increase in ALP if bile duct becomes involved. For example, acute cholangitis, diagnosed with ultrasound or cholosynctography or hitogram. Hit a scan. Failure to visualize gallbladder on hit a scan can uh, scan suggests obstruction. Okay, and that's how you diagnose this. So you first you diagnose with ultrasound or hit a scan. Okay, and then if you have failure to visualize gallbladder on hit a scan, it suggests obstruction. For this, you need to know what hit a scan is. So let's look at that. So it's these things, okay. Basically, it tells you uh, where the gallbladder is. So, if uh, it's in the gallbladder, that means the whatever it was, the contrast material, whatever, it made it to the gallbladder. But if you don't see it going, uh, if you don't see this common bowel duct over here, that means there is an obstruction here or something like that. Right. So, this is intrahepatic bowel duct, right, right and left. Okay, so what it's saying is uh, you diagnose this cholecystitis uh, with the HIDA scan. So if you don't visualize the gallbladder on HIDA scan, it suggests there is obstruction somewhere. Uh, gallstone ileus fistula. So the obstruction is going to be uh, distal to the scene where you can see it right so if you can see it up till here and then you don't see this then the obstruction is over there if you see it up to here up to here and then you don't see any of this that means there's an obstruction up here that's why you don't visualize the gallbladder okay so gallstone ileus fistula between gallbladder and gi tract stone enters uh, gi lumen okay so this is okay this is important um, gallstone ileus how does this happen there's a fistula between gallbladder and GI tract okay so then the stone enters the GI lumen it obstructs at the ileocecal valve okay that's the one I was talking about previously 
when I forgot what it was called. Uh, ileocecal valve. It's the narrowest point. It can see air in biliary tree, and that's not what I was I meant by saying uh, the stone is going to get stuck there, and then air will leak into it, and then you'll see air under the diaphragm. So air and biliary tree, and why do you see it under the diaphragm? Because there is some kind of perforation there as well, just like there is one between the gallbladder and GI. Okay, so it can uh, you can see air in the biliary tree, pneumo. Bilia. There's a regular triad that's radiographic finding of pneumobilia. So that's air in the biliary tract, I guess. I remember a question on New World and they showed it, uh, showed the air under the thing. I think that's just a gastric bubble. But see this air thing in the air. I guess that's what that is. Uh, new mobilia, small bowel obstruction, gallstone, usually in iliac fossa. Okay, why iliac fossa? Because that's where the ileocecal valve is and that's the narrowest point, so it gets obstructed there. The gallstone. Okay, uh, there's something called porcelain gallbladder. Why porcelain? Because it's calcified gallbladder due to chronic cholecystitis. Choli, that's um, gallbladder uh, cystic, cystic duct uh, inflammation. Right? So, chronic inflammation of that, usually found incidentally on imaging and that's what they're going to say that this person was uh, had x-ray taken and then what they notice incidentally is that uh, something like this and then they're going to ask you what is this or how did this happen it's calcified gallbladder due to chronic cholecystitis usually found incidentally on imaging treatment is prophylactic cholecystectomy generally recommended due to increase in increased risk of gallbladder cancer mostly adenocarcinoma so that's what they're going to test you on like what is this gonna have an increased risk of uh, gallbladder adenocarcinoma uh, then you have acute cholangitis this is also called ascending cholangitis uh, this is when the bile duct is i think obstructed right so also called ascending cholangitis infection of biliary tree usually due to obstruction that leads to stasis and bacterial overgrowth right so you get the charcoal triad uh, of cholangitis includes uh, so if you they'll give you this in the question stand that this person has jaundice or uh, yellow eyes or something like that uh, the temperature is high it's going to be above 99 and right upper quadrant pain uh, they might say they were they came into the emergency department because of the shock or hypovolemic shock right because of hypertension and they have an altered mental status okay, so that would be your brain on expanded if you see this it's acute cholangitis okay that's different than primary biliary cholangitis or fluorescing cholangitis okay Keep it separate. Uh, and then you have cholangiocarcinoma. That's malignant tumor of bile duct epithelium. Most common location is convergence of right and left hepatic duct. Okay, so right there, right before it converges together. Uh, Okay, so risk factors include primary sclerosing cholangitis, that's the onion skin one, or the beating, and liver fluke infections. Uh, this was uh, something sensitive, or something sensitive, because the Chinese liver fluke, right? Uh, usual, usually presents late with fatigue, weight loss, abdominal pain, jaundice, Imaging may show biliary tract obstruction. Histology is uh, infiltrating neoplastic glands associated with desmoplastic stroma. Uh, 
nothing too much over here. Uh, for this, they only test you with the liver fluke infection because that's the place where they test you this. Okay, uh, acute pancreatitis, this is important. There's auto digestion of pancreas by pancreatic enzyme. Auto digestion of pancreas by pancreatic enzyme shows pancreas uh, yellow arrow surrounded by the edema or red arrow. Right, yellow arrow right there and the red arrow over there. It causes uh, causes our idiopathic gallstone, ethanol, trauma, steroid, mumps, autoimmune disease, scorpion stings, scorpion stings, uh, hypercalcemia and hypertriglyceridemia. That's more than ten one thousand. So triglycerides leads to pancreatitis. We read that in the when we're doing lipid uh, hyperlipidemic drugs, uh, ERCP drugs, for example, sulfur drugs, NRTIs, and protease inhibitors. I get smashed. Remember all of these because all of these will be tested on. Uh, they'll ask the etiology for acute pancreatitis after they give you his history. Uh, diagnosis by two of three criteria. that's acute epigastric pain, easy one to remember, often radiating to the back. There's only three reasons why there's back pain. One of them is acute pancreatitis, second is heart attack in women, and third is, uh, what was it, spondylitis, I think, right? Or multiple myeloma or any of those, but those are like lower back pains. This is the only one that's like actually radiating to the back and it's because of acute pancreatitis. So if they say this person is, is experiencing uh, back pain with the epigastric pain that's radiating to the back, uh, it's going to be acute pancreatitis. Okay. Increased serum amylase uh, or lipase, more specific to three times the upper limit of normal or characteristic in image and finding. We usually look at lipase and not amylase because amylase is found in the salivary glands as well. But lipase is more specific to pancreas. That's why it's more specific. Okay, two, three times the upper limit of normal or characteristic imaging finding. Complication is pseudocyst. Okay, so you'll have pancreas like that and then you'll have cysts forming around it. And those are the pseudocysts. They're lined by granulation tissue are uh, not epithelium, very important. Uh, they'll test you on that. They'll ask you what is this uh, contained in. It's contained in the granular tissue and not epithelium. There's abscess, uh, necrosis, hemorrhage, infection, organ failure, uh, acute liver injury or lung injury, I guess, uh, or acute respiratory distress syndrome, shock, renal failure, hypocalcemia, and precipitation of calcium stores. This is uh, when you see white stuff around the pancreas, so it's calcium stores. But very important, uh, the cyst is granulation, uh, granulation tissue. Uh, you need to know how to identify it in the scans. Chronic pancreatitis, so this was acute, now chronic. So in chronic, uh, you won't see it. The pan you won't be able to figure out the pancreas because it's small. So chronic inflammation, atrophy. Oh yeah, so why does this happen? It's because of pancreatic enzyme. Remember the trypsin, uh, that, that's activated, trypsinogen, right? Uh, trypsin creates more trypsin and zymogens. They keep uh, leaking out basically and then they uh, start digesting the pancreas itself because of it. And there's a positive feedback loop so it just gets worse and worse. Chronic inflammation, atrophy, calcification of the pancreas. Major risk factors include alcohol use disorder and genetic predisposition, for example, cystic fibrosis. It can be idiopathic. Complications include pancreatic uh, insufficiency and pseudocysts. Pancreatic insufficiency, typically when less than 10% pancreatic function, may manifest with steatorrhea, fat-soluble vitamin deficiency, diabetes mellitus, right? 
uh, am I least and life is may or may not be elevated almost always elevated in acute pancreatitis okay so am I least and lipase won't be elevated because now pancreas can't secrete that stuff right so pancreatic insufficient typically less than 10 percent pancreatic function is available so it's not going to be much of this to start off with may manifest as steatorrhea because of uh, fat malabsorption right so fat soluble vitamin deficiency happens and of course diabetes mellitus because now you don't have insulin to do that uh, complicated include pancreatic insufficiency resists major risk factors include alcohol use and this and this and this important to remember cystic fibrosis causes chronic pancreatitis let's just look at a few x-rays before we move on okay so if that's what it looks like that's the one they used that's a cyst okay. chronic again uh, chronic right there okay. you don't even notice it here I guess it's this thing right here. And so that thing right there. That thing right there. Okay, so you should be able to identify chronic pancreatitis. Okay, moving on to pancreatic adenocarcinoma. This is very aggressive tumor arising from pancreatic duct disorganized granular tissue uh, sorry structure with cellular infiltration okay uh, that's important again it's granular structure with cellular infiltration it's not epithelium right uh, similar to this thing right here it was right there sorry so lined by granular granulation tissue and not epithelium. Similarly, even with the uh, adenocarcinoma, it's disorganized glandular structure with cellular infiltration, okay? Not epithelium uh, infiltration. Often metastatic at presentation with average survival approximately one year after diagnosis. Tumor more uh, common in pancreatic head so that's what you're seeing over here. Okay. Leads to obstructive jaundice uh, because of that. Uh, associated with uh, the tumor marker CA199. The way I remember that is pen has N in it. So pen, I you pronounce it pen 9 creatic, I guess. I don't know. But if you see pen and pen, uh, it's in my head, I don't know how to pronounce it, I don't know how to vocalize that, but if you see nine and nine, that's pancreatic, right? Uh, and that's the tumor marker. Also, you use CEA, remember what CEA was? Uh, Carcino embryonic antigen, right? And it's used uh, usually for colorectal carcinoma but you can use it for this too. But this is a better tumor marker, 199, CA199. Okay, CA is for carcinoma of the pancreas. Uh, risk factors. Tobacco smoking, this is the strongest one. Uh, this is usually gonna be in the etiology as well, or the question set. Uh, chronic pancreatitis, uh, especially more than 20 years. And diabetes and age, more than 50 years often presents with abdominal pain radiating to the back something wrong with the pancreas then if, if that happens uh, majority of the time it's going to be acute pancreatitis uh, 
if there's weight loss then you know it's going to be uh, carcinoma because normally it would happen due to malabsorption anyways over here as well however they won't mention fat loss or weight loss because of that because uh, normally weight loss is uh, it means uh, some cancer or malignancy right so malabsorption and anorexia you also have migratory thrombophlebitis uh, this is important because this means cancer that's the thing for this right migratory thrombophlebitis is known for cancer the buzzword uh, redness and tenderness on palpation of extremities okay uh, Trousseau's syndrome so let's do a google definition for that too inflammatory reaction of the vein accompanied by a thrombus okay so redness and tenderness on palpation of extremities uh, also known as Trousseau syndrome obstructive jaundice with palpable non-tender gallbladder and this is called the uh, oh you're just waiting for me to pronounce it aren't you uh, Corvisier sign. I think I did a pretty good job of that. Um, before we go, let's look at a few x rays for this one. Or scans. Okay, uh, so that thing right there. Uh, that thing right there. Basically, you look at the place where the pancreas is supposed to be, uh, right? So this is the pancreas, and then you see a little bit of cysts forming over there, and then the head is huge. So I guess that. They'll give you something obvious. I don't know if Wikipedia has a port for that, but... Okay, so... It's really hard to tell. Um, that's the adenocarcinoma right there. That one is easier. Okay. It's easier to point out where the gallbladder is because it has a unique presentation compared to the surrounding structures like liver or intestine and stuff, right? You'll have this like bubble looking thing in the middle of the scan. And that's going to be your pancreas. So from there, you look at the stuff that's um, in it. So I can't figure out what the head is, but hopefully you can. And they'll give you something like this anyways. So you'll make out that this is the pancreas. And on top of the pancreas, there is a mass. And that mass is the adenocarcinoma. Okay. This is not going to be helpful at all. So what is Corsovir sign? That's non-tender. Uh, it's obstructive jaundice with pal uh, palpable non-tender gallbladder. That's basically what that is. Okay, uh, that's it. Let's GIT pharmac. Okay, now. Uh, We'll look at that while we do this okay so h2 blockers this these are your simetidine femotidine or nizotidine the way to remember this is there's dine in it and you dine with two people at the table right so take h2 blockers before you dine think table for two uh, to remember h2 okay so if it has dine it's h2 blockers and you take it before you eat mechanism is reversible block of histamine h2 receptors so they decrease h secretion by parietal cells cool because that's what we're doing right acid uh, suppression therapy so here we see h2 receptor right there histamine comes so what h2 does it's reversibly blocks this histamine uh, what's it used for anything that you know has a side effect to acid as acidity in the stomach so that's your peptic ulcer 
um, gastritis and mild esophageal reflux right uh, the adverse effect of these are uh, simetidine is a potent inhibitor of cytochrome p450 uh, so multiple drug interactions right there if it also has anti-androgenic effect so prolactin release gynecomastia impotence and decreased libido in males it can cross blood brain barrier confusion dizziness headache uh, because of that and placenta it can cross placenta as well simetidine decreases renal excretion of creatinine other h2 blockers are relatively free of these effects okay so it's only this one the c is for critical side effects and then fem is uh you know like family it's safe and is a td cool uh, we have proton pump inhibitor, omeprazole, lenzoprazole, esmeprazole, pentoprazole, and dexalenzoprazole. So this is the most popular drug. Everybody should know this one. Uh, if not, then know it now. Uh, PPI, omeprazole, right? So mechanism is it irre irreversibly inhibits uh, H, potassium, ATPase in the stu stomach parietal cell. Okay, that's the parietal cell and then we have uh, right there PPI omeprazole it acts uh, similar to antacids but you know it acts on potassium hydrogen ATP as well okay so clinical use is peptic ulcer gastritis uh, esophageal reflux Zollinger Ellison syndrome right that's like a uh, the pancreas secreting gastrin and all that stuff or causing secretion of gastrin um, component of therapy for H. pylori and stress ulcer prophylaxis okay uh, adverse effects are increase in risk of uh, C. difficile infection pneumonia acute interstitial nephritis vitamin B12 malabsorption uh, okay so it inhibits uh, the age release right so how does that come it comes to the carbonic anhydrase uh, by combining carbon dioxide and water into uh, by car h2co3 and then that turns into carbonate plus h ion so the bicarbonate gets uh, exchanged for chloride because they both are negative ions so if one goes out the other one comes in to keep the balance as all things should be uh, alkaline tide increased blood pH after gastric acid secretions uh, for example after meals and vomiting okay cool, cool. and I guess the CL also gets released with the H right and that's how you get each CL uh, so antacids are it can uh, affect absorption bioavailability or urinary excretion of other drugs by an altering gastric and urinary pH or by delaying gastric emptying all can cause hypokalemia uh, that's important so you have alumini alumin <laughs> aluminium uh, hydroxide or aluminum hydroxide uh, constipation hypophosphatemia, osteodystrophy, proximal muscle weakness, and seizures. Okay, so aluminum amount of, achha, aluminum amount of feces, so chops. Uh, calcium carbonate, that's hypercalcemia, right? Uh, milk alkali syndrome, that's what it causes, and rebound acid reflux. It can chelate and decrease effectiveness of other drugs, for example, tetracycline. So that's important to remember for that. Uh, this one, uh, they do give you this, but they will ask you, I guess, uh, what kind of drug was this person taking or what drug is causing this, right? So constipation, hypophosphatemia. This is uh, unique to this one. All the other ones, it's all about other drugs like hypokalemia or magnesium. 
right? But this one, it's about hypophosphatemia. And then you have seizures. Uh, not many things can cause seizures, so antacid that causes seizure should be special, right? Uh, so calcium carbonate, uh, that causes hypercalcemia. It's in the name. Right? Rebound acid reflux is important. Uh, also, given with tetracycline, uh, it causes effectiveness decrease of tetracycline. Magnesium hydroxide is diarrhea, hyporeflexia, hypotension, and cardiac arrest. Okay. Magnesium hyporeflexia, hypotension, cardiac arrest. So they all act over here. They uh, stop the release of acid because it's in the name antacid. And Mg two plus equals must go to the bathroom. So that's how you remember it. So one that causes diarrhea. Okay. And cardiac arrest. Cool. Uh, bismuth is right there. Uh, what it does is it covers the ulcer base and also sucral fate. So mechanism it binds to ulcer base, providing physical protection and allowing bicarbonate secretion to reestablish pH gradient in the mucos, uh, mucus layer. Sucral fate requires acidic environment, so it's not given with PPIs or H2 blockers. Okay. So in case you're worried about like the side effects of these, uh, you can give this for the ulcer. Uh, okay. Uh, clinical use is increasing uh, to increase ulcer healing, uh, diary travelers diarrhea. Uh, this is bismuth and bismuth also used in quadruple therapy for H. pylori okay uh, misoprostol actually yeah okay uh, misoprostol or should we I guess we'll go look at what quadruple therapy for H. pylori is uh, we went over it I just want to do a review of that Um, that's proton pump inhibitor, tetracycline, metronidazole, and a bismuth salt. Okay. Cool. Uh, Mesoprostol. This is a prostaglandin analog, so PGE1 analog. This is the one that uh, helps in dilating the cervix, right? Uh, it actually has two actions. It, uh, let's see, induction of this. I think it has two actions. Let me just go check that out real quick. Okay, it's going to induce induction agent in the second trimester for termination of pregnancy or fetal death okay i guess we'll learn about it in uh, a repro but anyways mifepristone and mesoprestol are used okay uh, mechanism prostaglandin analog increase in production of secretion of gastric mucus barrier, decrease in acid production, clinical use is prevention of NSAIDs induced uh, peptic ulcer, so NSAIDs block PGE production, right, so all we do is we replace, uh, we just uh, give them more PGE, supplemented with the misoprostol. Also used off label for induction of labor or ripens it ripens cervix. Okay. Adverse effect diarrhea. Uh, contraindicated in patients with childbearing potential because it is a abortifacient. It's used to terminate pregnancy. Okay, octreotide, we know what that is. It's the long acting somatostatin analog. Inhibits secretion of various splenic vasodilatory hormones. Uh, remember, statin stasis stops everything, so it inhibits secretions 
of various uh, splenic vasodilatory hormones. Splenic, that just means the portal circulation ones or intestinal or abdominal circulation or whatever. Vasodilatory hormones for that. Not abdominal, but like anything related to GIT, the portal one. Clinical use is acute variceal bleeds. Uh, okay, so that's why we use it for that. Uh, acromegaly. VIPoma, acromegaly because it inhibits growth hormone, VIPoma because it inhibits VIP, and carcinoid syndrome, I mean uh, tumors. And then you have adverse effects, which are nausea, cramps, tetaria, increased risk of cholelithiasis due to CCK inhibition. So we have CCK receptors right there. Right. Um, they're talking about somatostatin. It's acting through GI, so we know what GI was. It was the secondary messenger system that it uses to inhibit adenylocyclase and then the camp and all that stuff right so it doesn't activate protein kinase a okay so it in, in, inhibits the camp and then camp can activate this atpa so introduces the secretion for that uh, Okay, so increased risk of cholelithiasis due to CCK inhibition. So if this is inhibited, uh, it increases risk of cholelithiasis. Okay, uh, sulfalazine. Uh, this the mechanism is a combination of sulfopyrrole, pyridine, antibacterial, and 5-amino salicyclic acid, anti-inflammatory activated. It's anti-inflammatory. Uh, it's activated by colonic bacteria. Clinical use is ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, um, colitis component. Uh, adverse effect is malaise, nausea, sulfonamide, toxicity, reversible oligospermia. We have loperamide, so we're done with these, I guess. So one more time. Estricholine going into M3 receptor, right? Activating the GQ. GQ was IP3-1, right? So PIP gets split. Uh, gets uh, with the help of phospholipase C it splits into IP3 and DAG and though both activate protein kinase C uh, and then you know sarcoplasm reticulum intracellular calcium and all that stuff okay so it activates that and that's how it activates the ATPs uh, gastrin similar thing it att attaches to the CCK uh, receptor uh, gastrin also goes to the ECL receptor, which releases histamine to act on the parietal cell uh, receptors. So H2 receptor there, and GS directly activates adenylocyc uh, camp, which uh, activates the adenylocyclase, and then the thing, uh, prostaglandin uh, and somatostatin, they both inhibit camp use sucrophate and bismuth to attach uh, directly onto the base of the uh, ulcer. Sulcrophate requires the acidity so you don't give it while you give proton pump inhibitor antacids. Um, mesoprostol uh, it provides the PGE2 because uh, it's PGE2 uh, analog right sorry yeah, PGE1 not 2 and then, yeah, that takes care of that. So H2 blocker will block this, and then iotropin blocks this. It's a cool. Uh, Antimatics all act centrally in chemoreceptor trigger zone of area postrema. So I think I missed this one. So loperamide. Loperamide is, uh, the mechanism is agonist at mu opioid receptor, very important, they test you on that. Uh, so agon is at mu opioid receptors, so it slows gut motility. Okay, now, poor CNS penetration, so low additive, addictive potential. Its use is for diarrhea, and adverse effect is constipation and nausea. So it slows gut motility, so that's why it's used for diarrhea. Antiemetic, right, so that's vomiting, uh, so 
anti-vomiting drugs all act centrally in chemoreceptor trigger zone of area prostrema. You have ondansetron and granisetron. Okay, uh, so mechanism is 5-HT3 uh, receptor antagonist. Also acts peripherally uh, via vagal decreasing vagal stimulation. Clinical use is nausea and vomiting after chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or surgery. This is important. It's given after chemotherapy or radiotherapy or surgery. Uh, on Dencetron. Effects are headache, uh, constipation, QT interval prolongation, and serotonin syndrome. This is important, serotonin syndrome, and uh, that it's given after chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or surgery. Okay. Uh, Prochlorperazine, metoclopromide. This is a D2 receptor antagonist. Metoclopromide uh, also causes increase in gastric emptying and increases LES tone, right? So D2 is like known as the inhibitor uh, dopamine re receptor, right? So when you block the inhibitor, it's gonna activate stuff. So it activates or increases gastric emptying and increases LES tone or lower esophageal structure tone. Clinical use is nausea and vomiting. Um, medical chromite is also used in gastroparesis, uh, for example, diabetes. This is pretty important and for persistent GERD. Extrapyramal symptoms uh, can happen that's important for medical chromite. Hyperprolactinemia, uh, anxiety, drowsiness, restlessness, depression, and GI distress. I guess remember that too because that's a unique side effect. Uh, then you have a prepotent and postprepotent. That's NK1, uh, neurokinin 1 receptor antagonist, and NK1 receptor or substance B receptor. Okay. Uh, it's used for chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. Uh, adverse effect is fatigue and GI distress. This one is important too. So all three of these, you should know the mechanism of them. Uh, the unique clinical uses, so surgery and all that for ondocetron. For this, um, gastroparesis. And then for this, it's used for chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting only. Uh, adverse effects fatigue and GI distress. Or at least that, the mechanism is it, it inhibits uh, gastric and pancreatitis, pancreatic lipase. Uh, it decreases breakdown and absorption of dietary fats. It's taken with fat containing meals. It's used for weight loss. Uh, and uh, adverse effects are abdominal pain, flatulence, bowel urgency, frequent bowel movements. Uh, Steteria. Decrease absorption of fat soluble vitamins as well. Uh, then you have anti constipation drugs. So these are your bulk forming laxatives or osmotic laxative or stimulant laxative or emollient uh, laxative or lubiprostol. Right. Uh, so bulk forming laxative are your methyl cellulose or psyllium husk. Right, so these are soluble fibers that draw water into gut lumen, forming viscous liquid that promotes peristalsis. Adverse effect is bloating. Okay, so this is uh, the reason why it's good and it prevents, uh, it decreases the risk of colorectal carcinoma. Okay, uh, oxidative, uh, osmotic laxative. These are lactulose, magnesium citrate, magnesium hydroxide, and polyethylene glycol. We did the aluminum one. And magnesium hydroxide. So we did that one already. But, okay. Uh, it's the one that causes diarrhea, right? So osmotic laxative. These are, it provides osmotic load to draw water into the GI lumen. Lactulose also treats hepatic encephalopathy, right, because uh, gut microbiota degrades lactulose, lactulose into metabolites, 
lactic acid acetic acid that promotes nitrogen excretion excretion as ammonium by trapping it in the colon okay. diarrhea dehydration are the adverse effects may be misused by patients with bulimia uh, then you have stimulant laxatives these are biscodil or cena uh, the mechanism is enteric nerve stimulation uh, they lead to colonic contraction okay. enteric nerve stimulation so stimulant laxatives so it's uh, at risk effect is diarrhea then you have emolent uh, or emolent laxatives docustat docusat uh, this is surfactants that decrease stool surface tension promoting water entry into the stool right. so again same thing I was about this diarrhea lubiprostone chloride channel activator okay so it's lubrication right so lubrication uh, requires chloride so you can think of it that way chloride channel activator it increases intestinal fluid secretion okay and adverse effect is diarrhea and nausea and that's the end of it we'll do email